Welcome to the Zine Collector Podcast Episode 1. Say hello to my little podcast. Zine friends, welcome to the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Thank you for joining me. Now let's talk about some zines. Or rather, in this episode, let's talk a little bit about who I am and why I'm making a podcast about zines. It'll be a short and sweet one for you, but uh, introductions are a good thing. <laughs> so first of all, again, thank you for joining me. And uh, yeah, please excuse my anxiety. I have a lot of it, <laughs> even though I'm technically sitting in a room talking to a microphone and a camera. But I do have my handy little notes to uh, try to keep me on track, so if you hear them waving around at all, I'm sorry. And if I, if you're watching this on YouTube and I look down from the camera a lot, I apologize again. It's my notes, which are a very good uh, tool to help with anxiety. So there we are. So, who am I? Why am I making a zine about podcasts? Wow, have I taken for granted all the people who do the YouTube. Ah, public speaking, even in, alone in a room, kind of intimidating. Anyway, I'm Jamie Nix from SeagreenZines.com. My sign is Leo. I like long candlelit gaming sessions and watching 8 out of 10 cats. Yeah, enough of that side of things. I love zines. I love zines. I write about zines, all sorts of things. And that's the most important part of a zine podcast, loving zines. Now, as I mentioned, I read zines, I review zines, I blog about zines, and I even zine about zines. That's right. Here at the Zine Collector, we use the word zine as a noun and a verb. It's just that cool. And I said we as if there's anybody else in the room. There's not, I promise. <laughs> Anyway, so given all of that, it's surprising to exactly no one that I am doing a podcast on zines. Like a lot of people, I got started with zines before I even knew the word zines. Before I ever came across it. I made various little collage books with little written things and newsletters, both for class assignments and outside of class. I was on the high school newspaper for a while, all that sort of thing. And probably the thing that came closest to zines before I knew about zines was a newsletter called Cloud Nine, where I basically shared current events for the basic, uh, the uh, various clubs I was in. I was uh, a band nerd, a book club nerd, a drama nerd, all the nerds. <laughs> sort of thing. I'm like, I'm a, a cluster nerd. I'm a nerd squared or something like that. <laughs> anyway, so I made a current event zine. I called it Cloud Nine and I handed it out, that sort of thing. It didn't last very long because I was very much about getting feedback and when you're in high school, you don't really care about the, the thing that your friend made. <laughs> At least my friends anyway. Moving on. My first zine that I actually called a zine that at, that I made after coming across the zine verse was called the Perfect Pocket Guinness Guide, which was a mini zine all about achieving the correct pour, the perfect pour for your Guinness. Because you, you have to do it properly. You can't just pour it like a beer and expect everything to be fine because it won't be. <laughs> now don't get me wrong. I don't like Guinness. I don't drink it. You know, you know, kudos to you if you do. Fair enough, but I'm not a Guinness drinker. My partner, Wanderer, he likes Guinness. And so I was making a little mini zine for him because he had actually written a poem about Guinness and I really wanted to put that somewhere. And so I made this little pocket Guinness guide and I stuck his poem in the back and everything. It was great. I'm actually considering it like bringing out of it bringing it out of retirement, that sort of thing. Cause I, I really like, I think it's cute. So about the same time as that I started Dear Anonymous, which is still an, um, a zine I make today. 
And that is a collaboration zine where people can anonymously have their letters, their thoughts, their comments, and that sort of thing shared with the world. When I first started it, I used to do, I used to write it in my own, write all the letters in my own handwriting and draw and stuff like that. And I uh, found out that I'm not good at drawing. <laughs> so now it's more backgrounds and fonts and just kind of following my intuition that way for uh, whatever suits the piece. So yeah, I started both of those at about the same time. As I mentioned, uh, the Guinness Guide is retired, question mark. And Dear Anonymous, number seven will be coming out soon. So there's that. Unfortunately, I don't remember exactly when or where I came across scenes. I don't remember going, hey, that's a zine, or asking somebody, what's this, or being handed something, or any any lovely story like that. I just, I don't remember. I started Sea Green Zines in 2011, and in my very first post, I mentioned knowing about zines for years. So going by what I know of how I define things, I'm guessing about 2009, maybe, might have been the first point I came across zines, but yeah, I'm actually pretty sad that I can't remember that, as I, I feel like my first zine stories are, are great. Anyway, so as I said, I started blogging uh, about zines in 2011, and I started reviewing zines in about 2013. Actually, the very first review I put up was Valentine's Day 2013, so, you know, what better way to show my zine love? Then by starting reviews on Valentine's Day or something. That's what I tell myself. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if I should be laughing at my own jokes in these, but uh, let's keep going. That's, you know, me wrapped up in a fairly neat zine bow, basically. You know, not much more. You can always ask, of course. So let's move on to the podcast. Why am I doing podcasts? Why... Do I always have to refer to my notes? Why do I keep getting lost? <laughs> anyway, I apologize. Podcasting. I actually recorded my first single episode of a podcast. I'll put the link somewhere. And I did that years ago. But the thing was, I was in a really, I was in a really loud area, like, right by roads and trams and all sorts of things so that definitely didn't help plus as i only recently figured out actually i had a dodgy mic like it just it made everything sound a little bit mechanical and tinny and hollow there was no warmth to it that sort of thing and i knew that if i was going to make a podcast i needed better audio like i just could not tolerate myself putting that sort of thing out there even though technically I edited it and I did because it's still available to listen to, but I didn't go on with the show. But when I, when we finally got the final word that we were going to move and things like that, I decided that after the move, I knew I would be in a, a quieter place in, I'd be in a safer place so I'd feel better and more confident and less anxious in those ways and less stressed out in those ways. So I knew that if I was going to do it, I was going to do it after the move. And yeah, I basically proposed the idea of YouTube, b podcast, or both. Uh, let's see, it was in November or even December maybe. I proposed the idea and everybody was so happy and supportive that I could hardly not do it afterwards. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I want to do this, like, despite the anxiety and the blah, 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 you know, the tongue-tied sort of stuff. I'm really, I'm happy to be doing this. I'm really excited about all of this. I've wanted to do it for years, but again, mic, surroundings, that sort of thing. And the thing about podcasting, to me, I've been making zines for years, and I've been blogging for years, and I've been connecting with people that way for so long. It's been so rewarding and so lovely. Like The zine community is amazing to me and continues to blow my mind with generosity and kindness and 
this community trading system and all that sort of things, things I want to talk about in future episodes. And it's just been absolutely lovely. And I feel like that spirit, the the DIY, doing it yourself and making things and creating things really lends itself well to podcasting. Like the transition is fairly easy. I could see someone starting with zines and going to podcasting or with podcasting and also making zines, that sort of thing. I feel like there's an an interchange there that's it's very easy. It's it's getting easier to do on the podcasting side of things. It's obviously like making a zine at its basis, pen and a piece of paper is probably one of the easiest things accessibility wise, as well as just doing it and that sort of thing. But with podcasting, there are now podcasts. So oh, what would you call them? Apps, basically, where you sign up to podcasts and that sort of thing. But podcast apps are making it even easier as a podcaster to get literally get your voice out there. Like you can just upload and go or you could even record on your phone and then just upload using the app. It's all it's all very, very easy. And also with podcasting, you have the DIY component in content anyway. It's very much do it yourself in that you're sitting, you're writing show notes, or maybe you're not as uh, anxious or like writing as much as I do. And maybe you're just doing your thing and you have a co-host or something like that. But e- either way, it's very, it's very self-motivated and do it yourself. And that's, that's very much part of the zine, dare I say, ethos sort of thing. You, you, nobody's going to do it for you. Nobody's going to make you do it. I mean, there might be people asking about it, but by and large, it's, it's you. It is of you. And that's really amazing and beautiful. But also, (laughs) as I've discovered, like my approach to zines, it can be a lot more complicated than it needs to be. (laughs) I, I, I got really wrapped up in things, but as I mentioned, it's actually on the face of it, quite easy to make a podcast. And so that's why I feel like things will blend well together. I've been, as I mentioned, writing and blogging about zines for so long and sharing the zine love in that way that I feel like there's a quality of connection and conversation that can happen as I add in video and podcasting. Now, just let me back up a little bit in regards to the website and things like that. Nothing about that's going to change. I mean, it may change for the better, that sort of thing. Things are malleable in that way. And there's always room for improvement. But as far as reviews on Thursdays and Fridays and calls for submissions on the weekends and happy mail Mondays when mail comes in, that sort of thing, all that sort of stuff is going to stay the, stay the same. When I first started uh, contemplating actually doing this, whether I wanted video or podcasting or both, or could I do this, or how long did it take to write out a show, that sort of thing, I had to, I knew from the beginning that I didn't want it to affect the blog. I didn't want to drop down to one review a week or have to ever skip reviews. If you have been reading my blog for a while, you know that I hate missing reviews. I value being consistent and helping people get the word out there about their blogs and get my opinion for whatever it's worth on their on their zines. I'm sorry, I just said blogs. <laughs> I meant on their blog. <laughs> and I've done it again. Anyway, on their zines. I have been doing that for a long time. But I think there is a different kind of connection and conversation to be had with voice. It is beautiful in its own way for me to write out something and share a picture of someone's zine and all of their links and things like that. But for me to be able to say thank you for sending me a zine, to be able to express an opinion or tell a story or anything like that with voice, I think 
It just provides a different level of engagement. There must be something in the air because I'm really excited to say that I'm not the only zine podcast out there and that's fantastic. And that also, again, feeds into what I love about zines because I can be really excited and ecstatic about other zine podcasts because there isn't an air of competition within zines or within podcasting. Yes, it's DIY and everything. And we can all DIY. We can all podcast. We can all make zines, that sort of thing. There's that community and we can all support each other without having to worry about numbers or is this person taking this person's audience or any of that BS that happens in competitive arenas. That's not what this is. That's not what zines are. And they should never be. Please don't ever think that there's any sort of competition. Rawr. <laughs> anyway, so that's really beautiful. And I can say I'm really, really excited because recently Longarm Stapler and Poor Last Zine put out their first episodes of Zine Podcasts. So they both have more than one person. So unlike me, or unlike this podcast, you're not stuck with one person to listen to. And poor last scene. Wow. <laughs> and it's not just because I really like all kinds of different accents and listening and everything. Like It was a brilliant, warm, welcoming, wonderful podcast. I'm very much looking forward to the second one. And links will be somewhere, description or show notes or something like that. They will be because you really need to listen to them. I've been well, I, w I, I was planning uh, the podcast since November or something like that, but hearing more zinesers come out with podcasts in the meantime has really, really helped inspire me. And something else that's really helped inspire me that you can still check out, even though it only ran from 2009 to 2012, but nobody cares about your stupid podcast with Alex Reck. There are only seven episodes of it, but I think it's brilliant and fun and it has also been inspiring as well. So definitely need to check that out. So at this point, I was going to go ahead and have a segment called Save the Date in which I read out zine events that are happening all around the world because there are a lot of them and it's absolutely brilliant and I think it's just fantastic and fun that there's so much happening all around the world. So as I said, I was going to read out the list and everything like that, but the thing is, there, there, there are so many events and this is just till the end of the month. There are so many events and I just, I don't think anyone, anybody wants to sit and listen to me read out, let's see nearly three pages of zine events. Like as much as I, I do want to share and everything, I think me sitting and reading for five minutes, maybe not, maybe isn't the best sort of thing for a podcast. I mean, I know you're listening to me talking and everything like that, but just event name, date, place, that sort of thing. So the, the thing is that I did get these, all these zine events from a source. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say there is an amazing world zine calendar maintained by Alex of at fanzines on Facebook and Twitter. Now again, links included and it is absolutely fantastic. So if you'd like a direct line on zine events around the world, see if anything's happening, make sure that your event is listed, whether it's a, a workshop an, an art gallery thing, anything. If it's zine related, be sure to get in contact with Alex of at fanzines. Be part of it because from Tokyo to Spain to the US, and I'm very happy to say here in Australia, there are so many events and it's, like I said, it's wonderful to see, but nobody wants to listen to me read out that sort of thing for 10 minutes. So I'm afraid I'm going to pass over at this time. We'll see how we go in future episodes. And if you do want to listen to me read 
event names, dates, and places, let me know. I'm happy to do it. I'm just, I don't want anybody to be sitting there getting bored. So I'll wrap that up. <laughs> anyway, there we go. I know this is a bit of a short and sweet, as I mentioned. Well, I hope it's sweet. Yeah, I'll leave that up to you to decide. But I hope you enjoyed it. It's, this one's meant to be the relaxed one. It's meant to give me an idea of, you know, I can write this pages of things, but I had no idea how long it would take. I didn't know if it would take hours or what, that sort of thing. At the moment, I'm, I'm actually kind of impressed that it, it hasn't taken longer. Like this is all gone so smoothly. So yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if about 20 to 30 minutes is going to be the usual or not, but let me know if you prefer longer or shorter. I don't know lengthwise how much flexibility I'm going to have, but we will see. Everything's really changeable and malleable at the moment. And I'm up for suggestions. Nice suggestions. Please be kind. I am, I am made of marshmallow fluff and something fragile, okay? <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a very fluffy, sensitive lady, so yes, please, please be kind. Like, constructive is fine, but kindness is very welcome. I do want to get organized with more segments and stuff like that. Save the date is meant to be a segment. <laughs> we'll see how that goes and that sort of thing. I have a few other things in mind, both for um, podcast only and video only, so that should be interesting. I do have a few frequently asked questions, you know, frequently as in over the years, years a few people have asked me. And I was thinking of either a Q&A episode or I answer one question per podcast in a segment of sorts. Now, if you have a preference, if you'd like to just get all the Q&As out regularly in a single podcast, then that's fine. Or if you'd like just to get to know me or know my opinions on zine reviewing or anything like that, you can let me know. You can leave a comment on my blog. Instagram messaging is good. There's the YouTube comment section if you're watching the video. There's also, I do also have a Tumblr, but I don't check it as often. So if you do contact me there, be prepared to wait a few days or something like that. I do check in. It's just... I'm not on it as much as, say, Instagram or basically my, my blog. My blog is great because I get an instant email whenever somebody comments, so that's pretty quick too. If you have a suggestion for a dedicated space where everybody could go to leave a comment or something like that, please let me know. I'm still looking around. I'm still very new to a lot of this stuff. Like, I know there's Discus or Discuss. I mean, it's supposed to be Discuss, I think, but it's spelled weird. That is a possibility. Um, I think the what it's called Sarara. Is that how you say it? I'm really not sure, but that the anonymity of that kind of scares me because again, very very fluffy, sensitive lady here. So not sure about that. But yeah, if you have any suggestions, please let me know. I'm very new and open to basically all of the things. I think that's pretty much it for today's zine friends. Uh, I do want to thank everyone so much. I'm an anxious person. I'm, I'm very, I'm an incredibly anxious person. Social anxiety and generalized anxiety and all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> if there's something to worry about, believe me, I'm worrying about it. And I'm thinking about <laughs> future things, you know, I might need to worry about that. So let's worry about it now. <laughs> so basically when I have had confidence crashes, when I have just not felt like I was good enough to be doing any of this. People have really stepped up. And I know it's not their responsibility or anything to step up, but they have without me needing to ask. And they've really, they've helped me to feel so much better about myself and what I'm doing. And people have said, I'm looking forward to this, even though they haven't seen anything of what I've done except a 30 second video, 30 second little podcast bloop where I was announcing things. Even though it was only 30 seconds, people have been really supportive and that 
has really helped me through in ways that I don't want to get into because I'll probably start crying, which, you know, nobody wants to see that or even hear that on a first per- podcast. That's just not cool. Not cool, Nix. <laughs> Anyways, what I'm getting around to is thank you. If you're listening to this, if you're watching this, thank you. This is me thanking you specifically. There, there are too many names like the zine events, you'd be sitting here all day just, thank you to this person, thank you to that person, and thank you to that, and and yeah, it would never end. But from the bottom of my heart, sincerely, thank you for your continued encouragement through all of this. It's really, it's helped me through more than I can say <laughs> at this point anyway. Links for everything I've talked about, I will be going over the whole show Links will be either in the description on the videos, they'll be in show notes on the blog. Uh, Again, I'm trying to figure out things with the podcast side of things. So if you're on the pippa.io podcast zine collector page, I'm going to figure out how to get comments on there as well. And links and and descriptions on there as well. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday and have calls for submissions on the weekend. Now, because I have a little bit of music, I have a little something I have to read. The music for this podcast, Spanish Summer by Audionautics, is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. So thank you, Audionautics, for the kick and tune. This is the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Until next time, go make some zines. You're listening to the Zine Collector Podcast, Episode 2. All you need is zine love. Hello, zine friends. Welcome to the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix, and let's talk about zines. Whew! Episode 2! Yay, I made it! (laughs) First off, thank you for the lovely feedback to episode 1. I know it wasn't uh, the epitome of podcasting, but I appreciate the confidence boost that all of your comments have brought, and it makes me feel like there's a community element to doing this that makes me feel like I can change and evolve this podcast to something that not only do I enjoy doing, but something that you really, really enjoy watching and or listening to. Now, this episode is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be a a tad more organized with segments and the like, and a little bit more talk that's actually centered around zines. I am still changing and growing, as I mentioned, so if you have any suggestions there, they are definitely, definitely welcome. So the first segment that I actually want to do, thank you note cards, (laughs) is notes and announcements. Now, if I go to plan with this, this will be released one week after the first episode was released. But the thing is, I I don't plan on doing this weekly. I'm sorry. I, I know I would love to. I would certainly love to, but there is a bit more work involved with this than... Not that I anticipated it would be easy, but um, it takes a bit more spoons out of me than I realized. So I'm going to try to go for fortnightly. Um, It may be three weeks, that sort of thing. I'll certainly keep you updated if that's something that you are really interested in knowing and keeping up with. But uh, yeah, this one being in the week after the first one was more for myself to show myself that I could get past introductions that this wasn't a one and done sort of thing, a one hit wonder. Not that I think the first one is a wonder, but you know, it's uh, up for opinions. (laughs) Anyway, I'm still figuring out 2018. I'm still trying to figure out everything I want to do. I, I don't know what it is about this year. I don't know. Maybe it's the move. Maybe it's everything. Maybe it's 
getting past my anxieties and actually starting this podcast. But I suddenly feel like I can do all the things if I can just get myself organized. So who knows? Maybe I will be able to move this up to weekly. I don't know. There's still, there's still so much to organize. And I mean, I, there's still a book I need to write. <laughs> so there's a lot going on. That being said, and please don't see this as me being hypocritical, but that being said, I have been asked about doing zine readings. As in, people say, here's my zine, please pick a section of it. I won't read the whole thing, but please pick a section of it, read it out, and then let people know where they can go if they're interested. Now, I really like that idea. I like the idea of another avenue of being able to share the love of zines, but it's not something I'm looking at adding into this podcast. There are still segments that aren't even going to be in this in this episode that I'm looking forward to doing. Zine readings, I feel, I don't know, have a tone and a vibe and that sort of thing all of their own. So what I'm thinking about doing is a sister podcast for zine readings only and kind of like a Nyx reads that sort of thing. Now, if it's something that you'd be interested, I'd really like to know. This would obviously be done only with the permission of the people. <laughs> obviously, I'm not just going to pick up zines and read out sections that goes against pretty much how I operate my life. Permission first, please. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot to figure out. There's what I will read, what I won't read, you know, will I swear, will I not swear, will I talk about certain topics. I, there's, like I said, a lot to figure out, but I am really interested in doing this. So if you like the idea, if you think you'd want your zine read, that sort of thing, if you like the idea of the sister podcast for it, let me know. Okay, on to the next segment with zine events. Now, I know last episode I went a bit all or nothing on you. I blame my anxiety. It's a bit of a uh, black and white all or nothing viewpoint, that sort of thing. And I realized that I can read a few and then tell you where to find more. Like, hello, middle ground. Nice to see you. <laughs> so I've actually got 12 that sound interesting. So, but I'll, I'll move through them as quickly as I can so this section doesn't get boring. So zine events around the world. We have You're the Voice, zine making with ladies of leisure, happening January 25th in South Bank in Victoria, Australia. We have DIY night number two, photocopies, fanzines, beer and friends. That sounds fantastic. January 27th in Milano, Italy. Fanzine Wars happening January 27th in Murcia, Spain. Apologies if I've got the pronouncement of Murcia wrong. Murcia, something like that. Um, again, apologies. We have on January 27th, Tulsa Zine Night in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the US. We have Ground Zine Fair happening January 27th and 28th in Hull, United Kingdom. Zinfony Number no. 9 happening January 27th and 28th in Takasaki, Japan. Zine Club happening in Salem, Massachusetts on January 30th. And on January 31st, we have Exposition Fanzines happening in Liege, Belgium. We also have on January 31st, Graphic Novels, Fanzines, and Comics Crafternoon happening in Somerville, Massachusetts, Massachusetts United States. You want to work on public speaking? Try saying Massachusetts <laughs> repeatedly. I'm sure you, you'll work on that enunciation quickly. <laughs> All right, three more. Zine Baby monthly zine making night happening in Katoomba, New South Wales, Australia on February 1st. We have Expo Fanzine happening on February 3rd, 2018, Santiago, Chile. We also have Teen Zine Workshop happening February 6th in Prescott Valley, Arizona, United States. And there is more where that came from. 
If you would like a direct line to zine events around the world or would like to make sure that your zine event is listed, check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook. Links, as always, are in the description. So in the last episode, we talked about introductions, plans for the uh, podcast and whatnot. So let's get into actually talking about zines. Now, after introductions, usually you talk about what a zine is. Now, if you're watching or listening to this, I think it's pretty safe to assume that you've at least heard of zines. You're somewhat familiar. But one of the fun and yet frustrating things about zines is the trickiness in trying to define them. After all, a zine by any other name is a newsletter, a brochure, excuse me, a brochure, a comic, a pamphlet, a collage, a sketchbook, or even a diary. So how do you define zine? The thing is that when you start trying to put firm, put firm definitions on what a zine is, you are almost immediately faced with the exceptions to what you want your definition to be. For example, we have small circulation with global marketplaces, Etsy, Big Cartel, all of those ones that enable you to have a shop and enable to, you to, if you want to, send worldwide. Small circulation is more of a choice than a necessity of circumstance. I'm not saying it's always possible, but it's certainly open to the possibilities of wider circulation should you so choose and be able to. Let's be frank, postage sucks. <laughs> we also have the definition done for love rather than profit. Now, this is still largely true, and I'm personally happy about this. No judgments about profits and that sort of thing. You know, whether you choose to do it for a tradition or culture, a lot of people still are doing it for the love. Now, the thing is, though, that I am seeing very slowly, but I'm starting to see on places like Etsy and such like that, that more scenes are going for two, three, and sometimes even more times the price of production costs. Now, I do the math. I do the math. I sit down. I go, okay, this person says it's this many pages, that sort of thing. I go with the most expensive printing I can find. And I do the math to make sure I'm not being judgmental. And these are definitely still being done at two, three, etc. times the production price. Don't get me wrong, I am not trying to take the piss out of anyone who wants to make some money. I totally get that. But the thing is that there is a tradition there. It is part of the zine culture in a lot of ways to do these things not for profit. But uh, I am backing off that tangent. I will talk about it in another episode. So definitions. Another one is zines are physical printed matter. Now, this is an especially tricky one because are e-zines actual zines? You have more, maybe not more and more, I don't know. I haven't um, been particularly focused on the e-zine making of things, so I'm not sure if there are more and more, but I know there are a lot of people who have e-zines only. I make PDF versions of my zines because postage stinks big time, and so I want people to be able to read my zines even if I can't afford to ship them or they can't afford to have them shipped, that sort of thing. So there is that component. And again, that's another topic for uh, another, for closer inspection in a future episode. So when all is said and done, there is a very good reason why definitions of zines online are often full of words like often and maybe and usually that sort of thing. However, for the sake of clarity, for the Zine Collector podcast, see, there you go. I'm laughing at my own jokes again, but y'all said it was a, an okay thing for me to laugh at my jokes, so here we go. For clarity's sake, with their permission given, I have a couple of definitions that I really like that can help you get a foundation of what a zine is if you're unclear about it for whatever reason. So the first up is Stolen Sharpie Revolution. Now this little red book, very handy. Highly recommended that you have a copy of this if you're, even if you've been doing zines for a while, it's worth taking a look at. 
Now, keep in mind that I do have an older version of this. This is still in Sharpie Revolution 2. I think it's the fourth edition. Um, don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, actually 2018 we'll see the, let me check, 16th anniversary of Stolen Sharpie Revolution. So congratulations to Alex Reck on such a long lasting good resource. Now onto those definitions. Zines are pronounced like magazine without the mega. Yeah, don't say zine, please. Please don't say zine. <laughs> Just leave it at that. So zines are physical, printed, self-published creations that can consist of a single sheet of paper or over 100. Independently made for the love of creating and rarely make a profit. Can be created by one person or with a group of people. Usually are photocopied but can be offset, letterpress, or even mime mimeograph printed. Massachusetts. <laughs> Contents can be anything you would like. Personal stories, political ideologies, music related writing, gardening tips, jokes, lists of things you like or don't like. Travel stories, comics, photography, fiction, drawings, anything else you can think of. Zines are made by a spectrum of people throughout the world from all ages and walks of life. People who make zines can build and participate in communities that celebrate the tangible written word and support each other, each other's efforts to do so. If that doesn't give you a nice place to stand for figuring out what zines are, then I don't know what will. That being said, I also have Metazine by Davida Gypsy Briar. Now, I think it's Briar. We actually talked about the pronunciation, but I'm sorry if I've messed it up, Davida. <laughs> anyway, Metazine. In my opinion, zines have been around for centuries, and zine is just the current term for self published works, published more for passion than profit, with a goal of communication and connection. Zines tend to be part of a barter culture where ideas and expression become the commodity. Many zines believe in freedom of expression with at least a modicum of rebellion against established media and corporate culture. I love Davida's writing. I really, really do. I think it's fantastic. Highly recommend Metazine. <laughs> I think it'd be a little remiss if I don't talk about how I define zines. Now, for me, what makes a zine a zine has always come down to the handmade element that I created a thing feeling. Whether it's heavy on cotton paste or light on typeface, I feel wonder and awe knowing that I am holding someone else's thoughts, someone else's self-expression in my hand in a form that only exists by a creator's desire for it to be. I'd reference my note card a lot for that. But yeah, it's, it's beautiful to know that I have this thing in my hand and I don't care if it's mass produced. I don't care if you've printed 20 or a thousand. The thing is that you created this and I'm holding it in my hand and it is of you. And that's part of the reason I feel I need to give zine such respect. Yes, yeah, some people just vlog off a zine in an hour and there it's done, but it is still of and by them. And that to me says a lot. Zines are and can represent so many things that it's no wonder that so many of us have made them before we even heard them. I conducted a very technical, very official, and very scientific poll on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> Almost made it all the way through without laughing. So I asked people whether they made zines before they knew about zines. On Instagram, we had 39% of people say yes and 61% of people say no. On Twitter, we had 56% of people say yes and 44% of people say no. So when I added those up, it's pretty even yes, no. But I want to share some quotes on the subject that people shared with me. Now, once again, I have to apologize if I uh, say these names wrong. Latibule on Twitter said, I made little stories in booklets about things I liked when I was in primary school. I loved it so much. Looking back, I realized those were my first zines. Now I want to find them again. At By Diana on 
Twitter, which has a very unique spelling, so check the links. For a while in high school, a friend and I would make these scrapbooks that were a mix of notes, sketches, lists of fave things or people or crushes, and themed teenagery ramblings. That was, in hindsight, really good zine making practice. Olivia in Meta Paradox 1 writes, Starting at the age of 7 and ending at the age of 14, I self-published my own newspaper for family and friends, writing articles about such newsworthy items as school picnics and the new family car. But one issue took a decidedly serious turn when I reported on 9-11 shortly after it happened. I made my own comic strips, puzzles, classified ads, humor, wrote educational pieces and poetry, and even surveyed local residents about events around town making a pie chart of responses that I was very proud of at the time. Once I even printed out copies of my newspaper for my entire fifth grade class. I'm not sure what they made of it. And finally, I wanted to read a piece by Billy McCall, aka Billy the Bunny, out of Proof I Exist 22. He writes... I have been writing zines for a very long time now. When I was very young, I would make mini magazines and show them to my friends and parents. As I got into high school, I started photocopying them and sharing them on a larger scale. I grew up in rural Iowa and had never actually seen a zine and had no idea that other people did what they did. I just liked to write stories and I thought newspapers were cool. By my junior year, I had moved past photocopies and was now printing 1,000 copies at a time on newsprint with ads from small record labels providing me with just enough money to break even. It was a hell of a lot of work, but when you're 17 and feel all alone in southern Iowa, you'll do just about anything for free punk CDs. As I mentioned in the first episode, you can definitely count me in with the yes category. I was making newsletters and all sorts of little things and such. Not so much comics, but collage books and that, that sort of thing. And I actually was looking around and I found Cloud9, <laughs> my old newsletter. And it was actually a little bit better than I thought it was, to be honest. I have little announcements about various clubs. I have numerology, astrology. I shared a little bit of a novel I was working on at the time and notes and I even have a review of a concert I went to which is kind of hilarious to me now because I always say that I'm not very good and with it when it comes to music and that sort of thing so that was quite the the funny surprise that's for sure now I was looking around on YouTube for zine related videos to put in my zines playlist and the funny thing happened that I was, again, I was looking around and I found that these craft making, card making, scrapbook pages, that sort of thing, these craft centered channels had started making friendship zines, as they called them. And it was a new trend. And some made like artsy, nice mini zines, one page mini zine. They were all the one page folded up mini zine. But well, a few of them made copies for wide distribution, that sort of thing. Many of them made just one-off mini zines with little pockets and little tags tucked in the pockets and everything like that. And it's just, and they were meant to be interacted with, meant to be loved and had put stickers in it and everything. And I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Now, I'm fully admitting that I'm making assumption based on a few things mentioned in the video, but I'm fairly confident they have no idea what zines actually are. Not that they aren't making zines, they are making zines, but they've never heard of zines as such. And they have no idea that there's this whole community, this whole culture waiting that waiting for them to discover. Like there's a whole history of what they're doing and they have no idea they're just making zines for the love of it. And I think that's that's brilliant. It's fantastic. I love it. Because isn't it so lovely that it seems like there are zines within us, that sort of thing. It's all very organic that you can just come to making zines and not have to. There's no entry bar. There's no studying. There's no degree you have to get. There's nothing. You just, people just come around to making zines. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. 
I think I've said brilliant about five times now, but not as many times as I've said fantastic because that's my favorite word and I like Doctor Who. If you get that reference, you also get a cookie. Just saying. Anyway. <laughs> oh my gosh, tangent. Anyway, in the end, zines are very, very much what you want them to be. So never, ever be intimidated by making a zine. Never. Because it's entirely possible you've already made one. <laughs> Brilliant! <laughs> So that's my ramble on that subject for today, zine friends. Did you make zines early on? Were you making them in childhood or as a teenager? Were you making newsletters or little collage booklets with your friend? Is there something specific for you personally that makes a zine a zine and something else not a zine? Is there is there a specific aspect of zines that makes it a zine? Let me know in the comments, various messaging places. Let me know what you think because I would love to know. Now we come to a new segment and the public have spoken. <laughs> Anyone who replied to me about this in the last episode, I just t made a little tally and basically people have said one question per podcast would be good for fre <laughs> frequently asked questions. Excuse me, I apologize. So we'll have now a Q&A segment where I will answer one question. And that question is this, and I've had this more than any other question. Is this your moneymaker? Is what you're doing with scenes your moneymaker? And the answer is no. On to the next segment. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But uh, I hate to say it. The answer is definitely, completely, and utterly, definitely not. No. I wish it could be. Uh, I would love to, like anybody, I would love to be able to live sustainably on the thing I love to do, but it's just, it's not where I am, what it is, what's happening, that sort of thing. In recent times, things have been really tough and tight, and I must admit that my patrons on Patreon have been helping me through a lot, helping me scrape by with, uh, Etsy listing fees and Etsy fees for this and Etsy fees for that and Etsy's fees for you saying Etsy. Blah, blah, blah. Another tangent for another day. Anyway, please don't take this as anything negative. It's funny that this question comes up so much because I was actually talking to Wanderer a while back because I'd wandered in the, I'd wandered into the kitchen to talk to Wanderer. I had been making zines and everything and I. I said to him, you know what, say we won the lottery, fingers crossed, I would still be doing what I'm doing. Whether I was making a dollar, whether I'm not making anything, that sort of thing, I would still do what I'm doing because I love doing it. And in the end, I, I'm very grateful for that. And anyone would be crazy not to be grateful that yes, I get frustrated by finances, who doesn't? except the independently, massively wealthy, I suppose. I just do. I just love it. And as long as I'm surviving, as long as I've got a roof over my head and can eat most days. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I am able to eat. Sorry. Bad, bad, bad joke. I apologize. But as long as I'm able to do what I'm doing, I will do it. So, <laughs> woo, that was a great start to the Q&A segment. <laughs> And that's another thing too. I will be working on my verbal crutches so I stop saying anyway or but or so, so much. If you have any questions about zines, zine reviewing, the secret to an amazing chocolate cake, uh, anything else, anything you think that I can answer for whatever reason. I, I wouldn't say I'm very knowledgeable on theoretical physics, but I'll give it a good go. Um, <laughs> You can leave your questions in the very various comment areas. You can tweet at me, you can Instagram message, so on and so forth. Links, description, etc. Now it's time for another segment that I am calling Sharing is Caring, which is a little non-sponsored segment about scene spaces, places, and other things I'm liking in the zine verse this week, or this fortnight, or this month, whatever it turns out to be. <laughs> 
I would be remiss if I didn't start with WeMakeZines.com. If you're not familiar, WeMakeZines.com is a website that has a forum. It has specific groups for specific interests, that sort of thing. And it's a place for discussion and it's all about zines. But we have the off topic area if you want to talk about the weather because weather is apparently really interesting to some people. It is a little bit quiet after the backup kerfuffle. And if you're not familiar with that, it's basically we backed up the website and it backed up. It backed it way up. Anyway, so if you think you are registered there already, you might want to check in to make sure. You might have to re-sign up. And for that, we humbly and deeply apologize. It was a mistake. It was a hiccup. These things happen. But we are rebuilding. We are making it stronger. <laughs> We actually have a really good resource section that's starting up. We have space for podcasts about scenes. We have space for books about scenes. We have that sort of thing. We have threads about all these things. And yeah, it'll be a great place to chat and get familiar, ask questions, all that sort of thing. We have zine makers, young and old. We have zine makers, experienced and non-experienced. So go ahead, check it out. So that is actually it for today's zine friends thank you again so much for joining me and for supporting me doing this lovely podcast and all the things uh remember that everything i say is just my opinion there are no gatekeepers in the zine verse nor should there ever ever be links to everything i've talked about are in the various descriptions or blog posts that sort of thing be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where i review zines every thursday and friday the music for this podcast spanish summer by audionautics is licensed under a creative commons attribution license this is the zine collector i'm your host jamie nix until next time go make some zines Mwah. You're listening to the Zine Collector Podcast, Episode 3, 2018 Year of the Perzine, Part 1. Zine friends, welcome back to the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix, and let's talk about zines. Episode three. <laughs> Woo. I, I think I'm just going to continue to be impressed every time I'm to a new episode. I mean, maybe I'll get used to it when I'm at episode 50 or something. You know, knock on wood that I get that far. <laughs> but yeah, hey, it's another episode. Go figure. Nobody's more surprised than me. <laughs> Moving along, I want to say thank you again to the lovely feedback I had to the first episode, though I do feel I have two apologies to issue. First of all, last week I mentioned at by Diana on Twitter, but turns out that her name is Diana, which I think is really cool. She was totally fine with it, of course, but I do feel that I want to put the correction out there anyway. And the next apology goes to my friend Bodhi. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sure he was just joking around, but he did tweet at me that he's really not sure if he's actually making zines anymore after listening to the first podcast. <laughs> so yeah, my bad. I promise Bodhi you are definitely making zines and awesome ones at that. I will have his links below because he makes really cool zines. So yes, thank you for the lovely feedback. Apologies all around. And I just, uh, I wanted to point out a YouTube comment from last week. Uh, Feral, Feral Publication said, zines are working class literature. That's how he defines zines. And I thought that was fantastic. It reminded me of the Poor Last Zine podcast. Well, and there's zines, of course. So for this week, this episode, this week, <laughs> uh, this episode, I do have a little bit of an announcement, and that is the Zine Collector podcast is now on Spotify. Yay. If I could do sound effects, I'd do like 
a crowd applause or something like that. I'll work on that. I'm, I'm still learning all this stuff. But yeah, it's now on Spotify, I'm very proud to say. Uh, Pippa, the place where I host my uh, podcast, approached me about being listed in consideration for Spotify. They were having a meeting with Spotify and yeah, I signed up and lo and behold, I've been accepted. <laughs> or the podcast has anyway. <laughs> so yeah, upwards and onwards, that's for sure. That um, makes five places that you can find the zine collector now. All the links are in the description. I won't list them out here. <laughs> Moving along, I do want to have like a segment at the beginning, which I've kind of been doing already, which is feedback and responses. Now, this is sort of my response to what I talked about last week. One of the things I mentioned about zines was um, that they are not usually made for profit. If someone talks about, hey, I'm going to make some zines to make some money, any knowledgeable zine maker might have a bit of a chuckle because it's not it is not the best money-making endeavor. It's money is not usually the focus. The thing I wanted to make clear was that I do think this topic merits an entire show all itself. I apologize if you heard that noise at all. I whacked my uh, microphone thing a little bit. Anyway, I do think this uh, merits its own show, but I wanted to talk about it while it was uh, fresh in my mind as well as, you know, just in the last podcast, zine pricing. I want to be really clear that I am not against making a profit on your zines. I totally admire the standpoint where people feel zines should be free, zines should be not for profit, that sort of thing. I like, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I admire that. But at the same time, I'm looking around at the world, I'm seeing the way things are, I'm seeing how many people are struggling just to get by, and I feel that that kind of ideal, while quite lovely and definitely do it if you can sort of thing, is becoming, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, more and more unreasonable. I think people have to do whatever they can to put food on the table, and sometimes that scenes. Sometimes it's not going to get you a lot, but you know, you do what you can to try to figure out how to live in this day and age when things are so expensive, etc., etc. The problem I have with profits, and I will be the first to say that this is a blurry line, that there, there is no cut and dry, this is this and this is this with me. But I get a bit sticky about pricing when I feel like people are being taken taken advantage of. And what I mean by that is, say I know from what information I have in a zine description, when I'm looking on Etsy or something like that, in the description, from that information, if I know that zine costs 10 cents to make or 20 cents, if I know that it costs that little and you're charging, say, $5 for it, then I'm like, really? Like, I don't want to judge because I don't know people's financial positions and everything, but I have also, I feel like that's trying to take advantage of the community almost. I, I, I don't like this implication that I can produce something for 10 cents and, you know, get $5 for it. And, and again, I like, I, I hate confrontation. I hate giving opinions because I don't like fights and stuff like that. So I, I, I know that this is not a clear issue, but I just wanted to make it clear that I'm not against profits. I'm, not, I'm really not, but I am against maybe overdoing it. You know, it's, it's all, it's a bit subjective and I apologize for that. I wish I had a firmer definition or margin or something like that. Basically, I want everybody to get by. I don't want anybody to be starving, but I also don't want people to feel that they can't access scenes, that they are excluded from the community because of price. If you have a $10, a $15, a $20 zine, yes, I have seen them, a $20 zine, 
if you have that out there, then be clear, please, why it's priced the way it is. If you have special paper, if you have a large number of pages, if you pay your contributors, all of that stuff factors in, but let me know. I mean, personally, if you have a $10 zine, I probably still can't afford it, but I feel better knowing that, okay, this is $10 because this, this, and this. Be clear. That's all I'm asking. Be clear about why something is. And if you think that, you know, a $4.50 profit on a 10 cent zine, um, kind of judging for taxes and uh, Etsy listing fees, if you think that's cool, then that's your thing. But all I'm asking is just be clear so I know what I'm buying and who I'm buying from. That sort of thing. Moving along to zine events. Now I have a little range of zine events from February 9th to the 21st and I will read them off as per usual. On February 9th in Auckland, New Zealand, and please forgive me, I cannot pronounce the the native names. I apologize very humbly. But in Auckland, Auckland, New Zealand on the 9th, we have the Free Same Same Queer Zine Workshop. Also on the 9th in Kyoto, Japan, we have the Morning Zine Circle number 17. On February 10th in Elsternwick, Victoria in Australia, we have the Craft Zine, Craft Zine and Record Market. Also on the 10th in Berkeley, California, we have the Zine Scene. And lastly, on February 10th, in Nottingham, UK, we have Write, Print, Share, Creative Writing and Zine Making Workshops. On the 11th, in Melbourne, Australia, we have Festival of the Photocopier. I'm getting a little teary because I know so many friends will be there and I won't. Ugh. Go to Festival of the Photocopier if you're anywhere around Melbourne. It's really amazing. On February 13th in Prescott Valley, Arizona, we have a teen zine workshop. On February 14th in Albuquerque, New Mexico, we have dirty zine reading. Intriguing. <laughs> On February 16th and 17th in Ghent, or Gent, not sure, Belgium, we have GGB Clubhouse times FEL equals 24 hour zine challenge. Ooh. I've never done a 24-hour zine challenge yet. I might have to do that this year. Check it off the old bucket list. On February 18th in Perth, Australia, we have the world's tiniest zine fair. And I'm completely biased because one of my zines is in there, but it is so cool. They're tiny zines. They're like A7 and, well, A6, A7, and A8, that sort of thing. It is so cool. Definitely check it out if you are able. On February 19th in Lawrence, Kansas, we have monthly Mini Zine Mondays. Oh, that's fantastic. Mini Zine Mondays. I love it. And finally, on February 21st in Somerville, Massachusetts. There we go. <laughs> Massachusetts. We have graphic novels, fanzines, and comics crafternoon. So that's it for zine events around the world. If you would like a direct line to zine events or would like to make sure that your zine event is listed in the World Zine Event Calendar, check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook and Patreon now. Links are in the description. So now we get to the meat of the matter or the tofu, if that's uh, your life choice. <laughs> in the last episode, we talked about what zines are, defining zines, and how definitions don't quite fit zines. In this episode, we're talking about perzines, if you hadn't already got that from the title. That is right, my zine friends. It is my pleasure to welcome you in February to 2018, Year of the Perzine. It's a year for sharing our lives, our stories, and our worldviews in zine form. Year of the Perzine was born of a desire to see more Perzines at Zine Fest. Alex Rex started a discussion in one of the zine groups, Zines A Go Go, and talked about basically not seeing them as much as she used to. Now, I don't know if there's any specific uh, events or anything for Perzines, but I do know that there are a couple of Zine Fests that have taken up the call and are putting a special focus on Perzines. 
And those two are Dear Diary Zine Fest happening in Oakland, California in late February, as well as the Massachusetts Feminist Zine Fest happening in April. So what are Persines and why would we dedicate an entire year to them? All zines have a personal element to them, but Persines are specifically about personal life stories and reflections and that sort of thing. I mean, Persine is short for personal zine. They are their own genre within the zineverse. But as per usual with zines, definitions are a little bit bendy. Uh, some of my favorite Persines have uh, fiction writing, poetry, art, reviews, that sort of thing. So while you have Persines that have the overall focus, you can still have elements of other zines within them. Persines can be about any facet of your life, basically, as long as it's about your life. Uh, but I would say many, if not the majority of Persines are often about, you know, deep, big, intense subjects. In an article I found called Why One Community Chooses Not to Tell Their Stories on the Internet, Sarah Boboltz writes, Perzines dig into serious subjects. Many of the Perzines I encountered in my research touch on depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, PTSD, or a combination of various conditions. Making and distributing zines provides for many a community to connect with and discuss shared experiences. But that seems to ring true for Perzine writers more so than any others. Now, I'm not sure if you're hearing that noise, but I do apologize if you are. Wanderer is making a coffee. In the Perzines I've read, I can confidently say that most mention things along the lines of mental health and mental illness, questions about identity and sexuality, and pretty much most deep subjects in between. I don't know if it's despite of or because of or, or something like that. I love Perzines. I, I adore them. They, they're easily one of my favorite zine genres out there. When I was a kid, I was always reading biographies and stuff like that. In long summer breaks from school, I would treasure the life update letters I'd get from my friends. The stories I read that were fiction, I still wanted to know about people. I didn't really care as much about stories, about places and things like that. I wanted to know about people. And like really the only thing that makes me sad about Perzines is that I didn't find them sooner, really. When it comes to writing Perzines, you may be faced with the question, and usually from this question comes from people who aren't as familiar with scenes, why not just write a memoir? The first thing that springs to mind with that is why one of the reasons that zines exist in the first place, and that's because unpopular and or unwelcome voices wanted a way to share their words. They wanted a way to speak and be heard and talk amongst themselves and things like that. And thus, and not just because of this, but largely because of the zines keep on going because they push away this thought that they need the approval of some publisher to be able to speak, to be able to be heard. And I know what some people are thinking. Well, you don't need publishers these days. It's, you want it self-published. But for the context of this conversation, it's zines basically are the same thing. Zines are self-publishing. What we are doing, making zines, is self-publishing. So what I'm talking about and what I think a lot of people who have said to me, why not just write a memoir, they're talking about getting your life story or life stories published through a publisher. The thing about memoirs that annoys me in, re in the respect of like maybe publishing one is that there's this idea, there's this feeling that you have to be X amount of years old before you can actually write one, before your life is valid or whatever they're saying. They, like, you need to live so long before you have lived enough to write a memoir, that sort of thing. Like, there's nothing like that in the zine verse. Like, there are kids making zines and that's fantastic and that's the way it should be. You shouldn't have to be so old to, you know, get the stamp of validation and now you can write about yourself. I think that's just BS. 
When I was 24, someone said to me that I would have a great memoir someday. The sentiment was really lovely, and I and for a long time I held on to that as, you know, that's the loveliest thing anyone's ever said to me. You know, that may be sad in your opinion. I don't know, I'll leave that up to you. But the thing is, someday, someday, like I had to wait, I would have a great memoir someday. Because the thing was, at 24, at 24 years old, I figured I'd done a fair bit of living. I was an abuse survivor. I literally ran away to Australia from Wisconsin. And I f had already found reasonable success as a professional blogger and an online publicist. Do I qualify for an early application or how does that work in the memoir world? How do you know when you're done enough with a part of your life to write about it in a way that a publisher would accept? It's incredibly frustrating to me. And yet, you know, introducing perzines. Write about your life as you're living it. You don't have to hit a milestone to start writing. You don't have to get approval to start writing. You don't have to get a stamp. You don't have to get anyone saying. You can just start writing about your life as you're living it. Wonderful. <laughs> so I'm not saying I'm against memoirs. Like I, I read memoirs. I read memoirs. I like memoirs. It's, it's lovely and they're lovely in and by their own right. I'm not trying to talk you out of writing a memoir if that's what you want to do. All I'm saying is one, you don't have to wait and don't let anybody try to convince you that you have to wait and two, you don't need anyone's approval. Not anyone's approval. It's your life. It's your perspective. And I don't care if you're six or 60, the way you see things has value. Okay. Don't let anybody try to convince you that it doesn't because you do. Okay. Trust me. Trust this crazy zine person from Australia. All right. <laughs> now the other thing about persines and I feel like this is more confusing to people because writing a memoir publishing like I think more people understand why you might not do that but this one's confusing because people well let's just get into it why not just blog to answer that in part I go back to the article why one community chooses not to tell their stories on the internet after Erla Legault's sister died of cancer, the 55-year-old British Columbian turned to her long-term hobby to process her grief. She said, I know, for me, getting it out of my body really helped. Cultural taboos may stymie discussion of certain emotional subjects, but you can still put it all down on paper. It's just really immediate. That's what I liked about it, she explained, adding that she didn't seem a similar authenticness on the internet, a medium designed to connect people. Can even the most intimate blogs and message boards compare with the closeness of words on paper? I think that part of the article makes a very good point when it comes to blogs and persines. Now, I don't think it should be blogs versus persines because I, I think they both have their own place in the world. But as much as I would like to be able to find the exact words to tell you why words on a screen aren't words on a page for me, I'd love to be able to explain to say, hey, this X, Y, Z, but I can't. It, the thing is that I simply have to accept. And I think a lot of people understand and accept without being able to explain it that words on a page whether they're typed or written or copied or anything like that, words on a page will always be more personal, personal and more intimate than words on a screen. I think that's just the reality of the situation, even though we may not understand it. Now, another side note, I'm not against per blogging, <laughs> personal blogging. Personal blogging is how I met my best friend of like, what, a decade now, something like that. It's, 
been ages. We're old. <laughs> and Sea Green Zines is a blog. It's not quite a personal blog, but it's at least, you know, semi per. <laughs> semi per. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but that's amusing to me some for some reason. But what it all comes down to is that I like blogging. I like persines, but a blog is not a persine. They they just aren't the same, and I don't think they ever will be. It's just the nature of what they are. So now that those things are out of the way, why don't we talk about something that actually feels a little good? <laughs> feels a bit better than saying it's not a memoir and it's not a blog. Something that, you know, is a bit inspiring. At least I hope it will be. I mean, after all, what would a podcast about Persings be without an actual personal story involved? So when I was trying to take all of my sticky notes and all of my scribbled thoughts on scraps of paper and trying to organize them into something that at least resembled a show to make sense. That would make sense. Not for my speaking about it, apparently. <laughs> when I was doing all of that, I realized that I didn't just want to tell you about Persines and I didn't want to just tell you why they're not like a blog or why they're not like a memoir. The thing I wanted to really get across is why I feel that Persines are important. They are, are an important genre within an important media. I mean, really what I'd like to do is convince you to make a Persine and then maybe send me a copy just because I like zines. <laughs> But I do realize that Persines are not going to be for everybody, no matter how much I want them to be. So in case I haven't made it clear, and in, cl in case you're not sure if you want to make a Persine, and in case maybe you're not quite feeling the year of the Persine vibes just yet, let me tell you about a Persine series called Pieces. Pieces is a Perzine series started by Nicole, aka Corridor Girl, in 2010. This is the first Perzine series I ever read, and as far as I can recall, I'm not 100% sure, but fairly, fairly sure that this is actually uh, the first zine trade I ever made. At least the, tra I, the first zine I traded for zines I traded for were numbers one through five. Keep in mind that this, when I traded for these, they were, this was early days for me. I had barely discovered zines, uh, made the trade with Nicole through wemakezines.com or I think it was a Ning, yes it was the Ning back then. So yeah, I was very new to zines and this was my first experience with Perzines. So with that in mind, pieces blew my mind. It just, it amazed me. The whole concept was so cool. She was sharing her life. She was writing about her life. Anything she wanted to share, anything she wanted to throw out into the world, she was doing. And she was making it into a zine. So, and making copies and anybody, anybody could read them. Like she was open for trades and I believe still is open for trades and things like that. And it wasn't just that she was writing about all these things. It was that she was writing about them and then choosing a typeface and then choosing backgrounds and not just saying things to the world through her words, but also in how she chose to present things and how they looked in the size and the number of pages and things like that. Everything was a choice. Everything was, everything was self-expression. Everything was, hi, this is me. And the thing was, it just got better. <laughs> we had so much in common. It just, you know, not spoken a lot. We basically arranged the trade and that was that. And then I get these zines and I'm like, we have so much in common, yay! 
We both ident- self-identified as writers as, at a young age. We both got pulled up by teachers for using UK English spelling instead of American English spelling. We both met Garth Nix. We both struggled with some writer's block. We both found inspiration in Stephen King's On Writing. Like, and that's just a few examples just from the first issue. Like, <laughs> it was amazing to me. All of a sudden, I had access to someone's thoughts and experiences and world views and and she was so much like me. <laughs> it just I don't know. I don't know if I just got into this space where I forgot that I had that I could have things in common with other people that I just I felt so different and so weird. And I mean, it was about the time when we had moved from Ringwood to Bendigo and what few friends I had were now distant friends and that sort of thing and and yeah I felt especially alone at that time and suddenly there's Nicole across the world and they were just so <laughs> we just had so much in common it's it still boggles my mind a bit to be quite honest the thing is because we had so much in common but all, and, and but not just because of that. It, it, it was because she... It was like she just trusted the world with her words. She trusted the world with her life. Because you, you can never be 100% sure who's going to read your zine. So you're, you're basically trusting humanity to look at your life and examine it and, and, and take what they want from it. And the thing about reading about Nicole's life was that the things she thought about and went through and examined in herself made me look at my own life. Not just in the things she wrote about, but it, it made me realize how much I took took for granted, really, about my life and my personality and my views and stuff like that. And the, there were so many things I hadn't questioned that Nicole was questioning about herself and her ideas and things like that. And there were facets of her that were completely foreign to me. And yet, like, I'd never thought about it. And it was, and it's, that's something I like about Persians in general, that there are life experiences and there are life views that I simply will never have. So reading Persians is a way to expand my view of the world and expand my view of people and open myself up to better understanding of where where other people are coming from. And the thing is, that was really beautiful to me then and is really beautiful to me now because I'm pretty highly socially anxious, is that I had all of this, all of the intimacy really of like being a pen pal with her, but without the pressure of, I've written to you and now you have to respond. There, it was such a warm and welcoming thing to me to find Persines and they, they were there. They were there, you read them when you want, as you want, take them as you want, and you don't have to respond. You can dismiss them, you can apply them to your life, you can think about them, you can do whatever, and you can respond if you want to. Well, I mean, at least I could with Nicole because she always put um, contact details in the back. Some people don't, and then that's just what it is. And you don't respond and that sort of thing. But N what Nicole did was she never put the pressure on to respond, but she left the door open. And I just, I really, I really, I love that. I love the, the welcoming and yet security of knowing that I didn't have to engage if I didn't want to. So it wasn't just loving the concept or the fact that we had so much in common that has kept me reading pieces over the years. I think the latest one is number 13. Pieces has helped me feel not so alone, not just in the moment of reading, but over the, over the course of the years as well, as she's been creating this series. And that's the thing, it is an ongoing series. As Nicole is living her life, growing and changing, so am I. Just getting these zines over the years has been a reminder that 
I'm not just swimming in this fishbowl alone, you know, that sort of thing. It's we're, we're all doing, living, changing, growing. And to, I mean, I think that's something the Persine series has over a memoir because it's not quite real time, of course, but it's almost like real time that, that you know, a person's mind changes, a person has realizations and that sort of thing. It, it participating in someone living and growing and and someone outside of yourself and makes you think outside of yourself and that and I hope I'm making sense I really hope I'm making sense because this has been a very important concept for me to get my head around as as I'm growing to be well as close to a functional adult as I can be really if I look through the years pieces one Nicole and I had so much in common and that was just mind-blowing, you know, worlds away, that sort of thing. Pieces four on lucid dreaming. This encouraged me to get into lucid dreaming myself, to investigate it, to try it. And yes, I have had lucid dreams in there. Pretty cool if you ask me. Over the course of Pieces as a series, she's written so much about mental health, mental illness and stuff like that. It's helped me to become, to feel more at peace with my own feelings about medications and how I approach things and therapists and um, psychiatrists. Now I have permission to read a little bit. Nicole said it was okay to help me show things basically. And in pieces 11 she writes, I'm unsure of my diagnosis but at this point semantics don't matter. The therapist who terminated my treatment had me with borderline personality disorder but the therapist after her who was the best therapist I'd ever seen and who restored my faith in therapists overall, felt that because I didn't lack empathy, I didn't fit into the borderline spectrum. She, however, specialized in dis dissociative disorders, so perhaps she was colored with a bit of bias. Major depressive, BPD, dissociative disorder, I'm realizing the label doesn't matter. As long as I can understand myself, my strengths, my limitations, and my own brand of self-care, I can manage. There's too much overlap between diagnoses of anyhow. That small bit of writing, when I first read it, helped me to relax so much about the alphabet soup that it is my experience of my various diagnoses in the mental health system. It helped me to see, yeah, there are a lot, there is a lot of overlap and it, and it helped me to start looking at myself as a human rather than all of these labels that didn't change a lot, but changed enough to leave me quite frustrated and confused. To see that she had the strength to let go of the labels and just go, okay, I am who I am, let's go from here inspired me to do so. So to say I have identified with Nicole a lot over the years is probably a bit of an understatement. But the thing about her whole series that has had the uh, most impact on me is actually something we don't have in common. And it's something she wrote about in Pieces 13. Now, Pieces 13 on being a romantic asexual. Thanks to this scene, I have learned that under the asexual banner, there are different types of asexuality, one of them being demisexual, uh, a term I'd had never heard of before. But according to the zine, demisexuals do not experience what some call primary sexual attraction. This means a demisexual person only experiences sexual attraction after a close emotional bond is formed with another person. It's important to note that the emotional bond does not have to be romantic in nature. Demisexuals are not sexually attracted to strangers, celebrities, acquaintances, blind dates, people they think are good looking but don't know or don't have any emotional connection to. Please note this does not mean demisexuals think their love or attraction is above or more valid than folks who experience sexual attraction to the kinds of people listed above. Demisexuals just have a different sexual attraction pathway to follow. 
I remember the day I read that. I remember it quite clearly. Afternoon, sitting in the recliner, reading the zine. I had to stop reading. I literally closed the zine and put it down and just had to sit and think. Her sharing that definition, her writing about that. And that's not even, demisexuality is not the focus of that zine. Demisexuality is three paragraphs and 46 pages about being a romantic asexual. Nicole was being thorough. Nicole was listing out the different flavors of asexuality and she was covering her, ba covering her bases and she was making sure that people understood that asexuality has a spectrum just like many other things. In those three paragraphs, she, <laughs> please forgive me, I'm struggling a bit because those three paragraphs changed me. They helped me not only to identify, but also to claim a huge part of who I am. I'd never heard of demisexuality. I had always thought I was just a bit weird, a bit different from my friends. I didn't think about it too much, but when I read that word and that label and that definition, so much of my life suddenly slid into place. So much made sense. I, I had a place somewhere. That part of me had a name. <laughs> And that, my friends, is the power of Perzines. <laughs> I, I hope I am doing a good job of imparting exactly how monumental that moment was to me. Because it continues to affect me as I do more research, as I look into things more, as I understand more about myself. And again, three paragraphs in a 46 page Persine. There you go. <laughs> As you may have been able to tell, considering the length that this podcast is going to be, the subject of Persines became one that was huge very quickly. I thought it'd be a, a quick and easy thing to talk about, but boom, there was so much I wanted to say and so much I wanted to get across and that became especially clear when my friend Wolfram at Queer Content on, Quitter, on Twitter tweeted at me, on Twitter tweeted at me, consent is probably the biggest issue with Persines, particularly if it talks about other people. Not only is it polite to have consent, but you could get, land yourself in hot water if you don't. Now, I'm not going to start on the issue of consent in this episode. It's definitely already quite long enough. So next week I will be chatting about consent and about the uh, complicated nature of writing about other people in your zine. Now, as much as I'm sure you want me to wrap this up, I do have a little bit of a, I want a note I want to end this segment on and basically say this. When it comes to perzines of any sort, short, long, you know, intense, not intense, a lot of people say, my life isn't interesting. Nobody will care. Why would I write a perzine? Nobody will care. And to anyone thinking that, to anyone feeling that, I care. I do. I care. If you want to make a perzine and you're worried because you think nobody will care, well, now you know I do. Now, I'm just some zine-obsessed crazy lady living in Australia doing podcasts and reviewing scenes and stuff like that. Like, I'm, I'm just me. But if, if people not caring is the one reason stopping you from making a perzine, well, don't let it stop you because I care. Go make that perzine. <laughs> Okay, I have talked a lot this episode about various things, so I will keep the Q&A portion of the episode pretty short because it's a pretty short answer. The question is, will I be at Festival of the Photocopier 2018? And as much as I would like to say yes, I'm afraid I won't be there. 
Uh, I tried, I really did, but I just couldn't make the logistics of everything work and I'm very, very sad, but I hope that all my friends and zine friends go and have a wonderful time and share lots of pictures online, videos, that sort of thing, all sorts, because, you know, I can't go, but maybe I can just live vicariously through you a little bit. <laughs> That sort of thing. So lots of pictures, please, for those of us who aren't able to make it this year. Because the time is going, I'm going to save the sharing is caring uh, spotlight for next week, just in the interest of time. So that is it for today, my zine friends. Thank you again so much for joining me. I hope my prattle on per, per zines made at least a little bit of sense for you. Remember that everything I say is just my opinion. There are no gatekeepers in the zineverse, nor should there ever be. Links to everything I talk about are going to be in the description. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. Now, the music for this podcast, the kick and tune at the beginning and the end is called Spanish Summer by Audionautics and is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. This is the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix, and until next time, go make a zine or five. <laughs> was a big one. You're listening to the Zine Collector Podcast Episode 4, 2018 Year of the Perzine Part 2, Consent and Copyright. Zine friends, welcome to the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Let's talk about zines. That's why we're here after all, isn't it? <laughs> Hello, episode four. Yeah, <laughs> I told you I'd keep getting uh, excited about these episodes for ever, basically. <laughs> Thank you all once again for the lovely feedback to the last episode. I'm not sure exactly there was one thing that I was anxious about with the previous episode, but I was definitely exceptionally and incredibly anxious, and I think it was only the length of the recording, which was considerably longer than the finished product, but I think it was the length of recording it that stopped me from doing it a million times. Like There was just something. It, it was a case of I was being attacked by the doubt monsters, basically. So again, Thank you for the lovely feedback as always. Basically, you know, the feedback is always wonderful and keeps me going and helps me um, have a sword and shield against the doubt monsters. You know, fighting them off and all that good stuff. <laughs> I was especially happy to hear that there were some younger listeners who have felt that they couldn't write about their lives, that they were too young to write about their lives or have something to say in that regard, who were now inspired to say, hey, I can write a perzine, you know, that sort of thing. There, there shouldn't be any age gating in that genre. And that was absolutely beautiful because that uh, basically is uh, one of my goals really with the last episode to just help people to see that they can make a perzine if they want to. You don't have to wait to be any particular age or get permission from anyone, that sort of thing. So that was really very beautiful to hear. Yeah, I also wanted to say, based on uh, a comment on a previous episode, that things here, I feel like I'm falling into a rhythm. N maybe not a rhythm, but everything is feeling not regular yet. I, I don't feel like I've been doing everything long enough, but I do feel comfortable with the way things are in the show 
right now with segments and things like that. But that being said, things are still flexible. If you have suggestions, requests, that sort of thing, let me know. I I am not guaranteeing anything, of course, but uh, yeah, I'm a pretty flexible person. Yes, I have wanted to do a podcast for a long time, but at the same time, if you're not enjoying it, then what's the point, really? I mean, <laughs> I don't like the sound of my voice that much, so yeah, I don't actually like it at all. But uh, yeah, do podcasting if you have a problem with that, because wow, you have to get used to the sound of your own voice very quickly. So I'll just go right to it, move on to news and announcements and say, yay, no more wobbly desk. This is for the uh, visual, uh, the people watching. I apologize for this brief note to the people who only listen, but basically I had a really wobbly table, an extremely wobbly table, and when I get excited, I move my hands around a lot, and uh, yeah, I go a bit all over the place, and it was wobbling the camera, so... And that was really annoying and it was bothering me, but it was also bothering me to try to keep my hands still <laughs> for an entire podcast. Now this table isn't perfect, but it's better. And shout out to local community by sale groups and the people who aren't trying to make a profit there. They're just, you know, trying to sell their stuff and move it along to another home that will love it because I I got a desk for my, for my, um, my computer and now I have this lovely, well technically it's our kitchen table, but <laughs> it is a lot steadier and so the video won't be so wobbly and that might actually help with the audio as well. I'm not sure if there was any, there was nothing I caught as such, but anything that keeps the mic steady is a good thing. The only other announcement I really have for this podcast is that March is coming up, and what does that mean? That means it's mini zine March! Yeah! Mmm! And you're wondering, okay, Nyx, what does that mean? <laughs> Basically, mini zine March is something I started a couple years ago, and it just means that March is the month that I dedicate to my love of per <laughs> Persines. <laughs> I always love Persines. Do we really need a month? No, we need a whole year. 2018! Okay, tangent over. <laughs> so March, I review only mini zines during the month of March. Now for the purposes of definition, I say that a mini zine is anything that's smaller than a five or if you're using American size as a half fold. If it's, you know, quarter fold, most of them are quarter fold or the one page folded into eight pages. Yeah, my definition of mini, mini zine for the sake of uh, mini zine March. Now, I don't have a list of activities as such for the month, but I do encourage you all to make mini zines during the month. There was one person who said that they were thinking of making a mini zine every single day for the month, and wow, <laughs> that is amazing. I, I I would be way too scared to do, even challenge myself to that. I'd be like, no, no, I'm sorry, I died. But good luck to you. And if you are mini zining in March, be sure to uh, send me a link in various spaces, places, so I can check it out and cheer you on. Because yay, mini zines. And if you're making mini per zines, that even like you're, uh, you're doubling up, aren't you? March 2018, year of, or month of the mini per zine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll see how that goes over, eh? <laughs> and now we get to that fun part of the podcast where I read off some zine events that are happening around the world in the next fortnight. On February 21st in Dundee, Scotland, we have Paper Arcade Zine Jam. On February 24th in Peterborough, Ontario, Canada, we have Art Space Book and Zine Fest. Also on the 24th, we have the Tally Zine Fest in Tallahassee, Florida. And we have the World's Tiniest Zine Fair number no. 2 happening on the 24th in Albany, uh, I almost said Washington. <laughs> it's Albany, Western Australia in Australia. On February 25th in East Bay, California, we have the Dear Diary Zine Fest, a per zine focused zine fest. And shout out to Long Arm Stapler 
for their second episode, interviewing the organizers of the Deer Diaries Fest. On February 26th through March 2nd in Toulouse, France, we have Stage Fanzine, which is something and a workshop. Excuse me, uh, my one semester of French has failed me. I'm not sure, but there's a workshop involved. <laughs> On February 28th in Northampton, Massachusetts, we have Forbes Library Zine Club. On March 1st in Cincinnati, Ohio, we have Drink and Draw Zine Make and Swap. On March 3rd in Fort Worth, Texas, we have the Fort Worth Zine Fest. Also on March 3rd in Fremantle, WA, we have the Pulp Paper Fair. Fremantle. It's either Fremantle or Fremantle. It's one of those things in Australia, and I haven't been to WA, so you'll have to forgive me. Fremantle, Fremantle? Either way, I apologize. <laughs> anyway. So, in that place in WA, the Pulp Paper Zine Fair happening on the 3rd. On the 3rd and the 4th in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales, in Australia, we have the Halfway Print Zine Fest. And finally, on March 3rd and 4th in Taipei, Taiwan, we have Zine Day Taiwan. Oh, fantastic. Zine day. <laughs> and there is a lot more th where that came from. So if you would like a direct line to zine events happening all around the world or and or to make sure that your zine event is listed in the world zine event calendar, please check out at fanzines. Links will be in the description. At fanzines is both is on Twitter, Facebook, and Patreon now. So definitely check that out and see what's happening or make something happen in your community. Okay, and now we get to it. Consent and copyright. So in the last episode, we talked about perzines and uh, what I feel are their importance in the world, as well as uh, my rundown of perzines, specifically one perzine series pieces and how that dramatically affected my life over the years. So in this episode, we're going to get into matters of consent and copyright because as much as our lives are our own, as much as no one can have our memories but us, it's still a little bit complicated when you're writing about other people. We don't live in a vacuum as much as we may want to sometimes, and the inevitability of life is that we run into other people, and other people influence us for better and for worse. Now, you can definitely choose to write a perzine that doesn't involve any other people, in which case, see you next episode? <laughs> Sorry, probably a really bad joke, but so you can definitely do that. You can write a perzine and just not involve other people and that is definitely one way to protect you from some of the things I'm going to mention coming up. But I am going to assume that many people like me write about other people and their influences on our lives, again for better or worse. Now, when the suggestion came in, for this topic, it was only about consent, but in regards, within the context of Persians and writing about other people in Persians, I really felt that consent and copyright were very much linked. They were at the very least entangled, and that's why I felt that I should talk about them both, because I feel like there there's a, a head side and a heart side. There's the the legal side, and then there's being a nice person, except sometimes you can't always be a nice person, that sort of thing. I'll, I'll try not to get ahead of myself, but in the end I felt, I mean, most people think copyright in regards to written work, but after all, aren't our memories and our experiences of our lives just as precious to protect? At least I think so, and uh, they are a bit tangled, I will admit that, but I do hope that I can uh, cover all of the subjects in a way that's not not too confusing for anybody. <laughs> I shall do my best, but I fully admit that I can uh, be a bit scattered. Ooh, nearly knocked the mic. If you heard anything, I apologize. 
So let me tell you about a few events that helped inspire the writing of this episode. In 2010, zine makers around the world started receiving emails from someone named Teal Triggs. And basically, the emails followed the same format. Hi, I'm Teal Triggs. I wrote a book called Fanzines. I have used this and this of your zine or zines. I hope that's okay. Bye bye now. And left it at that. Last year, someone messaged me and said, hey, could you please send me the printable version of your zine? They were just going to scan it, but if I could just send them the printable version, that would save them a lot of time and effort. Thanks. And recently, someone suggested making a zine that would include copied pages from other people's written work and yet not expressing any plans for getting permission to do so. In the first instance with Teal Trigg, she ended up using zine covers and zine interiors without permission. And even worse than that, she ended up publishing incorrect things as fact because she took the better to beg for big beg forgiveness than ask permission route. And even when people brought up the fact that things were wrong before the publishing date, she didn't do anything about it. In the event that had to do with someone messaging me and just asking for the print copy because it would save them the time and effort of scanning my zine, they didn't ask me if I was okay with that. I could either make it easy for them or make it hard, but either way, it was going to happen. In the most recent example, if it's all done in fun, you know, what's the harm? If I'm not making a profit on the zine, then what's the harm? In all of these events, there's an assumption that it's okay because we're just zinesters, right? We're just zine makers. It doesn't matter, does it? But the thing is that it really, really does. For something where the answer usually comes down to a very simple yes or no, the issue of consent, even just within the context of perzines, of writing perzines, is a big and complicated one. So before I get started, I want to make a note that should probably be fairly obvious, but disclaimer anyway, I'm not a lawyer. And even if I was, the thing is that these things change from state to state. There are different types of uh, laws and legislation from state to state to state, country to country, and so you really need to be familiar with local as well as international, depending on the situation. I have a professional writing and editing background, classes and, and such like that, and I do have a bit of an ex I do have a bit of experience as an author, but that being said, that's it. That's um, the limit of my expertise or lack thereof. Okay, writing about other people. So what is consent? Consent is basically the act of giving permission for something to happen. I consent for you to do this. I consent for you to send me cupcakes. Please? <laughs> I apologize, a bit, a bit of a flippant joke given the, uh, <clears throat> the topic. Moving on. So it's the act of giving permission for something to happen. In my own life, Wanderer is actually the first person I asked for consent in regards to writing my perzines. I, I talked to him, I sat him down, I explained what I was thinking about, I explained what topics in his life and our lives that would forever be, you know, out of bounds, like he didn't have to worry about me writing about certain things, and I introduced him to the possibility of his zine name, which he ended up liking, <laughs> and he gave me permission. It was, in that case, it was as simple as that. When it comes down to it, most people are okay with this sort of thing. Most people are okay, I mean, as long as you're not ripping them a new one, most people are happy so long as you ask permission. If you, As long as you grant them the basic respect of saying, hey, may I, then people are happy and excited. If you are polite and respectful and if you ask someone and they say yes, you might even find that you have a new reader or even a new fan in the future. When I was writing my novel Dark Echoes, I ended up turning it into sort of a community thing of sorts. I ended up 
asking a lot of people if they wanted to be characters. And with their permission, and for fun, it ended up where there was this new community of people all around this book because they all shared the thing in common is that they were all in the book. And it ended up where people requested, I want to be a villain, I want to be a hero. Um, one person was, <laughs> unfortunately, one person was a little disappointed because he really, really wanted to be a woman in the book and our wires got crossed a little bit and I didn't realize he wanted to be a woman in the book. But uh, next one, <laughs> I promise you can be a woman in the next one. Anyway, so it ended up being a really lovely, wonderful, warm thing. And it all came from, well, it came from people saying, yes, you know, I'd like to be in your book. But at the same time, it came from just having the respect to say, may I? It, I feel like these days, and I feel like I say these days a lot, but with things the way they are, I feel like a little respect goes even further than it may have in the past because people can often expect the worst and yet here we are <laughs> and I'm just going to take a side note if you hear a little something it's because it's raining outside and I have a nice color bond noisy roof and I'm sorry but I'd really like to keep recording today so I apologize for background noise if you can hear it back to Dark Echoes, my novel, and my Persian series. In the end, a lot of people really enjoyed, maybe not enjoyed, were, were pleased to be asked. And in the end, that's what it comes down to, really. Just affording people the basic respect, understanding that this is your life or this is your name and I would like to use this in some way. Are you okay with that? So what if you don't have permission? Now, if you're writing without permission, it's important to note, I think, that this applies to businesses and organizations as well as people. Largely, it all coincides on the legal, from a legal standpoint. If Whether you're writing about insert business or insert person, if you say something negative about them, it can have the same legal ramifications really it all comes down to defamation. Now defamation is the action of damaging someone's good reputation, hence why businesses and organizations, uh, they, they don't often do it, at least not historically, but they can do it. I mean you have some leeway with reviews but you're not protected because you're talking about a business instead of a person. Now there are two types of defamation. There's libel and slander. Slander is the spoken version of defamation. Libel is the written one and obviously so we're going to be talking about libel rather than slander. It's libel is a written defamation. Basically the argument that you have damaged someone's good reputation by what you've written. One thing to note is that yes, people, businesses, organizations, you cannot libel the dead. But you have to be really careful still because if by what you say about a person who is deceased somehow implicates someone who is still living, a living relative of this person, this person did this thing and I saw them and they're, they've now died and so I'm protected. But if you imply that someone saw that something, someone someone living saw the illegal act of someone who deceased, you're implying that that person living had something to do with it, and that person can sue you, still sue you for defamation, even though you are mainly talking about the deceased person. Now, <laughs> it's a little bit of a complex issue, so I hope that makes sense. But basically, it's if you were writing about someone who is deceased. Just be careful about any implications to living relatives. Even if you're directed in one direction, just keep in mind anyone on the peripheral. <laughs> if you're writing something positive, don't worry about it. You're not going to damage someone's reputation by writing something positive, so there's no claim for defamation. And even if you're writing something that's a bit neutral. Not necessarily positive, but not negative either. You can't, the, again, there's the argument, you can't, you're not damaging someone's reputation by writing something 
that's neutral. So you're fairly good there. Like, again, I'm not a lawyer, but you're fairly good there. The thing to note is that if you're writing something negative, saying in my opinion isn't going to keep you safe, or saying it is, it's just a review isn't going to keep you safe. Yes, there are certain protections if you are reviewing something, but at the same time, in my opinion, so-and-so is, is an abusive, manipulative psychopath. Just because you've prefaced that statement with, in my opinion, you are not protected from legal action by so-and-so. It's still, even if it's your opinion, it's damaging to their reputation, etc., etc. It's all, frankly, annoying, but that's law for you. <laughs> even if it's the truth, truth is a defense, but it's not an ironclad defense. Saying it is truth will help you. Proving it is truth will help you, but it will not 100% protect you from any possible ramifications, which is also another unfortunate side of the law. While I know it's a little bit lacking in terms of being a full episode, I want to keep moving on and just say that I hope that gave you some clarity as far as libel and what little protections there are, even though there aren't all of that many. I'll put a few resources of um, articles and things I used when researching this episode into the description so you can read further that sort of thing, learn more, follow up, etc, etc. I don't want to scare anybody or put anybody off writing a persine. I just feel that you should know what you're getting into because it would be easy to say, okay, so the simple answer is always get permission, isn't it, Nix? And I'd love to say yes, but I think we all know that getting permission, getting consent from everyone you want to write about isn't always as cut and dry as we'd like it to be. A lot of the time we write perzines to help us process traumas, traumas that are all too often inflicted by other people. In some cases it's impossible to get consent because the person is deceased, and sometimes it's not possible to get consent because the person has said no, but there are also times that the act itself of asking for consent would be damaging to the person asking, would be traumatizing in and of itself to the person asking. And that's, especially when it comes to persines and memoir writing and stuff like that, that's where things get, they get complicated even more so than the, <laughs> the aforementioned legal side of things. During the first 20 years of my life, I was abused. I was abused by the people I was meant to trust and love, the people who were meant to take care of me, and as much as I hate it at times, that abuse in my past is something that influences me to this day. It makes me who I am in both good and bad ways, and thus I write about it. I write. I process, I explore, I deal with things through my writing, and some of that writing goes into my persines. And because of that, I risk being sued. And now I risk being sued for slander as well, wow! Risking being sued for slander while I'm doing a podcast about libel. Both at the same time, if that's not multitasking, I don't know what is. <laughs> Allons-y! <laughs> so there it is. I was abused. I am a survivor. I write about things that happened. Am I ever going to ask for consent from the people who abused me? No, I'm not. I have my reasons, but I will not. Not now. I have not in the past, nor will I ever. Am I risking legal action? Absolutely. That is a legal reality that I have to deal with. It is what it is. I wish 
so much that I could wrap things up for you. I wish I could put them in a nice bow and say, here is how you write about your trauma and stay protected. Here is how you write about your abuse and stay protected. But honestly, the only protection is not to publish your writing. As much as I want truth to be the defender, the, the, the justice that would help us all should we get sued, it's just, it's not the reality. But there are things you can do to help protect yourself, to make it less likely that you will be sued by someone if you are going to write about them and cannot obtain consent for whatever reason. And now we have Nix's Perzine writing tips. There's only five. <laughs> One, ask for consent whenever you're able and whenever you're safe to do so. Cover that base if you can. Two, don't use real names. Now I've found that people usually like seeing names uh, because they want to know what you would call them. And I, I have given people names from top shelf for a person who really had a good, um, a discerning taste for various liqueurs to Roman gods and goddesses to Wanderer. I actually don't know where Wanderer came from when I was thinking about writing about him. It just popped into my head. And so yeah, in general, people have liked their zine names. And again, it's it's an added protection. It's a really simple thing that makes it less obvious who you're talking about. And thus, there you go. A little bit, little bit of cotton wool around you, a little bit of protection from any legal ramifications. Back when I was a little bit younger, I submitted a story to Chicken Soup for the Soul. And I wrote about someone, <laughs> someone in my life who uh, was a bit frustrating but ended up teaching me a valuable lesson. Now, I submitted that and Chicken Soup for the Soul, and if you're not familiar, they're a rather large line of books, Chicken Soup for the Mother Soul, the Teen Soul, the Golfer's Soul, the Dog Lover's Soul, they, like, they have so many books out there. So I submitted my story, it got upset, it, and it got upset, no, the story's fine, the story's fine. <laughs> I submitted my story, it got accepted, and basically the only thing they wanted me to do was either change the name of the person I was writing about or get that person's consent. Couldn't be bothered sending that person a contract that they have to sign and send back to me, bloody, bloody, bloody. I changed the name and it was done. So this is a big company and just changing the name, the name of the person involved, that was enough for them to feel that they were covered legally. Now this is a big company that would have a, a massive legal team as well, but I feel like that is a good example of saying, okay, if, if that's how big company responds, then changing names is going to help me with what I'm doing. And on that same um, track, we have number three, which is don't be too descriptive, or if you're going to be descriptive, don't be literal about it. Like, you know, I, uh, Nix always twirls her hair and then make that Bob always twirls his blonde hair or something like that. You know, ch change the details. If I have a cat named Bob, then it became, comes a dog named Sparky, that sort of thing. If you change these little details, you can still speak your truth. You can still process things without making yourself vulnerable in as many ways, that sort of thing. It, if descriptions and names are different, then how is someone's reputation being um, damaged? Again, these are not 100% will protect you from all of the things, but they are good things to do for protection. Number four is, I feel, a very important one, and that's don't write in anger. Believe me, I know it is incredibly tempting to write things in anger. It is incredibly tempting to just spew vitriol onto the page and be done with it and that sort of thing. But when it comes to something that you are going to be putting out there that is going to be out in the world, that's going to be reproduced, etc., 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 do not write in anger. 
I did it once. In one of my persings, I wrote something in anger and I regret it. I don't regret it in that I thought I was wrong. I regret it in that because I was angry at the time, I wrote about this person. It was more about me tearing down the behavior of this person rather than processing the real issue, what had happened and how I felt about it. It was all about, look at this person. This person said, that, why is this, why person, why do you do this thing person? <laughs> and so, well, I know I would have written about it anyway. I wish I would have waited until I was calmer and thus more able to step back and process what I really needed to process about what happened rather than just rah, 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 rah. Don't write in anger. I know you want to. Well, you can write in anger, but just don't publish it. Don't publish that first draft. Write it out. Be angry. Tear up the paper. Burn the paper. Whatever you want to do with it. And then if you still need to process whatever it is, then start processing from a calmer standpoint. And now we are on to number five, which is the most important tip of them all. And that is, don't make assumptions. Your project being a zine does not protect you from being sued. You being poor does not protect you from being sued. Your zine not make a, making a profit does not protect you from being sued. The fact that you'd be happy to be written about does not protect you from being sued. The fact you didn't mean to hurt anyone does not protect you from being sued. The fact you didn't think anybody would mind does not protect you from being sued. Do not make assumptions. Do not make assumptions about how other th people think, about how the other people feel. Look at the law and find out. If it's like the consent issue and you're deciding to do it anyway, then do so with the full information. Do so knowing what could come your way. Is it going to come your way? Is it likely to come your way? Maybe not. Maybe zines do afford you some obscurity and thus some protection through that. But in the end, don't go in with ignorance. Don't go in thinking, la la la, I'm above law. Even if you're an anarchist, even if you think copyright is stupid or whatever, it's still the law. You might not agree with the law and there are plenty of laws that I don't agree with, let me tell you, but it is the law. I live here and thus until something changes, you do what you do. If you want to go ahead and rip off somebody's, copy somebody's work, copy someone's zine, if you want to, if you want to go ahead and do that, don't do it out of ignorance. Just do it knowing what could happen because I don't have any money doesn't hold up in court. It just plain doesn't as much as I'd like to think that, you know, oh, I'm, a, I'm broke, you know, I'm just breaking even and thus nobody's going to want to sue me. No, that's just plain not the case, unfortunately. <sighs> okay, zine friends, <laughs> that was a bit of a tough subject to say the least and I feel like I've only just touched the surface, especially on the legality side of things, but at the same time, I'm not fully qualified to talk about the legality side of things. Like I said, there's going to be some resources, a couple links in the description where you can get a start in looking into these things. And again, I don't want to put you off writing a persine. I really don't. Or I don't want to put you off writing about businesses and organizations either, but I also there's two sides to it. On one side, I want people to know. I know I want people to know what they're risking. I want people to know what they're getting to, into. I don't want people to be caught off guard and suddenly need a lawyer that they can't afford. Like I know I want people to know what they're risking. But at the same time, on the other side of the coin is I want there may not be such a thing as a single zine community, but there is community to be found in zine making. There are beautiful, wonderful connections to be made in, in with zine makers, and I feel like if we can't respect each other, how can we ever expect respect elsewhere? 
if you think that it's okay to just do willy-nilly because I'd be fine with it, that's not okay. Because in the end, you're not understanding the ramifications of what you're doing on other people. Saying I'm okay with something isn't good enough because in the end, if you do a thing, somebody else might see that and then think it's okay because we're just zine makers. We don't, you know, we don't give a crap, do we? we we're just making zines. But for many of us, zines aren't just zines. They're not little pieces of paper trash to be thrown away. They mean something. And if we can't show that respect in amongst ourselves, then nobody's ever going to respect it outside of zine makers. Nobody's going to think zines are anything other than what we ourselves treat them like. And so that's the other side. That's what I want people to understand. That's what I hope people will understand and come to, at least come to consider when they think they can just, oh, this person won't mind. Oh, it's not going to put hurt this person. Oh, I'm not making a profit. So this is okay. No, it's not. It's not. I've mentioned the reasons that sometimes you can't get consent, but when you willfully just, when you willfully ignore that just for the sake of, oh, I can't be bothered, or they might say no, then you're making something not great out of something that is amazing. There are possibilities and there are ramifications that you're not considering if you blatantly disregard consent, copyright, and everything in between. And if someone tells you about copyright, if someone brings a concern to you, don't, please don't think that they're attacking you. A lot of zine makers are kind people who are just trying to help and don't want to see yet another fellow zine maker sued. And yes, I say another because it's happened repeatedly. For those who know what I'm talking about, I won't get into it now. But let's just say it's not something we want to see happening with zine makers. It's not, it's not on. A quick shout out and a thank you to Wolf from <laughs> at Queer Content on Twitter. Links in the description. Thank you for bringing up the issue of consent. While it is a big, tough, and very serious topic, I am hoping that I made an informative, if not interesting, podcast for you on the subject. Whew. Let's move on, shall we? So now we come to the Q&A segment where I answer one question from you. Okay, so this week's question comes from Alex at Fanzines, the Zine World calendar person. Alex asks, who was the first zinester you remember meeting and what zine did they make? Now that, I'm actually going to talk about two people because in person, the first Zinester I zine maker I ever met was Laura uh, of Bloom Murder. Now I found Laura's zine Shakespeare's Lovers Macbeth in Sticky Institute. I was attracted by the shiny orange metallic <laughs> zine cover, and I reviewed her zine on Sea Green Zines. She got in touch and she actually invited me to Festival of the Photocopier 2016. So I have Laura to thank for <laughs> me going to the first ever zine fest that I went to. And I tabled as well, like first zine event ever and I tabled. So that was, uh, and Laura did really well with my levels of anxiety. <laughs> That's for sure. But Laura writes Laura writes poetry and some short stories and things like that as well. The zines I have of hers are Shakespeare's Lovers, in which she, whoops, bumping the mic, my apologies. Shakespeare's Lovers, Macbeth, Twelfth Night, uh, Hamlet, and Ophelia. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't read backwards on the, uh, on the screen there. So Hamlet and Ophelia. Now, I'm not sure if these are all the Shakespeare's Lovers ones that she did, but I think so. So that's, we, we met through her zine, me reviewing her zine. She invited me to Festival of the Photocopier, and yes, she and her friend Tegan are the first people I met. I'm pretty sure it's Tegan, and I'm going to be really embarrassed if it's not Tegan. I apologize in advance if it's not. Anyway, so Laura is the first person I met 
zine maker I met in person. Now the first zine maker I met online, and I'm not sure if she's the very first, but she's she was very impactful in my life. And that's Carly Bayer. Now I'm not sure, I don't think she's making zines anymore, but for a long time she made The Filth. The Filth was a zine that had all kinds of poetry and comics and short stories and stuff like that and she was it was the first scene I ever submitted to as well and the, the issues of the filth always came with a CD which I thought was really awesome and Carly always sewed the binding which I also thought was awesome and we traded zines and she was always really encouraging of my zine making in the early days that sort of thing she definitely had a big impact on me in that way and it was actually the f she encouraged me to write the intro for the filth issue six and that was the first intro i'd done as well so yeah lots of firsts that happened in the filth a sadly no longer running zine series but one that was very very cool and I was very very happy to be included in so yeah first person in first person in person was Laura at Blue Murder and the first person online was Carly Bayer and thanks to them both they are both important figures in my zine past who encouraged me in different ways and and all for the better that is for sure <laughs> If you have any questions about zines, zine reviewing, me, anything else really, anything else you think I can answer, please feel free to get in touch. There are various comment areas, there's Instagram messaging, there's Tumblr if you want to be uh, anonymous, that sort of thing. That's it. There's I'm, I'm around. <laughs> I'm around in lots of different places. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, try to keep it appropriate. <laughs> That sort of thing and because well not because I skipped it last week because last week's episode is really long and I think this one's not going to end up really long too but I'm going to do it anyway I'm going to do this segment anyway even though this is a long episode it is time for sharing is caring my little non-sponsored segment where I share zine spaces places and all sorts of things that I am really loving and this week, I am really loving the freezing. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> now, you can't see this, obviously, in the podcast, but in the video, I'm holding up The Life and Times of Billy Roberts, $50 Minimum by Sober Bob, and Sensitive Adult Daily by Sensitive Adult Daily, Darcy Rock in Melbourne. Now, I have a little blue sheet here in the Sensitive Adult Daily because I have about six of them and they're all clipped together and I'm actually going to review them and the blue sheet is my notes for that. <laughs> anyway, the free zine, the, the brochure, the, the put together page sent around the world sometimes or just to your friends, it's... I feel like it's a subgenre of perzines. It's it's the Christmas letter that you get, and but it doesn't involve all the boring things, or you know, Uncle Bob's toenail issue or something. <laughs> I just grabbed that out of there. Anyway, I love them. I love them so much, and it's not just because they're free, even though free makes things easier in a lot of ways for a lot of people. But yes, the short free mailing list persine. I absolutely love it. Their slice of life, their little glimpses, their little contemplations, their this is what's happening in the moment. They are blog posts that come to your mailbox and it's beautiful and I love it and there's there's no expectation, there's no anything. It's just I made a thing. I want to express these thoughts and send them out and make of them what you will and I absolutely love it. And there, there are all sorts of them. There's, well, like the ones I have here, the $50 minimum by Sober Bob, The Life and Times of Billy Roberts, which is no longer going, but he's just started a new one. And then Sensitive Adult Daily. I, whew, 
I adore these. Ooh, but I will save my commentary for the review. And there's you zine, which is not per zine so much as anonymous letters and things. Anyway, <laughs> I apologize for the gap. My phone's just let me know that I'm whinging on a bit. Anyway, so yes, sharing is caring. Yay for the free mailing list per zine slash zine slash slice of life slash should have its own subgenre zine. Thank you to all the people who make them and thank you especially to the people who make them and put me on their mailing list. <laughs> It's beautiful, it's wonderful, and I highly encourage people to make them if you're interested in checking one out. I do have my own called Missives from Murray Bridge. Get in touch and I'll see if I can get you some copies of those so you can find out what I'm prattling on about. Now, as my phone just let me know, I am getting on in the whole recording. So, that is it for today, Zine friends. Thank you again so much to everyone for joining me and for all the comments. I promise next episode we'll try something lighter on for <laughs> a change. Remember that everything I say is my opinion and there are no gatekeepers in the zine first, nor should there ever be. Now, links to the things I've talked about and either in the spotlight or the main content, there, all the links are in the description. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. And I do need to do a shout out for the music for this podcast, which is Spanish Summer by Audionautics. That is licensed under a Creative Commons Attributions license. Okay, let's wrap this up. This is the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Until next time, go make some zines. Mwah! I am definitely going to do a lighter topic next one, next, next episode. I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be a light one. <laughs> so much serious happening. <laughs> You're listening to the Zine Collector Podcast, Episode 5, Zine Pricing, Rizzographs, and Zine Culture, an interview with Sober Bob Monthly. Hello zine friends! Welcome to the Zine Collector. I'm your host Jamie Nix and if you hadn't already noticed given the length of this uh, podcast, we're doing things a little bit differently this round. I have interviewed someone and I think you'll be interested to hear her thoughts on things. I am very very happy to welcome artist, zine maker, and all around talented soul Sober Bob Monthly to the show today. If you saw last week's Happy Mail Monday video, you know I rambled on a bit about Sober Bob and how I admire her for her bravery in speaking her mind and talking about issues that other people are afraid to talk about. So today, Sober Bob is here to chat about zine pricing, risographing, zine culture, influences, zine fairs, we covered a lot of things for originally only having 10 questions. <laughs> so without further ado, well, hello, Sober Bob. Welcome to the Zine Collector. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us how you got into zine making? I haven't had the pleasure of the Sober Bob origin story. Well, about two years ago, maybe one and a half to two, I was fired from a job unfairly and I tried to find help and I decided, oh, wow, this Vizink place is quite nice. I might go there and, you know, use their free resources. And that's how I got started. Oh, that's brilliant. I really love that. And, um, yeah, I think maybe we should do a little uh, copy and destroy uh, special in the future. So uh, I'd like to just jump right in because uh, you are the strong voice 
that I aspire to be. <laughs> and I'm really eager to hear your thoughts on the topics today, starting with the murky waters of zine pricing. Or are the are these waters murky to you? Is it is it a clear issue for you, zine pricing? Um, in a way, I feel like I I have a few more perspectives than other people, so I can see it a bit clearer, but I have the context where I come from, uh, I utilize a space that has free printing and I can still justify those being sold for money, mm -hmm. but I also understand that there's, you know, you shouldn't be doing this as a profit-making venture, you're not out there to try and get market share. For me, zine pricing went from a complex issue that I was very scared of and didn't want to talk about to a complex issue that I felt I should you know, get my confidence up and talk about it is when I started getting a bit annoyed at what I was seeing online. I'm not going to name and shame. I'm basically just going to publicly say that I do not support this practice whatsoever. And just say that I saw a listing for a black and white A6 size, quarter size for international, uh, zine for $5. And not exactly the most outrageous thing, maybe a little bit higher end for my preferences, but in the same listing, you could upgrade to an A5 and that would cost you $10. So double the price for the exact same thing. And I mean exact same, there were no bonuses in the bigger size. And yeah, so it was A6 for $5, A5 for $10. And for US listeners, it was like a quarter size for $5 and the exact same thing for $10 if you bought it in half fold size. And I saw, I saw that and I was like, nope, that's my line. I can't just sit back and admire the hustle. I can't just sit back and go, ooh, maybe I could get that kind of profit because it just seemed wrong to me. Yeah, that, that's pretty intense, especially when you consider that, you know, a small zine like that, I don't know how much effort went into it. I don't know if this person maybe was just like, you know, they think themselves a professional artist and yeah, their work might be, you know, worth a bit more, but if the presentation isn't worth it, <laughs> what, what, what are they trying to sell? Are they trying to sell their ideas? If they're not, then, well, if they are, why are they presenting them in such a poor format? I've seen zines with like so much more effort for cheaper. Oh yeah, the, I have seen absolutely gorgeous scenes that were again so much cheaper like you said and this was I, I this definitely was um had art elements to it but mm. I just thought but the thing was it wasn't special paper it wasn't a special cover it wasn't contributors that need to be paid it was just a zine and it was double the price if you wanted a bigger one and it just it, it blew my mind but i am getting a little bit off track uh <laughs> was there a moment that was my moment so was there a moment for you when zine pricing became something that needed to be discussed has it always been an issue or a growing one in your opinion yeah my main thing that when it came up was probably I, I, people who know me know I kind of shit on Rizzo graphing quite a bit, but I, because of the format, it, you know, it's very bad for putting in a library. Mm -hmm. But my main thing was noticing that people were getting these Rizzo graphed zines, and Rizzo graphing itself is technically cheaper than inkjet on some occasions if you do it right. But these people, they were using the idea of something being Rizzo graphed as the selling point, mm -hmm. like you pay extra because this thing is risographed. They had like a version that was regular print and one that was risographed and it was more expensive and they were trying to up the price based on like, you know, using this obscure printing technique. So, and I saw that and I'm just like, that, that's ridiculous. Why would I pay more? Why are you charging people? You know, there, there's no artistic integrity in that. And really it did start bothering me at that point. Yeah, definitely. Um... We will touch on the risographing a little bit later, but that when I was doing research for this and I was looking at zines on Reddit and people, and there was this comment saying, oh yes, I do expect to pay more for risographing, but when you look up the definition of risographing, it's meant to be the cheapest sort of cheap and fast option. 
Yeah, and it, it's so. I, it, I actually think that it, there's a lot of artistic thought that goes in it because you do have to think about colors overlapping, and there is a limited color scheme. But what, if people aren't using it for that purpose, then what? Why? Why would I bother paying any extra? That's dumb. <laughs> exactly, and it, it and obviously you know uh, an inkjet versus a risograph. There are differences, obviously, but. For me, it's it's sort of the same issue. It's the A6 versus the A5. If you're getting the exact same thing, mostly. Obviously, yeah. there's the difference in that one. But why would you pay so much more? Because usually it's a, exactly. it's a significant gap, usually, isn't it? Yeah, it's... Oh, my goodness. Sometimes it can be... Well, I... I'm trying to think of a specific example because I have seen it. Like you can see the difference between like the risograph and the, you know, I think it was about a ten dollar difference. Oh, wow. Okay. It was it was steep, and I was just not impressed by that at all. No, you wouldn't be. It made me not want to buy. Like I, it kind of felt like I could imagine their thought process was like, oh, I have a cheaper version for people who can't afford it. But in my mind, I'm just like, why bother? not having the cheap like why bother going and having the expensive version at all if it's exactly the same and doesn't add anything to it exactly like you know at least stick a piece of vellum in there and make it feel a bit special right <laughs> <laughs> yeah like like i'd maybe had like a little pull out poster there there's actually some really good um zines i've bought that have been collaborative with really cool you know pull out posters and you know smart thinking about how it's done and yeah, and then I see these really low effort kind of things with the expectation that they would get the same success. Yeah, there's this, it's in a world that, in the zine verse, <laughs> in a world that lacks <laughs> such strong definitions, it's strange that risographing has, you know, if it's risographed, it's more expensive. It has to be that sort of thing. Hmm. And I, I've noticed that a lot of people have increased risograph scenes. I, you know, I don't really care that much, although I do not like having to put them in the library. I have to put a plastic sleeve around them to stop them from rubbing off on other um, scenes. Mm. But my my main thing is that I really like seeing risograph art books, ones that have a lot of effort and smart things put in, so they can charge the. I, if it's an art book, if you call it an art book, I'm willing to pay that 30 to $50 if it's like really intense with a lot of, you know, thought put into it. Don't call it a zine. That's exactly it. That is... <laughs> uh, I'm getting ahead in my own conversation because I know <laughs> that's part of a, a future question. Yeah, yeah, that's like... <laughs> Don't want to jump too far ahead. Oh, yeah, there's just so much to talk about. I'm so excited to be talking to you about this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will reel it back a little bit and uh, back to regular zine, good old black and white copy sort of zine. Yep. <laughs> My observations lie more in online shops sort of things. I don't attend a lot of in-person events to various for various reasons, but you have more experience in the in-person events with... Uh, the Hanging Affair last December, which I hear was very successful. And with the annual Zine and Indie Comics Symposium, of which you have been recently made coordinator. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so exciting. <laughs> I know a coordinator, like I feel a bit special, you know? <laughs> very special. <laughs> So online, I have noticed what I feel is a slow creep of more expensive zines that I feel aren't necessarily something that should be more expensive compared to other things. Have you found that in in-person scenes? Yeah, absolutely. And I find it from people who previously made very accessible zines have suddenly thought to themselves this is a market i can exploit almost oh no so yeah and it feels really really disingenuous so and i'm seeing a lot of really high effort zines like wolfpack mm. 
they're really high effort. They're $10, but they pay their contributors in. Yeah. But my thing is that they are getting pushed aside with their high quality content at a pretty reasonable price in lieu of people who might be more popular or the like trying to push these very expensive things. And it's really been quite bothersome. So do you think that um, people have been saying, I have this big of a name so I can charge more? Yeah, in a way. And I think there's also the aspect they think they, they've seen a lot of these. Um, there's an idea that if it's handmade, it's worth more. And I do definitely think that about certain things, you know, like handmade jewelry. I'll pay more for, a, you know, a pretty ring that I get to design and someone makes for me. That's fine. But that doesn't translate well to a zine thing, considering that it's handmade, yes, but you're hand making it out of necessity, not out of you know, not having an alternative. Yeah, there's the, there's the obvious handmade thing, but when you're talking about your, I say stock standard, I don't, I mean no insult to zines, but you, your traditional zine, like you're hand making yeah. it, but unless you're handing out master copies, like one off master copy, you know, make sure mm. the double tape is sturdy because this is your zine now kind of thing. Yeah. Um, like, I don't know, it's the mass production side of things. And again, I'm getting ahead of myself, but it's handmade, but not as handmade as a piece of jewelry, I think. Yeah. And it's not to say that there's no effort put into it. It's just that you're, okay, an example, my uh, Too Pretentious for Melbourne zine, mm. the first one, it was literally just one A3 piece of paper folded up. Mm. And yeah, I do. I did have to, you know, hand fold each and every single one of them. But I only charge a dollar for it because I, I've probably made, you know, two hundred of them. Yeah, that's just it's just how it is. You know, you, you're putting it in. I didn't. I could have made it in such a way that I could have been like, you know, oh, I'll publish it this way and be easier. I was doing it because I was trying to get the message out there. I didn't care about the money or the time or whatever. Exactly. And it's not that I, or I think you are saying that it's the time isn't a value. It's, there's just so much in the culture of making things affordable and thus accessible. Yeah. I guess it's, it's, it's accessibility <laughs> is what we, we aim for and in most seen things. Yeah, exactly. So. I have like a barrage of questions coming up, but they're, they're all related, <laughs> so <laughs> bear with me. All right, I won't go off too many tangents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're welcome to tangents. I'm just warning you that there's like five, four or five questions before, <laughs> before t uh, tangent mode. <laughs> okay. When it comes to zine pricing, what things influence how you feel about a, zine pri a zine's price? Like we've talked a little bit, touched a bit on Wolfpack. How much are you willing to accept? Like, do you feel better about or different about an expensive zine if you know they pay their contributors or does paying contributors turn something from a zine into something else? Does it go from a zine to an art book if it pays contributors and is printed with a professional printer, that sort of thing? I... I'll ignore the last bit because I do have a separate issue mm -hmm. uh, on that. But I think um, when it comes to zine pricing and what things influence, I go for a mix of the content, like high quality content, mm -hmm. the print method, and you know whether it's you know color and the like, and yeah, whether they do pay their contributors or not. I think that paying contributors is a 10 out of 10 way to make a zine that maybe maybe you only have a couple of ideas and you want like if you're say a disabled person and you want to get multiple people's experiences and you're willing to pay people for that time that more power to you i will pay for that zine i will pay you know 15 bucks for that zine mm. <clears throat> or um i think the most expensive i've ever spent on a zine was 20 dollars, but it was two individually like it was two printed things with a poster and an extra zine and part of it and I got to meet the creator and he paid his contributors. Oh, that's cool. So it was a zine pack and yeah. an experience. 
Yeah, and that one was risograph, so it's definitely, it was one of the better uses I've ever seen of risographing. Hmm. But you could tell that that wasn't the selling point. The selling point was not that it was risographed. They used it uh, to accentuate the design that they'd already kind of, you know, considered having. Hmm. Used it, used yeah. it um, to a function rather than a... Uh, I'm missing the word, but basically, rather than the risograph being the sale, the thing is the sale, but the risograph is the function. If I'm, if yeah, I'm making any exactly. sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get, I get you. Like, I, I don't care whether, you know, a painting is made with oil or acrylic or whatever. I just like that it looks nice. That is a great way to put <laughs> yeah, it. it, does, it, it if, 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 that, if the medium is correct for it, then yeah, go for it. But I'm not going to be that, you know... I don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> so taking that uh, metaphor, you, you're not going to buy it because it's oils. You're going to buy it because it's nice. You like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can always appreciate that, say, you know, it might be slightly harder or whatever, but it's a smaller factor to me than what it might be, to, than what people assume it should be. Like like we were saying before, people are selling zines on the idea that they're risographed. I'm like, you could have gotten the same almost exactly the same um, outcome and look and style with any other printing method. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, that's definitely true. I was just thinking the most expensive zine that I've ever bought was a risograph zine. I mean, mm. admittedly, I mean, it was 12 bucks. So, I mean, it, it wasn't the most expensive risograph zine, zine I've seen, but it was definitely, I mean, it was on really nice paper and everything, but still... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that that's another good thing that I hadn't, we haven't really touched on with, I guess, some of the risographing is that it sometimes is just on plain paper. I don't know why. You've put all this effort into getting a print, really nice, you know, print method done, and you've just put it on, you know, Remax paper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice printer paper. The, the lowest GSM you can pick up at, you know, your local, <laughs> your local paper shop. Yeah, just went down to office works, eh? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we probably shouldn't get into accents because I'm absolutely awful. Oh, no. I will, I will end up sounding so palm and you'll be so annoyed. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, I think when, um, when we discuss what is a zine and what is an art book, I'm willing to let a creator choose that. At, at some level, especially if they're, you know, doing it in good faith hmm. to, uh, to understand the difference between a zine and an art book. It's like, I, I've seen art books that look like zines and they say, this is an art book. And I'm just like, oh, okay, that's an interesting way, but thanks for letting me know. And then I've seen people trying to sell zines that are professionally bound and from a big copy house. Yeah, that's always... So... I think as far as binding goes, like... Oh gosh, it's a, it's another tricky thing because I was thinking, you know, staples do it. Staples, okay, call it a zine. Staple it, you're pretty mm. safe calling it a zine. But at the same time, like I know a zine maker who who has started doing like the the gluing, the perfect binding, and I'd still call it a zine. It's very cute. <laughs> so sober Bob, <laughs> <laughs> I think the topic of zine pricing can be especially confusing for new zine makers. When you search online, you can see an absolutely gorgeous 24 page A5 art zine for five bucks. And next to that is a one page folded black and white mini zine for the same price. And this is again, not on special paper or anything like that. Do you think this kind of price variation is harmful to zines overall? Absolutely. You've got a lot of people who are coming into the scene not knowing what to expect. They've been, t they might have Googled what a zine is, and that's most people's entry point, and that's great. And then they try and experience that culture and, you know, you know, respectfully, you know, trying to, you know, buy things and being really positive about it. And then they're faced with this dilemma of why am I being expected to pay so much for something that isn't well, that they might not perceive as being worth it compared to other things that they've seen. And then someone who wants to make zines, they're just like, oh, it might not be worth my time if I don't price it this way. You know, everyone else is pricing it that way and they seem like they're you know, doing pretty well. I better you know, jump on that train. I need a bit of extra beer money or especially in the case of Festival of the Photocopier, some of those people are coming from interstate. They 
feel really terrible if they don't make any, you know, sales. So they've got to try and, you know, put the price up and then it just gets really murky because a lot of the local people who didn't have to spend any money except for, say, a train ticket to get there, you know, from the outer suburbs, they can charge the, you know, lower rates and then it just... Ugh. So many tangled webs. Exactly. Like, I, when I went to Festival of the Photocopier, I only went from Bendigo, so it was a train ticket. And even then, I just felt this pressure, like I'm supposed to make something back, which definitely harkens to a bigger subject about consumerism and it's much bigger than we'll cover today. But yeah, it's definitely... Uh, it's, it's really hard, and there's no one exactly standing around... I mean, there are workshops and everything, but there's no one standing around saying, listen, your A7 one page full of zine should be two to four dollars, depending on your printing, you know, that <laughs> sort of thing. There's, there's the lack of gatekeepers is an awesome thing. But at the same time, that leaves a lot of people floundering in what to do. I guess we, we, sh we should think of it less like we need gatekeepers and more like we need guides hmm. like pe people who are willing to you know there's no assumptions there's no gatekeeping i don't care i've bought zines for like three dollars that were just scribbles mm -hmm. because they looked amazing and i love them there should be no gatekeeping on content but there should be people guiding or you know n no call out culture i really hate call out, call -out culture mm -hmm. but people saying openly hey maybe you're not going to be able to sell many at this price you should maybe reconsider. Your work still has value. It's just that it's not able to be, you know, distributed as well at what you're doing right now. And that's... I think that would be a better way of doing it. That's exactly it. It's so tricky and it's so... It can be so sensitive because you don't want anyone to feel like their time isn't worth it or, or isn't Absolutely. worthy or anything like that. One of my favorite scenes, and uh, it's a little bit embarrassing, it was called Fart. And this, <laughs> and this person had taken like high fashion magazine clippings and just stuck them in there, <laughs> put little fart clouds behind these high. Oh, that's amazing. I love that. I have no idea who made it. And it makes me so sad that I can't say this is amazing and I love it. And I, and I have, I've lost my train of thought, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I feel like that what you said is a great way to way to put it. There shouldn't be gatekeepers, there should be guides, and it shouldn't be this faux pas thing to say, listen, traditionally in zine making, that probably wouldn't be $7, that might be $4. Yeah, or um, another additional thing, don't be afraid to swap zines. <sighs> I know a lot of people who are just like, oh, I've paid all this money for printing. I don't want to just swap it for another one. And I'm like, that's, that kind of takes a lot out of it. You know, I had trouble even just swapping them at my last vessel of the photocopier. Cause I'm like, Hey, I've got, you know, some colored zines, you know, with full color and everything. Do you want to like have swapsies? And very few people were like, oh yeah, let's, you know, get that through. Cool. Uh, shout out to concrete queers. Mm who have really nice, really well done zines and they pay their contributors and yeah, they just gave me a couple for in exchange for my little, you know, folded in half one. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, they were really lovely. Trading is such a huge part of the culture and it makes me so sad to think that it's, I don't know if I want to say under threat, but it, it like, it fe it's such a, a thing for me that it feels like it's under threat. I, I, I can understand some of the higher end type of I'm thinking of someone when I'm talking about this and I'm thinking of Bodhi who does slow quest and I'm sorry Bodhi for I'm not calling you out Bodhi I love your zines you know I love your zines <laughs> but basically I'm thinking of him because he he does this beautiful cream paper this absolutely intricate artwork lovely covers and he he does rounding of the corners and he, he hand does the perfect oh, binding that's wonderful oh it's so gorgeous see if, if i wanted to trade for that i would definitely try and make sure like there would be an equal swap i'd be like you can have one of all my things and you can have this and you can have that but please i just don't have any money kind of thing exactly. like i would make sure but it's perfectly like that's the kind of high quality i think of when you're allowed to you know 
start charging a bit more. Exactly. So uh, there's definitely people feel people should never feel pressured that they have to trade a specific thing. Like mm. they, it should be a like worth going back and forth. But like I hate to think that trading is in any way dying, especially in in person things. Like trading online, there's the postage costs and stuff like that. So I understand that there's a little bit of hesitation there but when you're in person like as long as there is an agreement of like value then please trade it's awesome <laughs> it's a whole part of the thing and, and i spend a lot of um oh hang on one mm -hmm. what's up there <laughs> i'm still in the thing <laughs> love you <laughs> yeah you can leave that in the podcast awesome <laughs> my, my undying love for my my, my husband Aww, <laughs> all the feels um yeah <laughs> i i love trading because especially when i went to festival of the photocopier any money i did make i just bought more zines you know i might as well like skip the middleman screw cash just start swapping that stuff cash is for outsiders exactly exactly <laughs> like and I was actually a little bit surprised when I was there in 2016 because I actually put a sign on my table that said, I will trade for things. I will trade for you. Yeah, I do. <laughs> they, they actually recommend, a lot of blogs recommend that you have an open trading sign. And yeah, I did too. And not, not a whole lot. I think one, a few people who came along was um, one person who does, uh, oh, I forget their name. But they're a, uh, they do a zine about making um, uh, queer, non-binary experiences in games. Oh, wow. And I thought that was really lovely and I was great to read that. That's a really you know, interesting message that I hadn't considered and I was really happy that they were willing to trade. They clearly had a message they just wanted to get out there. I'm like, yeah, hells yeah. Get behind that. That's so awesome. <laughs> like, I, yeah. Uh, I... I'm the, you know, lifetime fence sitter, so I always feel trapped in this, you know, my cowardly mm. space, I'll just say it, <laughs> I'm to say anything, but I, I don't want to say that how I f feel about zines, everybody should feel about zines, but I feel like if we lose that desire to connect, if we lose that urge to trade and be heard and hear others in return like that's a huge part of what zines are that would be lost absolutely <sighs> and it, it, it's it's kind of bothersome as well because you can't always tell when someone's okay to trade like i know uh obscene he does these amazing like really quite high quality he'll go to a proper print shop really cool zines about horror movies and uh, you know horror stuff and he will trade and you might not expect that from, say, other you know high quality people. So a lot of people who come in, they get really confused. They're like, "Oh, this guy, this guy gave me a really high quality zine in exchange for my you know perceived mediocre one. Why are other people not you know as keen on doing that? It's just out of the goodness of its heart, really." Oh yeah, that's definitely. It's funny how there's it's two sides to all of it. That while there's the people who don't want to trade, but there there are people who are willing to trade, but then you go up to them and you look at your zine and you look at their zine and you go, they wouldn't want to trade. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, and I, that, that's sad and that shouldn't be a thing, but I know I got into that mindset as well. Like, oh, you wouldn't want to trade for my little cupcake or anything like that. I, I totally feel you when it comes to that because if the people who are making it aren't feeling that comfortable, then what's the point? Mm. And that's one thing that I've been really encouraging people to do at Zix up here is that we make that extra time to go around and swap. Like people will just come around and swap mm. and do things and be really lovely. Is he even, you know, the bigger ones like Philip Dearest, he'll go around and he'll swap and he'll, Oh my God, that man is like so generous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I love yeah. that we still have people in communities who are demonstrating that, showing that, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's... I do wonder if Festival of the Photocopier just has that kind of Melbourne artsy dickhead kind of vibe, no matter what. Like, even if they did everything to try and make it better, they would still have that kind of feeling. And that's just unfortunate. Mm, yeah. I. I feel like the, that touches on things that are a little bit beyond my knowledge, but at the same time, yeah, when you have this 
feeling that you need to make a profit and that it's it's about the money rather than uh, the culture or the tradition or the history or anything like that it's it spreads that sort of thing yeah but i do have to say um when i was at festival the photocopier and at the um oh what was it the melbourne book Ex expo something like that they had a little zine they they Okay, don't they? They do art book stuff. They had a as well. Yeah, they had a section for all the you know the book books and the art books and and they and they stuck us in the National Gallery. They stuck us in a little space and it, we we made the most of it. But at both of those events, my favorite part, well, my favorite part was arguing with some guy about why fuck was the most superior swear word. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Oh anyway. my god. <laughs> I, I had I, I, some guy coming along saying I shouldn't use the word cunt, and I'm just like, I, I own one. I get to say that word all the, all the time I want. <laughs> like, I have direct access to one, so. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't, so. Even though you're acting like one. <laughs> you may act like one, but I have one, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's the winner here? <laughs> Definitely you. <laughs> Oh, anyway, about those events, my, I, I loved a lot of things about them, but the favorite thing was that at one point things, and both of them, things got slow, and I kind of just looked up the line, and I looked down the line, and we all just started trading, and like, here, pass this down to this person, I'd like their zine, and you pass, you trade with me for this, and we just kind of did this line of trading up and down the tables, and it was gorgeous. Oh my goodness, that reminds me of like, you know, when you're at school and you're like passing notes and stuff. <laughs> yes. That's so cute. That's wonderful. It was so, it was so that. It was, you know, here's this, here's this, here's this. And like, if there were even in the Melbourne Gallery one, there was one person who was kind of not quite down the line, but saw that we were all trading and she came around. I'm just, at that point, I'm just like, leave some zines, take some zines you know <laughs> sales were done for the day i did like but i would have done that at any time because i'm you know me but yeah i think that was those are such positive beautiful memories for me and i never want that sort of ability and comfort level with strangers to go away in zines yeah no that it feels really positive and it's really unfortunate that that feels like and I, we aren't the only people who have those feelings. In my most recent zine, which I'm totally going to plug, Go and it. you had a, had a squiz at last in your last episode, was um, you know, too, too pretentious for Melbourne too. I found so much evidence of people who were like really trying to enjoy themselves and just couldn't. You know, they didn't have that sense, that feeling. Yeah, that's, that's so, so sad to me. Like... For me, it's just, it's the history. It's it's what zines are and have represented. And uh, the, the zine should be a big hug. <laughs> if you're into hugs. <laughs> e e even if they're about, like, you know, not the greatest stuff, like, you know, sad stories or, like, trying to expose things. Or, you know, there's a whole zine series that called Don Burke is a cunt, you know, and, <laughs> yeah, and he is. But... And that still felt like that was a really aggressive, you know, thing to be talking about. But it still felt like, oh, this is this is this person's story. I need to listen, and you know, you want to give that person a hug. You're like, I support you through reading this. Exactly. Like, yeah. I think, and a lot of sometimes this isn't true, but for me, a lot of times it's the value of connecting through a trade has been greater than my desire to get an equal trade like mm. my very first in-person trade it was he looked at my sign and he looked at me and he said i don't have those genres of zines but i've got two zines will you trade for me and i went all doughy-eyed anime shiny eyes like <laughs> you want to trade with me <laughs> and we totally traded like i'm yeah like the, sometimes about trades it's like you're more desire like your work will be more desirable than just cash because cash you could buy anything with but this person likes your stuff so much that they're willing to give you something that they spent time and effort on exactly it's so much nicer oh gosh we could have, we could have had a whole podcast on zine trading i think <laughs> <laughs> yeah but let's move on and yeah. talk about zine trading <laughs> pulling it back pulling it back 
<laughs> Back uh, to scene pricing and all of that good stuff. I don't think that for the love and sustainability or even making a little profit have to be mutually exclusive things. Setting a zine price point can be a delicate balance between wanting to be read and connect with other people and wanting some extra coffee money or ink money or whatever <laughs> you want to do. <laughs> how do you as an artist and zine maker strike that balance? How do and how do things like zine culture, tradition, accessibility, etc. influence your decisions? I think I because I do have that access to a lot of free zine printing, I, I treat it not as a free thing, but as something I have to work for by contributing to the space. So that's why I might charge money for some of my things. And then I also think to myself, that's a sustainable thing. Like I'm giving back to a community in that way while also getting a little something out of it for myself, which often ends up just being, you know, either more zines or more materials. But um, I think my balance usually comes in the form of, you know, trying to pay for public transport <laughs> so I can continue to contribute and my big thing is also accessibility like on the down low I'll just give zines to people for you know free and not even expect a trade back if I see that you know if I know them personally and I know they're down in the dumps mm -hmm. or you know if you know they're not having the best day or whatever <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. I mean sometimes you, zines are <clears throat> excuse me more than the the sale like i i have my little what's this then zine one page thing that i hand out to people when they say what's a zine i say take this and read <laughs> and be happy discover the joy well, when, when when you print zines you print them all at home off your uh, own printer don't you do. so you have higher cost but you still manage to keep your prices very very reasonable <laughs> I try to. My balance is very much weighted on the wanting to be read and wanting to connect side of things. Mm. That's... And I think... Oh, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> I, was about, I was about to say, like, an, another thing for zine makers and stuff, like, there's always going to be cheap abilities to have printing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like, they, like, in Melbourne, go to the Sticky Institute, cheapest printing you can get. You know, if you're in Brisbane, come up here, you know, we, we will help you print zines for free or extremely cheap. Exactly. There are definitely options there. You know, reach out. That's, a, that's basically yeah. all I can say. Reach out and there will be people to help you. <laughs> we are the guides of the zineverse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, come into our fold. We welcome you. <laughs> I'm on the committee. You know, my uniform is in the mail or <laughs> my gold star and my tiara. We we, we've got matching jackets. <laughs> <laughs> matching jackets, you know, it's, it's like scouts. You get your badges for, you know, your first zine trade and <laughs> things like that. Yes. <laughs> zine scouts. Oh, I just went Sailor Moon in my head. Yay. No, that's perfect. Zine scouts. <laughs> <laughs> you did not see the gesture I just made to the video. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch it later. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Woo. The thing I think that gets to me most about zine pricing, and again, what I'm talking about is your standard mass producible zine. Uh, it's basically, it's mass producible. That's, that's the key word for me. So if you can produce it easily, 10 cents or less a copy, that sort of thing, and you spend an hour and make 30 copies of your mini zine and I timed myself folding a mini zine just so I can get some figures because I'm that uh, worried about being judgmental <laughs> like I suddenly got out my phone and stopwatch all right fold a zine wanderer was very confused <laughs> so if you can spend an hour and make 30 copies of your mini zine then is it really necessary to make four to five dollars on every single zine like, what are your what are your thoughts about the the mass production influence? I, I don't think you should be you know over time trying to you know reduce the costs of your zines as you sell more because you can definitely like use like the shark self help one has been my most popular one, but I've kept it as as a dollar for the zine, and I I could have dropped the price, 
you know. But I think to myself, if I keep it at that dollar, which is clearly a really accessible price for a lot of people to get into it, mm. um, I can use that as a semi source of income for, you know, people, for not people, for art supplies to make my next ones. But I do try and keep, you know, I already thought about that mass production when I made that original um, judgment on how much the zine should have cost. Mm. Mm. So I guess <laughs> I actually hadn't really thought about it that much when I think about it like that. But, uh, but I, you, you, uh, can, sorry, you can mass sorry. produce them and I think mass producing, it doesn't take away from the content it has. It doesn't take away from the handmaidenness of it, but people do need to be aware that it is something that, you know, if you're mass producing it, you shouldn't be charging ridiculous amounts of money for it. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly it. Uh, I'm because I'm me. I'm always going by the descriptions online, and okay, you have special paper or you have special printing or anything like that. But so when I know that I could go to Officeworks and print that for 10 cents and you're selling it for $5, I feel a little cheated. And I, f I don't like that that f feeling is anywhere in the zineverse, but it also makes me worried because I know that, you know, I'm at a certain financial position, but I know that there are a lot of people who are worse off. And if I can't afford a zine or if I'm feeling that's not I can't justify that, then there are going to be a lot of people who definitely just go, no, nope, can't do that. And it, and it's so sad to me that anyone would feel that they can't join zines reading and or making them because of price. This is why libraries are so important. And the Sticky Institute mm. will let you, you know, sit in there and read stuff if you don't have the ability to buy it. Oh yeah, oh, I love yeah, sticky. I love sticky. <laughs> like I will sing their graces for you know ages, even though I've shat on them in a lot of zines. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, and this is another could be a tangent, but we must rein in. <laughs> but I think a lot of things that are associated with sticky, there's a lot more responsibility to be that isn't sticky necessarily. But yeah, I I will sing their praises to anyone really as well <laughs> like before i moved from bendigo to south australia i had to make my last pilgrimage to melbourne and <laughs> and go to sticky and get the zines i just had to do it before we left <laughs> i bought so many zines i've never spent that much money on in a single zine but i saved up for weeks because i knew this was gonna happen ah <laughs> oh. I'm, I'm thinking of zine pricing a bit mm -hmm. more i, I i'm basically a huge leftist but i do think that this market will sort itself out if everyone keeps pricing their things higher and higher less and less people will buy them they will realize this and i get i i see a lot of people who get really upset they're like why isn't you know people buying my stuff rah, rah, rah. they have like a bit of a bitch about it i'm like it's not their fault that they're not buying something that they either can't or don't think is worth it you are dealing with a market and, you know, just because, you know, you might have, you know, a really interesting story to tell doesn't mean that people are going to buy it for, you know, five dollars on a single piece of paper. That's exactly it. I mean, I, I still have to laugh at anybody coming in thinking that they can just charge whatever they want to charge and that sort of thing hugely expensively because the very market that you're pitching to is traditionally a market who has financial hardship amongst other hardships and disabilities and things like that. I, th I think it's a little bit silly not to do your market research. <laughs> like, like zines are mostly dedicated to marginalized voices. That's why they exist. If they weren't marginalized, they wouldn't be in a zine. They'd be in a newspaper or, you know, some other larger thing. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Now, um, one thing I did want to backtrack a little bit on is rizzographing um, on, on subjects of mass production, but also because, you know, we've mentioned it. For those who aren't familiar, can we have a little rundown exactly what it is? Yeah. So rizzographing is based on the traditional idea of a newspaper print where you kind of you expose rolls of, well, drums, I guess to a screen printing type process, but it's way simpler. Mm -hmm. And then 
you have several of those rolls or plates or whatever they're, they're called and you print it single color by single color so you put down your yellows first and then your greens and then maybe you know red and um blacks hmm. and layer it to try and generate those really interesting colors and it's quite often used as soy ink as well so it is and if you use recycled paper it can be a more environmentally friendly option and i know that's why some people like that you also can do it in you know newspaper style you can get that original like old school comic kind of oh. feel out of it oh that's so, oh, that's cool. so cool <laughs> yeah I, I really do appreciate the technology it's really fun to watch and some of the great Rizzo graphing that's coming out of Hong Kong and those art books uh, Elevator Teeth does an amazing zine and art book series based on Rizzo graphing mm -hmm. and uh, that, that's like top notch the best use of Rizzo graphing as a medium I've ever seen Oh, fantastic. <laughs> There's going to be so many, there are going to be so many links in the description to check out. It's going to be great. Oh my god. I'm just like name dropping and you're just going to have to go through and find all these people. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, no. That's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. Even if I did not have to write a description whatsoever, I would be going through and I'd be writing down every single name that you mention just so I can check it out. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so, um, I didn't want to touch on this and I, and I apologize if you covered it before I um, can't really remember <laughs> exactly but so if risographing is meant to be faster and cheaper and that sort of thing where do you think the disconnect is is it that the is it the printers that are charging more for the the what's the word the the experience that that sort of thing that the commodity of risographing is it on part of the people who are selling them is it both like where where are we is it just somebody priced a risograph really highly and then other people followed where where do you feel all that kind of fell together i think some of it came from the what i see quite often especially because i do a lot of uh, old photography but now film and fo and cameras are way more expensive when they used to not be same thing happened to risographing it got it went really unpopular for ages on the advent of inkjet and uh, laser printing which was you know get better quality prints really easily or you know high quality glisse printing became the norm so this risograph technology just fell to the wayside. It didn't produce as great results. It basically relegated to newspapers and things that were able to just be thrown out really quickly. So mm -hmm. all these risograph printers became really cheap or free. People were just throwing them out. And a lot of people picked them up and they're just like, oh shit, you know, I can, I can print risograph whenever I want. I have all this stuff. So that's how it got a bit popular and then that's how it became a little bit more expensive when it shouldn't have been because a lot of uh, Southeast Asian countries already, they still have the risographing and they have a very, you know, they don't charge extra for that kind of thing. Because it's, it's they're still their standard? Sort um, of, not, sort of? not standard, it's just that there's more of them over there. Mm. So it is, you know, more competitive market, you also have that thing. Like if you mm. try and get risograph in Australia, you've got, I think it was Glom Press or Ashley Roning. And I think there's like a couple of people up in Brisbane who do it as well. Yeah, there's not a whole lot. Uh, okay. So it, uh, it is a bit of a weird scarcity thing. Mm. Which would play into things a bit more, I imagine. Yeah. So people, they, they see this, you know, it's the same way that sometimes people will value a Polaroid, even though it doesn't have any better, you know, mm. um, quality of photo over a digital shot, that they'll buy the Polaroid because like, oh yeah, you know, it's got the chemical process and you had to set it up a bit more and put that extra time in. And that's great. Mm. I do like Polaroids and risographs, but when they're used for the wrong reason and they're used as the advertising point to increase the price, I, it's not, not good. It's in bad faith, in my opinion. I do feel like I'm mimicking someone but I, by saying this, but I can't remember who. Uh, content is king, basically, isn't it? It shouldn't necessarily be the process. Yeah. Well, it, it is so frustrating because a, a good example is Animal Bro with uh, their zine Realm of the, Your Mum's Realm of the Senses. It mm. is a 
it is a tri- like a risograph two color, but it's the most hilarious, and it's it's just a a three piece of paper folded in bits, but it's the most hilarious and wonderful zine, and I would pay five dollars for that. With a title like that, I would think it be it would be a <laughs> amazing zine. <laughs> yeah, and and the best thing is it folds out to a poster, so I've got it on my wall. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Yeah, I just think it's really good, but. Uh, I guess I'll also mention now that part of the reason I don't like risographing from a library standpoint, because I also run the library up here in Brisbane, hmm. is that it rubs off if it's not sealed. And a lot of people either don't know that it has to be sealed with, like, you know, a spray or whatever, a um, varnish, uh-huh. or they just don't pay for it to try and keep costs down. So I have to put the risograph scenes in a separate area. People have to, like, you know... I'm not going to ask people to wear gloves, but I have to tell them to, like, be careful because the ink will come off. It's really frustrating with you have the entire zine is risographed and the ink starts rubbing off inside the actual zine on its own so you can't read it properly after a while. Oh, page rub. I hadn't even thought of that. (laughs) And that's why newspapers do the same thing, but newspapers are designed to be thrown out after, you know, the 12 hours has passed. (laughs) But these yeah. ones are clearly being sold as a high item, luxury almost, luxury zine. <laughs> yeah, and when you pay that much for a zine, you don't want to, somebody to argue with you, oh, it's just uh, ephemeral. Like, I don't want it to be ephemeral. I paid a lot for this. I'd like it to stick around for a while, thanks. Yeah. Hmm. Like, I paid $2 for a newspaper. Well, I don't buy newspapers, but if I did, I'd pay 2 bucks for one, not <laughs> 5 And it has, you know, they pay their, their editors and, you know, <laughs> they have multiple people and crazy good colours, shit like that. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to wrap up this uh, podcast <laughs> <laughs> with your thoughts on a couple of things, but uh, sort of all around a possible changing of mindset in zine culture. We're living in a time when more and more people have grown up with the world as a marketplace. If you make a thing, you can sell it. There are teens who have earned enough to pay for university before they even graduate, just selling the things they make. Many zine makers would have a laugh at the idea of making real profits with zines, but do you think this view is changing? Um, yes. From my work d- with um, people in Brisbane, you, you know, youth, youth people, <laughs> young people, <laughs> um, they will come in and they see that we have free printing on the caveat that, you know, they chill and, you know, use it for positive things. And they can, you know, they can sell those in for whatever they want, but they'll come in and bring in like a business plan for their zine making and designs, and I'm just like, oh, baby, like, I'm really proud that you tried to, you know, do those really, take those really positive steps, but that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, they, they come in, some people are coming into it with the idea, and they're being told this, my guess, by a lot of teachers, and um, a lot of people, they're, they're being told, if you put money into something to create it, you must have a business plan, it must be viable, Something is not worth doing unless it's financially viable, which I think is an abhorrent idea. Oh gosh, that's that's terrifying to think that so many youth peoples <laughs> are are being told that. Yeah, and I don't ever put it on them. And if they want to continue doing the business plan, like I will support that. But I let them know that they should be able to create and make those nice things without having that looming over their head. You know, the idea that I have to make the thing and if it doesn't make a profit, it wasn't worth it. I've got to change it. I've got to make it more market accessible. I'm like, no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I will, you will get support. And people will like things more if they're not, you know, hyper tailored and marketed. Oh, that's exactly it. Like, I, I, I'm trying to pick an examples out of the air all of a sudden. But basically, you know, I, I love the handmade, the cut and paste, the, the janky sort of alignment of text blocks and things like that like i love that so much that shows personality and while i do love uh, a higher end beautiful art that like i can appreciate that for what it is but that to me isn't a zine 
sort of thing that that is what it is and it's gorgeous and beautiful and stuff like that but a zine is is personality to me it's yeah <laughs> like i i barely even edit most of my zines if you've read the most recent prepared for melbourne too like i read through it once and then i was like you know putting you know changing grammar and stuff and then I read through it again after I started sending it out I'm like I didn't edit this well at all and it doesn't matter because I was trying to just get out that message it doesn't matter that it's you know it got a message out people were able to read it it was accessible for me because I'm really bad at grammar and the like I, I'm <laughs> absolutely atrocious at it and it makes me really really anxious to go through and constantly edit things so oh, for me God. part of that accessibility is having my message out there even though it might not be perfect my my yeah. high school english teacher would hate me well i can say as someone who's actually trained to be an editor <laughs> that i love your zine <laughs> i love all of your zines and even with my editing background i am the person who would love to go around town with a red texter and fix things like i'm that kind of editor like, I have the soul of an editor, even though I'm a writer. <laughs> uh, for me, zines are a part. You know, it it goes back to accessibility for me. It shouldn't be about perfect grammar and perfect spelling, as long as I can understand what you're trying to communicate. Yeah. And it's really, I think it's quite ableist to assume that everyone should be like, you know, constantly having to market themselves and edit and you know make things perfectly refined i'm like it's it does not need it <laughs> exactly it's, i mean it's, if fuck. people want to then fucking 10 out of 10 go nuts but don't go around you know shaming people who don't that's that's actually touches on a big thing that when i was doing research and trying to figure out notes and what i wanted to ask you and things like that that touches on a big thing in that i realized that ideals are fantastic but ideals become a problem when they turn into expectations. Mm. It's it's good to have, ideally, I'd like to give away all my zines for free, but no one should expect free zines. Exactly. You go in and like, if someone doesn't want to trade, you don't expect that they can trade. Maybe they've spent all their money on making the zine and they're only barely scraping back profit. So you never expect that they do trade, but you really hope that people like, if they can, they can. They do. Exactly. Exactly. I keep thinking about printer ink, because I'm about, about due. <laughs> and to get, oh, God, it's so expensive. But anyway, so with the world as a marketplace, with the new zine makers coming in, especially the, young, the youth peoples, I'm going to keep saying that because I think it's hilarious, <laughs> with the youth peoples especially, but not exclusively, do you think there is a disconnect between the zoo newer zine makers and the history and culture of zine making? Like, do you do you think there is a a gap that that there are a lot of people coming in who don't understand or know about the culture and the trading and the the marginalized voices, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I think yes, but I think it's less about knowing the history and more about doing things in good faith. Like, mm. if I have a lot of people who come in and they know nothing about zines, but they will get it the moment you, like, you know, even just mention, oh, it's a small print thing that marginalized voices use to tell their story or do some cool art or whatever the hell. And most people, I find, even, you know, young people, because bloody teenagers these days are so clued on, fucking 10 mm. out of 10 for youth people these days. Mm. <laughs> Um, they get it. So I don't find that there's too much of a disconnect unless they're coming in, you know, with the business plans or <laughs> they're doing it to further nothing but themselves. Mm. It's okay to make zines that showcase your work. It's a t I love seeing zines that are dedicated to people's art and the like, but then I see a lot of people where they, yeah, they don't know about the trading. They're like, oh, I'm making a zine. It is my zine. I'm not willing to trade. I'm only doing it because I want people to see my work. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and and that that's where it comes into bad faith, but I don't think that is exclusive to only, um, only new ones. No, definitely. The, the whole 
I am me, look at my things. Like, uh, zines are not a stage, they are a conversation. But I, I, yeah, I haven't seen that too much, thankfully. <laughs> well, you don't do a lot of uh, events as much, do you? you have, you're a bit more of the isolated rural zine maker, which I love. Yes, I actually was going to start calling myself the zine hermit, and then I looked up the definition of hermit, and there's actually a religious aspect, so I really have to, <laughs> I have to figure out my definition, but <laughs> yeah, the, the social anxiety, I kind of just like, you know, shouting from my little cave in South Australia. <laughs> Well, a lot of um, zine makers I know do have that extra social anxiety, mm. so I, I do like that zines give a lot of people who might not be able to talk a voice. Exactly. exactly. See, I, I've already got a loud voice. Like, I'll, <laughs> I'll fucking, you know, yell my opinion at anyone who's willing to give me half a minute to listen. <laughs> well, we're at a, an hour and five minutes in counting. <laughs> oh, wow. Sorry, I've made this no, no, way too no, no, long. No. Oh, don't apologize. It, it was more like, you know, I love your voice. You, you can talk about all the things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. I know I had a last question, but I think we pretty much covered that unless you wanted to talk about um, people invading the zine scene. Yeah, I would like to touch on that a little bit because I feel like there is an issue of people taking advantage of people in good faith. Like, Sticky makes a free event in good faith that people will use it to sell zines. And over the past few years, there have not been people who are willing to do that. You know, at Zix, we do things in good faith but we do charge for a table so we have way more mm. control over how things will be you know done and we let people sell things other than zines but it has to be an 80 20 split mm. however people at the festival of the photocopier they went in there with the no zines just none they were literally just selling etsy market bullshit the, so i i this is ah sorry I'm a bit shocked. So the, there were people there who had literally no zines at their table, like they just were selling stuff. From what I saw as things that they sold, yeah, or either that or the zines were like very not you know prominent. Here I have this mini zine, but look at my handmade candles. Not not, not even handmade, handmade stuff like mass art prints. Oh, yes, I did want to talk about that, because you mentioned someone was actually selling an, a book, like a book. Yeah, book like an a actual there. book that they, they claimed it was a zine. Actually, you know what? I am going to say names. This was Frances Cannon, whose work I think is fucking integral. Like, oh my god, she does amazing stuff and lifts up marginalized voices with her exposure and experience. Mm -hmm. However, her actions at Festival of the Photocopier kind of undid a lot of that in my mind. I'm just like, I don't want to think any less of her because she, because of some actions at an event that she had easy accessibility to. Mm. So I just, it's like so annoying, you know, selling uh, people going around. When I went there last year, people were all wearing, you know, they were all carrying around the same types of art prints, you know, they were there to buy stuff specifically from her and a few other bigger people and it's important that those big people do go there it's it's a great draw for the general public who might not understand zines or wouldn't have gone there in the first place unless there were the you know, more famous people but there has to be some kind of artists need to stand up and say to themselves oh i shouldn't sell all my stuff at festival of photocopia i should just sell my zines i might have other stuff but i'm not gonna sell it there I mean, if you're at a zine fest, and it, even if you only sell zines and you have, you know, a bunch of other stuff, like, if you're selling the zines, then people will look you up. Yeah, absolutely. People are taking advantage of a good faith event. Mm. And I, from the Instagram stories and everything else I was looking at from the event, all the popular people sat in the same spots. You know, it created a bottleneck and then people would, you know, go through, get the thing that they wanted from the, you know, the more famous person. Then they might look at a few other tables and then just fuck off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is... And I mentioned this in my zine, Two Pretentious for Melbourne. Sticky can't put assigned tables and then, you know, 
police the assigned tables yeah, for 200 yeah. people. Sticky has enough to do around Festival of the Photocopier. <laughs> exactly. It's not on them if they're, they're, as they're doing this in good faith. It is on people to not uh, take advantage of that good faith. Exactly. And, and you mentioned in Too Pretentious um, that there was actually, you had a quote from the Sticky email and it said, this is a, something to the line of, this is a zine only event. Yeah, we, it's literally in their email that you get for confirmation to attend the event. Hmm. And yeah, 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 people are just, yeah, fuck it, you know, just do whatever the hell. And I'm not going to go say that I'm the best person because I didn't read the email for it last year that said exactly the same thing and I tried to sell other bullshit and I shouldn't have. But we need to have more people standing up and being like, we can't, you, you got to self-regulate. Yeah, there's a responsibility for from the people, basically, the community. We shouldn't be afraid to say these things. Uh, I was about to say, another amazing zine and comic maker, Natalie Michelle Williamson, she did that. She went to she went to Sticky in good faith. She had a cool setup, but she only sold her comics and zines. Hmm. She didn't she had he, she has heaps of other stuff that she can sell. I've bought one of her jumpers before because uh, you know, ten out of ten design. Oh, did she have problems at Festival of photocopy of selling? Um, I don't know. I didn't ask, but I could oh. tell that she was dismayed. <laughs> like, mm. when you think about it, if she, if she followed the rules in good faith, and she probably lost sales because of it, because people weren't there just to buy zines, mm. she she potentially lost, you know, the ability to sell more zines, or if she had flaunted the rules, which, you know, she didn't, she could have made more money selling the other stuff because that's clearly what people were there for. Mm. So she she's like in a lose lose situation in both of those situations. Mm. Yeah, it's just it's not really not really fair, is it? I did want to touch on the bottleneck situation, the artists clumping together thing. Was it something you experienced when you were down there? Yes, absolutely. People like. I know that a lot of these more popular people are friends because, you know, they, they openly state it. And I think that's super great because that's how you, you know, through those networks, people can work in more positive ways. But it's a five hour event. You don't have to sit next to your bestie for the whole bloody time. Hmm. And uh, another thing is that because I now coordinate Zix and I've been volunteering for them for, you know, over a year now. I know that when we set up, because we have a, you know, we only got a many, 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 many less people than the Sticky ever does as zine holders, table holders. When we put people in assigned seating, we don't clump together the famous people. Like Philip Dearest, yeah, we chuck him up the back a little bit, but that's because mm. we know people will go to his table no matter what. Mm. Like we, we do it so that people walk through. You know, it's, it's important that everyone gets that equal kind of spacing. And I think, um, and this is a little bit self-focused of me, but I f want to comment on the bottlenecking because when I was down there in 2016, there was a bit of bottlenecking and I, as we both mentioned, <laughs> I'm, I'm a highly anxious person and I was walking through and suddenly seeing that clump of p people ahead of me and there were people behind me. I actually hugged myself, froze, and cried a little bit. <laughs> like I, I panicked because there were the just this huge clump, where as in other aisles there had been flow. And to give credit to zine makers, zine community, that sort of thing, like nobody minded. Like oh yeah, we we were all like, like oh yeah, just needs yeah, a little yeah. bit of help. They're they're having exact like. Just walk around, that sort of thing. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know if it's... It's big in my mind. I think it's something to mention why maybe spreading out of the bigger names would be a good thing. Because you have like little people like me. Not physically little, but little people like me. Ending up in an absolute near full-on panic attack. Because suddenly, boom! There's all the people. You, another issue of disability access, like it's clearly not mentally 
it's not good for anyone's mental health in that kind of squished area. Mm. Also, people flaunt that no food, no drink rule all the time in that space. And I know Sticky has asked people really specifically not to do it, but I have a severe nut allergy. I cannot mm. be in the same room as there being nuts. And I saw people eating that shit everywhere. Because nuts are healthy. <laughs> Everyone else should definitely eat them. Don't stop. But I felt unsafe. Exactly. I mean, respect the rules for a reason. That it, it, it's you should not be threatened at a zine event. Your life should not be threatened at a zine event. I, I think a lot of a lot of the issue does come from the vast number of people. They Sticky wants to make it accessible for everyone to have a table as much as they want everyone to come in and buy the stuff. And I think mm. that's really really positive of them because it's like. You know, I couldn't manage a 200-person event. Fuck. <laughs> they, they're doing it because they want people to be there to sell stuff, but I don't... I think they're at critical mass now mm. it, anymore, or, you know, keeping it at that level is just gonna, you know, make it shit. Yeah, I was um, talking to someone, and even the, the table situation was a bit cramped and didn't make sense, and it was a little bit uncomfortable... So yeah, I don't think they could make it any bigger and with people flaunting and being like, I don't need to obey the rules or just not reading the rules, then you have situations that could eventually, you know, crash someone into a panic attack or put someone like you in very real danger. And it wouldn't be on sticky. It's about the people who are at this event and all the people who are going in good faith and expecting certain rights and safety nets to be in place. Exactly. That's part of what I do at what we try and do at Zix. The reason why we have it in the state library is so that we are disability friendly. We, mm. you know, have, um, you know, okay lighting, nothing's overstimulating. If mm. you only need a table for one day, you can have that if that's all you can handle. Mm. But yeah, I just feel like the accessibility, you have to sacrifice one for the other. We have less tables. So less people can have a table, mm. but we also, for the people who do attend, at 110%, they feel comfortable and safe. That's that's awesome and amazing and wonderful. That is so cool. <laughs> it's a fucking shout out to Jeremy, who's been organizing Zix and who handed it over to me last week. Um, mm. He has helped propagate such a wonderful, like, um... Uh, event and for everything to be accessible and wonderful oh that's so great he was great <laughs> like I feel like these as long as we police each other and I hate to use the word police because it sounds so you know but Mo moderate is that a better yeah, word? yeah as, as long as we're keeping checks and moderate and and constructively commenting to each other on things that maybe aren't cool for everybody like, I feel like events can be really good. Now, I haven't been to Zix personally, but the 80-20 rule, the fewer tables, the spread out, you can do it one day, all of those options and things like that and considerations, I feel like, are showing all the good things that a zine fest can be. Yeah. And I, we, we are a small one. Like, we do say that part of the reason why we have that is because we are, it's Brisbane. We don't have as big of a art and zine scene here. We acknowledge that. But for what we do, we try and manage it excellently. Hmm. And yeah, I just like even now I'm I'm I have this little bit of a cringe because I don't I don't want to be like criticizing people or anything like that. But at the same time I feel like we need to be able to as long as we're not being mean about it, as long as we're not being like rah, you know, grr grr. But if you make a criticism in good faith with the idea that the criticism, if taken on, would help improve the situation, then I think it's totally fair. Yeah, exactly. If, it, if it's, it's done in a positive, like, I, I don't mean to insult anybody or that sort of thing. We should be able to say these things, and I, and I hope people find courage to say these things, because unless they do, unless we're talking to each other, then it's forcing, in the sticky situation, it's forcing 
sticky to either watch something bad spread in their zine fest or it's forcing them to do more work at a time when they have a heck of a lot of things on anyway. Exactly. And we, because they're doing it in good faith, we should be standing up to the plate. We, a lot of people treated it like, oh, I'm just going to rock up. I don't have to contribute in any other way. I'm just going to rock up and sell my zines at a fair. Whereas a lot of people at Zix, like a lot of the table holders, <laughs> they, they kind of come in like, yeah, I'm paying for a table. Like, what else can I do kind of thing? Mm. It's kind of a different attitude. Yeah, but good. I actually find that a big difference in the art scenes in different cities. Brisbane seems to be more of, like, helpful. Like, everyone's just supporting each other because we don't get much support from, you know, the government. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas in Melbourne it feels a bit more, you know, cutthroat. Yes, it definitely, it feels big and it feels like there there's less definition between... I don't know if definition is the right word, but less of a distinction between zines and art and, and that sort of thing. I feel like it all kind of gets globbed up into this big art ball <laughs> sort of thing. And, it, and it's hard to distinguish and and it, it makes it even harder for newer people coming into it. Absolutely. Oh, goodness, what a discussion. <laughs> oh, a bit of a long one, eh? Yeah, a bit, but oh, goodness me. <laughs> so many topics and everything. I'm so excited. I feel like we can <laughs> we can definitely do a couple more of these with just some of the tangents. <laughs> oh, yeah, just a tangent. We'll call it the tangent cast. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like just a 20-minute zine rant <laughs> quickie. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we probably should <laughs> kind of wrap things up. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, say to the listeners <laughs> uh, well I, I i'd have to say if you're in brisbane come around to visible ink and copy and destroy have a look at the uh library there is a limit for ages to use this space but any there's no age limit on actually seeing the library mm. so really we always have we always welcome donations as well if you email us a digital version of your zine we'll print off one copy or as many copies as you'll let us and distribute them <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, we've been doing that with some of your missives from Murray Ridge. Oh, yes. I love that. Throwing things into the ether and seeing what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you so much again for joining me on The Zine Collector and talking about all this interesting stuff. Oh, it was very fun. Definitely keen to do this again. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, despite, you know, all the pre-anxieties this is this has been really really good so thank you oh most welcome that is it for today zine friends thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the zine collector another huge thanks to sober bob as well i have a lot of anxieties and a lot of them are around phones and communication and things like that in general and she was amazing with working with me to deal with that uh, ball of chaos so thank you again to Sober Bob for the chat and the the uh, support in that area be sure to check the descriptions not for not just only for all the names that uh, we both mentioned but also for Sober Bob's links definitely worth checking out I promise <laughs> next episode we will be back to the usual swing of things and I actually have a plan so I can tell you that we will be talking about how to get started in zines a few tips from you yours truly and the usual segments including a little Q&A about uh, inspiration so be sure to come back next uh, fortnight for that Remember that everything I say is just my opinion. There are no gatekeepers in the zineverse, nor should there be. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. This month I am celebrating Mini Zine March, so all of my reviews this month will be Mini Zine reviews. And I also have a couple of Wednesday reviews thrown in just for fun. The music for this podcast, Spanish Summer by Audionautics, is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. This is Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Until next time, go make some zines. Mwah.
So is there anything that you'd like to share in the super secret, not so secret if people find out after credits thing? (laughs) Ah, all right. You can say whatever. It it could be anything. It could just be like, hey, I'm in the after credits doing your after credits. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's actually brilliant. Um, Probably say something real rude or something. (laughs) (laughs) You can just sing, if you like pina (laughs) nicola. Yeah. If you like pina coladas and getting cold in the rain, I'm super hungover. I managed to get through this podcast. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I recorded that. You can put that at the end. There we go. And stopping recording. (laughs) You're listening to the Zine Collector Podcast, Episode 6, Tips for Zine Beginners. Hello zine friends! If you're new here, welcome to the Zine Collector and if you have listened and or watched before, welcome back! I am your host Jamie Nix. Let's talk about zines! Or, as I usually do, ramble a little bit before actually talking about zines. (laughs) Episode 6, we're here! Wow! I mean, six isn't usually a a milestone of any particular value anywhere, but hey, six, wow, you know? (laughs) See, I told you I'd still be impressed by every single episode as if it was a milestone. (laughs) As usual, thank you for all of the feedback on the last episode and to bring up some interesting discussions and some feelings, both positive and negative. So thank you for everyone who chatted with me, who let me know that it made them think about things and evaluate things and let me know their opinions on that sort of thing, on the various topics we covered, because we definitely covered a lot. And um, thank you again to Sober Bob. I, I never thought that I would actually ever interview anyone on this show due to social anxieties and things like that and I just I really have to thank Sober Bob because she helped make that experience as make sure the experience caused as little anxiety as possible worked with me a lot um just acknowledged a lot of what I was feeling and that sort of thing and really sometimes just knowing that the other person knows and understands can go a long way and Sober Bob definitely did that. I don't know that interviews will happen again. They might, they might not, Uh, they might soon, who knows. Uh, All I know is that whereas before it was kind of like no this is definitely not going to happen Uh, Now it is more of a positive possible prospect, (laughs) that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, so (laughs) I debated saying this because I know she'll never see it, but uh, I have to shout out to Jenna Marbles because last week she did uh, the Jenna Julian podcast on her own. And she was wondering what, why you would ever host a podcast on your own. She was a bit perplexed at the prospect of just doing a podcast all by yourself. And and I just said, it's it's because we're nervous, okay? We get a little nervous. That's why we want to do podcasts by ourselves. We're a bit nervous around people. (laughs) That sort of thing. I watch Jenna Julian podcasts and their videos and stuff like that. Just, it's it's a little bit weird for me and inspiring for me because Jenna is like all of one month, I think, younger than I am. I'm one month older than Jenna Marbles. (laughs) And a special note, and I apologize if you have no idea what I'm talking about and really want me to stop rambling, I just want to say that on the weird off chance, um, My heart really goes out to Julian right now, who is dealing with an extraordinary amount of pain. And I just wish him and everyone involved all the best in the situation. 
back on track, shall we? <laughs> let's, let's move past the things that people may not know what I'm talking about at all. <laughs> this one is for the podcast listeners rather than the um, people who watch on YouTube. Yes, that is right. I have a YouTube channel where you can find not only the videos of me recording this podcast, like you can see me speaking and that sort of thing. I also do happy mail videos as well, where I to share what people have sent me in the mail for the previous week. So if that's the sort of thing that you are interested in, or if you have suggestions for things for like one-off videos or that sort of thing, um, they're definitely welcome. I do have plans for one-off videos like how to saddle stitch and how I saddle stitch and stay organized and all that sort of stuff. Like I have a lot of ideas for videos I want to do. So if you'd like to check that out, be sure to check the description or search for the zine collector on YouTube. My channel, my name is Jamie Nix on YouTube, but it's easier to find me if you search the zine collector rather than Jamie Nix. Now, the last item in news and announcements is that episode seven of the zine collector will be delayed. My plan is that it will only be delayed by a week, but this podcast, while it is very important and a priority in my life, it's just not going to be possible for me to do it as usually scheduled every other week. So I'm hoping to be back on April 11th, but I'm only 98% sure that I'll be able to do it. So just be aware of that. Um, on the YouTube side of things, I will be missing, I believe, the next two Happy Mail Mondays, I believe. I'm not exactly firm on the how things are going to run, so that's that. And let's get on to some actual zine-related stuff <laughs> and read some zine events. Happening on March 21st, we have the Young Artist Class, The Creative World of Zine, which is new. It just says new there. I'm not sure. It's like, bah, I don't know if new is part of the title or not. But yes, the Young Artist Class on March 21st is happening in Michigan City, Indiana. We also have the Cringeworthy Zine Workshop happening March 23rd in Syracuse. Syracuse? Syracuse? I'm not quite sure. Syracuse, New York. On March 24th, we have Fluke Mini Zine Comics. Oh, sorry. Mini Comics and Zine Festival in Athens, Georgia. Also on the 24th, we have the Teen Zine Dream happening in Melbourne. On March 25th in London, we have the Arts Crafts Zine Fair. And on, also on the 25th in New York, New York, we have the NYC Feminist Zine Fest. On March 27th in Salem, Massachusetts, we have Zine Club. On March 28th in Northampton, Massachusetts, we have the Forbes Library Zine Club. In, oh sorry, on March 31st in Santa Cruz, California, we have the Santa Cruz Zine Fest. On April 1st, we have the Joshua Tree Zine Fest happening in Joshua Tree, California. And on April 4th, we have Graphic novels, fanzines, and comics crafternoon happening in Somerville, Massachusetts. Massachusetts really gets up to a lot of zine stuff, don't they? <laughs> Excellent. And there's more where that came from. If you'd like a direct line to zine events around the world or would like to make sure that your event is listed, please check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook. Links are in the description and you can get in touch and make sure that you are in the know when it comes to zine events around the world. <laughs> in the last episode of the Zine Collector, I had a chat with Sober Bob, a long chat, the longest episode I have or probably ever will again make. <laughs> uh, we talked about a lot of things, had a lot of feelings, a lot of sort of, um, in some cases, polarizing comments to make about things. So. What I wanted to do this week is kind of take a step back, relax, have a nice, you know, relax chat about things in the zine, the zine verse. I do want to get zine verse to be a word, a thing. <laughs> I think I'm failing though. So with that in mind, I have 
over the past few years, I think I've been blogging for longer, but the past few years have been the years where things have picked up a bit. And in that time, I have had the pleasure and the absolute honor and the good feels and all the wonderful things that come with that, um, of people letting me know that they came across zines thanks to Sea Green Zines. Like Sea Green Zines was their starting point or they had a starting point, but Sea Green Zines was somewhere early along the line of them learning about what zines are and how to make them and how to connect and all sorts of things like that. Thinking about that, I was, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't assuming anyone's level of zine familiarity. I didn't want to assume everybody knows about zines and thus I don't have to talk about some things here or or the opposite, uh, assuming everyone has no idea about zines and so I have to talk about all of the things. Basically, I want everyone to feel welcome here and on the blog and stuff like that and feel that they have a starting point, that they don't have to go anywhere else or learn anything else or even do anything else before this can be an accessible place for them to learn and to feel welcome and all of that good stuff. Because of that, today I am sharing my five tips for zine beginners. <laughs> I hope this isn't boring to those who uh, know about zines already, but I, I understand if it is. But as I said, I just, I want to feel, I want everyone to feel like they can make zines and learn about zines in a positive, good way. So <laughs> on with it, Nick's on with it. <laughs> okay, if you are new to the world of zines, welcome. I am on the welcoming committee. Did you know? Like, but you know, I, I my official stuff is in the mail or something. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> welcome to this amazing world of communication and creation. My first tip to you as a beginning zine maker or zine enthusiast or zine reader or wherever you are, whatever you're doing, is take a deep breath. <laughs> Breathe in. Breathe out. Oh. There we go. <laughs> it can be so overwhelming when you find a thing that you really are excited about, but there's so much going on and it's going on all over the place and you feel like everyone except you knows everything about the thing that you love and you don't know where to start. Deep breath. <laughs> I think the last thing that anyone, especially me, wants you to feel when it comes to zines is overwhelmed or intimidated or like you're not part of the group. There are so many super nice zine makers out there and super supportive zine makers out there. I don't want to say everyone wants you to feel welcome because I can't speak for everyone. That's not my place. There are problems in the zine verse and there are politics in the zine verse and there are there are negative things like there are in everything but there are beautifully wonderful awesome things on the positive side of zines and a lot of what zine making is and is about is being supportive so tip number one take a deep breath we are here to support you. <laughs> At least I am. I shouldn't speak for everyone. I really shouldn't, but I am here to support you. And I imagine a lot of zine makers are. My second tip for getting started with zine making is very closely related to the first. And that's, it's about avoiding getting overwhelmed. And that tip is don't get ahead of yourself. When I first find something I really like, my habit is to like completely submerge myself in that subject. Like I, I need to know all the things, all the steps, all the tutorials must be in my brain. Like I want to know every step of the way. And while enthusiasm is a really good thing, 
doing it the way that I usually do it, it to the extreme that I take it is not the way to go. It is the path to being overwhelmed. Like I said, enthusiasm is a great thing, but investigating online shop fronts or getting frustrated with overseas postage costs are not stresses you need and need to invite into your life when you're just starting out or even early on really like I'm not sitting here trying to dictate to you the exact point of when to open a shop front I am not that person and no one is that person you need to make decisions for you I'm what I'm trying to say is that hyper focusing on something on every step of something is not only inviting stress and overwhelm into your life it can also be even if it's unintended a means of procrastination and distracting yourself from actually making a zine now you may already have a shop front you may want to start with a shop front that's okay i'm like i said i'm not dictating to you what to do all I'm saying is that if you're coming from scratch, take a breath, don't get ahead of yourself. Enjoy, it's meant to be a good thing, a relaxed, fun thing. Don't worry about the politics right now. <laughs> Learn to love the craft before um, getting tangled in the webs that come with the, the, the other stuff. Well, the next tip is technically number three on the list. I feel like it is the top or number one tip in a lot of ways. If you're taking your breath and you're not getting ahead of yourself and you're still wondering what to do with all of that excited energy you have, the thing you can throw your energy into is number three, read zines. This is absolutely important, absolutely vital. Reading zines is really the best way to get a feel for what zines are. They like get your hands on as many as you can. Well, as many as you want, as many as you're able, all that sort of stuff. But read zines, read all of the zines, grab zines that you know you're going to love because they're on topics that you love and then grab some zines that you're not sure you're going to love. Maybe not grab zines that you know you're going to hate, but maybe even do that too. I, I'm not sure, but the point of it is that reading zines is not only pretty awesome in and of itself because hello zines, it's a great way to get to know your preferences. Do you like a table of contents? Do you like page numbers? Do you like typing? Do you like handwritten ones? Do you like photos? Do you like uh, zines without words at all? Do you like cut and paste style? Do you like a more professional style layout? Do you like collab zines with more than one voice in them. There are so many different ways to do zines out there and the only way to really find out what's possible is to check out what people have been doing. I mean, you may find things that you don't like in zines, but the fact of the matter is that even that can inspire you. I mean, say you really don't like a thing or don't like a take on a thing, that can inspire you to give your own take on the thing or the event or just help you to go, okay, I want to offer my own interpretation of X. I'm not saying go out there and get a bunch of zines that you're just not interested in. Well, I do think there is value in doing that. I also understand that I'm a bit of a, a little bit of a different kind of zine enthusiast like like I said with the hyper research hyper focus and everything like that I am a kind of person who might get a zine on topic that I'm not really interested in if it has some sort of factor or anything I want to look at closer but I do feel like even if it's difficult to find things that you do like you should look for zines and experience scenes and find your preferences that way and figure out what you want to bring to the zine world because only you have your perspective but you could also innovate you could make something nobody's seen before you could 
do something brand new and bring something amazing to the zine world. So read zines, read zines, get to know, and yeah. (laughs) There are a heap of places, so many places to find zines. If you're at all wondering, you know, where do I start? What do I do? You can check out the zine world calendar that I mentioned before and see if there are any events in your area. Online, there are shop fronts, there's Etsy and Ticktail and Store Envy and Big Cartel. There are Facebook groups like Zines A Go Go, Zine Club, and even more. And there's, of course, WeMakeZines.com, which is a little bit quiet at the moment, but there are so many places to find them. It's, it's really, but if you're at all feeling a bit lost or anything, you can certainly always contact me or find a zine maker you admire and try to get in contact, excuse me, try to get in contact with them. Where there are zines, there are zine makers, which brings us to tip number four, connect with other zine makers. Now, connecting with other zine makers isn't the be all and end all of zines by any means. It certainly doesn't have to be, but this is a big tip for me because there is a lot in zine culture about connecting with other people. In the last episode, Sober Bob and I touched on the topic of zine trades, which is also one great way of getting more zines to read. And, but that is only one of like many reasons to get to know other zine makers. A lot of us are really nice. I mean, at least a lot of us are trying to be really nice and supportive and everything like that. There are so many zine makers out there who in one way or another will help you with any technical questions that you have like layout and should I do this and sort of do that and who will gently remind you to be aware of your margins (laughs) that sort of thing there are people out there who will help you feel or at least try to help you feel less alone in whatever it is you are doing and by connecting with other zine makers, like connecting with any of the people really, they will help you directly or indirectly expand your worldview. And through doing that, they could help you f- find your writing voice or your, your zone with your art, that sort of thing. And yeah, while there could be one, some, or many who piss you off, there's still good to be found and even if they do piss you off like finding or reading a zine that you don't necessarily like it can inform you to what you do like and how you do want to connect with other people and and subjects you do want to talk about that sort of thing like there there is a silver lining to it and now we come to the last tip for beginner zine makers zine enthusiasts zine readers and otherwise. (laughs) We uh, kind of coming back to the first tip in a roundabout way and number five is relax and enjoy. Zines are a lot of things to a lot of people and there are a lot of things to this person and (laughs) yours truly but I think most of all they should be something you enjoy making. Like no one's making you forcing you to make zines or or if they are that's really weird <laughs> like talk to someone else cuz that's like that's weird <laughs> zines are something that whether you've been making zines for 10 years or 10 minutes you can in making them shove away negativity shove away the world for a while or embrace the world for a while and make something be creative. Do the thing. It is, zines are sketching, zines are meditation, zines are relaxation, zines are fun, zines are, zines are whatever you want them to be, but the thing they shouldn't be is something that ever makes you feel like you're being dragged down or anything like that. So relax, enjoy, and make some zines. (laughs) That sounded like the end of the show, didn't it? (laughs) 
So there we have it, the five tips, my five tips for uh, zine beginners. Is there anything I missed? Is there a tip that you would give to people beginning their zine journey, if you like? <laughs> Is there anything that you wish you would have known when you were starting out, that sort of thing? Be sure to leave a comment in the comment section to let me know, or on the blog if you are in a place that uh, doesn't let you leave comments. <laughs> Now we come to the Q&A segment where I answer one question from you each podcast. Now this isn't uh, a sp question from one specific person. This is a question I've had a few times over the, z the years. It's a zine reviewing question and it is, what if you don't like a zine? <laughs> That's understandable. On sea green zines I tend to... <laughs> Even if I don't understand a zine or that sort of thing, I try to see the bright side of things. It's usually really easy because I love zines, but the fact of life is that you can't please everyone all the time and thus even I come across a zine that I don't like. It's actually very rare for me to have a zine that I just outright don't like. What happens more often for me is that I come across a zine that doesn't make me feel a lot or think a lot. Or like uh, I enjoy it for what it is, but I don't have a lot to say about it. And that's where <laughs> that's where any problems come in because if I don't have anything to say about it, then now am I supposed to review it with any amount of enthusiasm. But to actually answer the question, if there's a zine that I just, I don't like, and there have been a couple over the years, I don't review it. It's, it's as simple as that. I just, I don't review it. There are a lot of places that will put negative reviews out there. It's just not something I feel I want to do at the moment. I, I might change that policy in the future, but I just, I, it's not for me putting, I, I will be some, I will sometimes feel neutrally about a zine, but if I just outright dislike something, I won't review it. I mean, I was slightly horrified by the person who suggested that, you know, I might throw their poetry zine in the, in the fire if I don't like it. If there's a zine I don't like, even if I really don't like it, I will pass it on. Like, I will try to find a good home for it. There's, there's like a golden rule with zines for me, and that's this is something someone has created, and I will treat it with the due respect that I would, I would hope that no one ever burned any of my zines, and thus I would never burn someone else's zines, but that's a bit of a, a side tangent. Zines, I, I mean, I have quite a few come through, so any that, whether I review or don't review, they get passed on. Not all of them, but some get passed on to you know, the good homes, that sort of thing. Occasionally, the editor soul in me will uh, rear up and say, and, and a, review, a review may have more of why it didn't work for me than praise. But the thing to keep in mind about that is that I, I want that those sort of comments to be constructive criticism, not anything. I don't want to be insulting anybody. I don't want anybody to feel bad. I... I basically, I'm just one person and certain things don't work for me and you can take that on board or you can leave it. But the thing to remember is that if I have reviewed a zine, even if it comes out across as a little bit negative, the thing is I've reviewed it. I don't review zines I don't like. So if the review is up and no matter what it says, if the review is up, I cared enough and I liked enough to write a review about it. And I guess that's what's important. <laughs> if you have any questions about zines, zine reviewing, me, life, Australia, whatever, let me know. I do have, uh, I do write the, all the questions down. I have a list and that sort of thing. And you can leave comments in the various comments areas. You can tweet at me, message, that sort of thing. It's, it's all good. I'm here. It may take me a while to answer the questions because I do only one per um, podcast, but I will answer 
the questions eventually. <laughs> now it's time for sharing is caring. I'm a little non-sponsored, even though I'm kind of open to sponsorship if anybody wants to. <laughs> but sharing is caring is a non-sponsored little segment about zine spaces, places, and other things that I am loving in the zineverse this week. And this episode we have the Bunny Ears Audio Zine Distro. <laughs> do you like audiobooks? If you do, then you now have the option to listen to audio zines as well by checking out bunnyears.bandcamp.com. You can listen to text-based zines like you would any other audiobook. There are Offerings like Last Night at the Casino, Short and Queer, and Proof I Exist. And what's even more awesome is that these zines are read by the people who wrote them. So be sure to check out Bunny Ears at bunnyears.bandcamp.com. You may just find a cupcake in the mix there, read by yours truly. <laughs> It is um, run by a friend, again, not sponsored, but very happy to shout out the Audio Distro Project because I know I have been taking forever in the starting up the sister podcast where I read out zine excerpts. So to tide you over or to get you into the world of audio zine distros, there you go. <laughs> Well, that is it for today, Zine friends. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope this was a bit of a shorter, relaxed podcast for you. I am hoping to have a few more shorter, relaxed, that sort of thing, podcasts coming up in the future, but uh, because plans are a little bit up in the air, I don't want to mention anything just yet. <laughs> I want to remain flexible in what I'm doing. This is just another reminder to let you know that the next podcast will not be going up in a fortnight. It will probably be going up in three weeks, April 11th. Remember that everything I say is just my opinion. There are no gaper, excuse me, there are no gatekeepers in the zineverse, nor should there ever be. Links to the things I've talked about today are in the description. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. Reviews uh, will be going up as per usual, despite the uh, podcasting delays and everything like that. Uh, we'll see about all of the other po non-review posts, but reviews are definitely covered, so no worries there. <laughs> The music for this podcast, Spanish Summer by Audionautics, is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution License. This is the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nixon. Until next time, go make some zines. So, episode six. Episode six was huge. Episode five was huge. Oh my god, I'm starting all the way over. You're listening to the Zine Collector Podcast, episode seven. Seven tips for finding inspiration. Zine friends, welcome to the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Let's talk about zines or, you know, ramble on a little bit before talking about zines, <laughs> which is the usual way, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> it's been a while, but it hasn't been that long. So yes, I'm back. I am back and I appreciate all of the support and lovely people saying nice things. <laughs> well, I had a brief stay away. Now, um, if you know me, uh, you know that I am against stigmas on mental health, so I will openly and freely say that I did a an inpatient anxiety program 
and it was in Adelaide and inpatient meant that I couldn't just pop back home because Adelaide is a little bit of a distance away so that is why there was the delay and I wasn't actually sure I was going to be able to do this on time but what can I say <laughs> I like the podcast I like talking about zines and that sort of thing so here I am if I'm a little bit rusty uh, that's why two weeks away it was uh, very much away from the world at large really so it's uh it's definitely an, an experience in a lot of ways and yeah I'll probably make a zine about that <laughs> that's for sure and yeah basically um I'm really just I'm happy to be back I'm happy to be talking to you I'm I have this it's weird uh, to be in there and feel your perspectives changing it's like your brain's rewiring and you know what's happening and stuff like that and it's definitely a good thing it's it's good to be back home but it's also different to have this slightly slightly different perspective on life and how I'm living it and how I treat myself and that sort of thing while I did go in for anxiety issues I learned so much about so many things about myself and how basically I haven't really been treating myself well and that sort of thing and so things are definitely going to change um, on that note I really appreciate the support and understanding over just the you know I know it's one week but it was still a delay when I had committed to once a fortnight and I don't like changing my commitments or anything but I do know now that I do need to take breaks and things like that so there may be breaks in the future but of course I will always be very open about and warn you in advance if there are any breaks but uh <laughs> I am rambling quite a bit already and you know it's a podcast and everything so I'll be forgiving of myself but let's uh talk about zine related things of course if you have any questions about anything again I'm probably going to make a zine about the whole experience and yeah if you want to know something let me know just it gives me a uh, direction to go in basically <laughs> so yeah good to be back uh miss doing this even though even though I don't know I don't know how I was going to end that sentence <laughs> so I'll just I'll keep going I missed all this even the awkwardness of my rambling so yeah that's basically it I don't really have any notes or announcements beyond that so let's just get into zine events what's happening around the world <laughs> around the world this fortnight I only do the zine events about a fortnight in advance <laughs> if you hadn't picked up on that already so zine events we do have quite a few now <clears throat> excuse me all of these the next four five six oh goodness okay so a lot of a lot of things are happening on april 14th so be prepared <laughs> okay in boston massachusetts again on april 14th we have the feminist scene festival in support of planned parenthood in salt lake city utah also on the 14th we have grid zine fest also on April 14th in Omaha, Nebraska, we have the Omaha Zine Fest. At least I think that's Nebraska. It's been a while, but I'm pretty sure NE is Nebraska. But don't quote me on that because I'm not entirely sure. It's been a while. <laughs> and we in Santa Fe on the same day, uh, we have the Santa Fe Zine Fest. Gosh, it is the weekend for Zine Fest in the States. That's fantastic. Well, I mean, maybe not if you wanted to go to each and every single one of them, but you know teleporting we got to get on that right <laughs> on April 14th and 15th in Santiago Chile we have something I'm probably going to completely butcher if I try to say it but basically it's a fanzines event happening happening in Santiago Chile over the weekend of the 14th and 15th also over the weekend of the 14th and 15th I think it's the weekend I just realized that I didn't check that but <laughs> 14th and 15th in Glasgow we have the Glasgow zine fest oh I would love to do that one of those bucket list places to visit 
On April 16th in Northampton, Massachusetts, we have the Forbes Library Zine Club. On April 21st in Michigan City, Indiana, we have the Zine and Small Press Fest. Oh, I like that. Press Fest. <laughs> Fun to say. On April 21st and 22nd in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we have the New Zealand... <laughs> Doing really well with these. <laughs> Gosh. On April 21st and 22nd in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we have the New Zealand Zine Fest. On April 22nd in Boston, Massachusetts, we have the Massachusetts Feminist Zine Fest. And on April 25th in Northampton, Massachusetts, we have the Forbes Library, Library Zine Club again. Massachusetts, you are all over this zine thing, aren't you? That's fantastic. If you are looking to move and don't really have any particular direction to go in, go to Massachusetts. They have all kinds of zine stuff on. <laughs> Please excuse my stumbling. I don't know how much I'm going to be able to edit out, but yeah. <laughs> And there are a lot more events where that came from. If you'd like a direct line on zine events around the world or would like to make sure that your zine event is listed, there is the Zine World Calendar. Check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook. Links, as always, are in the description. Definitely a great resource. Even if you can't travel to all of them, it is just lovely seeing all the things that are happening all around the world. And a lot of the time, there are so many things happening that I can't read a whole list without taking forever and ever and ever basically so i just pick and choose a few no particular reason why i pick what i pick it's just there that sort of thing get it down to one page that i read and away we go <laughs> on to the main content of the show in the last episode i shared six six was a five <laughs> Of course, I can't remember because it was episode six, but I think it was five tips for uh, zine beginners. And this week, I'd like to talk something that is uh, a little bit along those lines, kind of an elusive entity, and that is the topic of inspiration. This originally came as a question from Latibule online when I asked if anybody had any questions for the Q&A segment of the podcast. A lot of people ask, you know, what do I do for inspiration, that sort of thing, and I figure that it's such a big and complex uh, topic that it really warranted its own episode rather than um, where it might have been a little bit smushed down for the Q&A segment. There is a lot to say about inspiration and ties to motivation and all and all sorts of things and mental health and all sorts of things but basically I wanted to keep it to the list format because I really like lists <laughs> so here are my seven tips for finding inspiration or cultivating inspiration or ways to uh, put yourself in the mindset to being open to inspiration but you know, obviously those aren't uh, <laughs> very catchy titles. Way too long to be a title. Anyway, so seven tips for finding inspiration. Tip number one, immerse yourself in what you are doing or what you'd like to be doing. In the last episode of the podcast, I talked about one of my tips for beginning zine makers is to read zines. I feel like that's a really important step for getting familiar with the zine world. But at the same time, I feel like that principle, that immerse yourself in what it is you want to do, applies to basically any creative endeavor and some non-creative endeavors as well. If you want to do a thing, there are so many different ways to approach it. And you can find inspiration in finding those related but not maybe not necessarily direct sort of avenues when i was growing up i was very much into writing novel writing that sort of thing and the one thing i heard the most is if you want to write a book you need to read the books which probably informed my tip being if you want to make zines read zines but again while this is definitely is obviously a, a zine podcast it's it applies creatively. If you want to draw, 
check out some classes maybe. If you want to paint, try some different kinds of paints. There's oil paints and acrylic paints and that, that sort of thing. There's there's so many ways, like there are classes, there are, you know, doing group activities, there are art galleries, there are libraries, there, there are so many ways to get familiar with and get involved in what you want to do that can be, that can feed your inspiration, that can help you feel inspired and motivated and make you feel like you really want to do the thing, but also can inform how you do the thing, how you want to do the thing, doing the thing in ways that are more along the lines of what, you know, speaks to your soul <laughs> sort of ways. So number one tip, definitely get involved. Get involved, have fun. I mean, maybe you'll find that a class isn't your thing, or maybe you'll find you don't like reading about, you know, 16th century painters or something like that. that that's okay. You don't have to like all of the surrounding ways of the thing, but they it's all information. It's all helpful input for when you finally do the thing. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. Tip number two for finding inspiration is always carry a notebook with you. I have been doing this for so long, it actually feels a little weird to not do it. Like if you've been wearing a watch for a while and then don't wear a watch, it's that sort of, it feels odd for me not to have a notebook and pen with me. I think this tip is good in a general sense. Like there's always something going on. People live very busy lives and there's someone to call or something to add to the grocery list and that sort of thing. And carrying a notebook around can be very useful in that way. But at the same time, I feel like it's maybe, maybe not essential. Like I don't feel like I'm in a position to say this is an absolute essential thing, but it's been essential for me in my life. Carrying a notebook around, and it doesn't have to be huge. Like I have a, an A6 notebook usually. I mean, I haven't carried the same one around for <laughs> however long, however many years. But I usually just have a small notebook, fairly plain, you know, scratch paper. Like it's it's not a notebook that intimidates me. It's not a notebook that I don't want to spoil the pages or anything. It's really important for me to have a notebook that. I can just scribble or scratch or whatever in it and just it doesn't hinder me. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm assuming that this is a pretty common thing that you've had a note that people get notebooks and they're just so pretty you don't want to spoil the pages or anything. Don't get a notebook like that. <laughs> get a notebook or even make a notebook that you can just carry around and scribble in and like I said, scratch and it doesn't you don't you're not thinking about the writing of the notebook. The notebook facilitates you writing down everything that pops into your mind. Now, the thing about carrying a notebook is obviously carrying a notebook doesn't guarantee you inspiration. You could carry it around and just not be. But for me, carrying around a notebook says to my brain, says to the universe, if you are that way in inclined in thinking, that I am open to inspiration. I have my notebook, I have my pen, I might not feel inspired by something, but I'm open to it. I am prepared to write it down, I am prepared to capture whatever inspiration floats my way. And I have found that doing that, just starting to do that, like the things flow easier. I, do, I write everything down pretty much. Do I later find that inspiring? Nah. <laughs> There are so many things I've written down and gone, yeah, that, uh, huh, yeah, no, no, not gonna, not going to pursue that one. But the thing is, I'm writing it down. I am inspired in the moment, at least, which is a beautiful thing in and of itself. And I'm, I'm open to it. I'm open to the world. I'm looking around. I'm listening. I'm, you know, I'm taking in taking it in in ways that I might not be taking it in if I didn't have a notebook, if I had no way of recording it as such other than remembering it. Like I have enough going on in my head <laughs> without having to remember what's happening, you know, when I'm out at the grocery store or when I go out and get sushi or something, <laughs> that sort of thing. Having a notebook facilitates the flow of 
ideas in a lovely way. So I highly recommend carry a notebook with you wherever you go, even around in the house. Yes, I carry mine around in the house because I never know when things are going to pop into my head. <laughs> so yes, notebook, tip number two. <laughs> tip number three, get back to basics and do it by hand. <laughs> Tip number three ties a bit into tip number two in that we, many of us have phones. They're very convenient for, you know, notes and pictures and stuff like that. And th yeah, they're very good. And I do use mine occasionally for taking pictures of things that are inspirational and whatnot, but I still carry my notebook because it has actually been shown like research wise that handwriting is good for your brain. Now, I don't know for sure, but I imagine that hand sketching, that, like that's an extension. So I want this to, it's not just the writers I'm speaking to, it's, it's the artists as well. So by doing things by hand, you're actually, you know, lighting up bits of your brain that you may or may not have used for quite a while. I would type all day long. You know, I love how fast it is. I love how convenient it is. Um, but when it comes to inspiration and brainstorming and when I feel stuck in my novel, when I, even the show notes for the, uh, for the podcast. Now, if you're listening to the podcast, you won't see this, but on the YouTube video, I'm just, uh, holding up. I, I write my notes. I write my speaking points and things like that because there, for me, there is a connection. There's a better, you know, brain connection. It's better for my memory to handwrite than it is to type because I can remember making that tea or scribbling that out or, or stuff like that. There, there is a connection, there is memory, there's all sorts of things and things that I probably, I should have found more articles in <laughs> so I could list them out. But it has been shown that handwriting, that doing things by hand is good for your brain. When it comes down to it, writing on a piece of paper, drawing on a piece of paper, that is my default setting. It, it, it always has and it always will be. So, I mean, even when it comes to zines, I get to this, I often get to this point where I need to do something by hand. Like I can type up the words, but I will print them off on adhesive paper so I can actually still do the cut and paste side of things because I need that action of doing things by hand, by cutting, of cutting things by hand, that, that sort of level of creativity to make me feel really connected with my creative self. And it inspires me to do more. Like having done all the pages of a zine, it's kind of a pain in the bum, in my opinion, <laughs> to have to scan them all in and stuff like that. But then I've done it and I have those pages and I love just flipping through the master copies of things and it makes me happy in it. It makes me want to make more and yeah, I think it just feeds, it feeds the inspiration train. <laughs> I wasn't going to say train, but I thought, you know, go all in, go all in. <laughs> So if you are feeling tired or disconnected or just somehow a step away from your zines or your other creative endeavors, try doing it by hand. Try doing it uh, if you're digital, try doing it on paper, that sort of thing. Try, try doing it in a more basic sort of way and see if that helps inspire and reconnect you to your art. Tip number four for finding inspiration is find inspiring people. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to be particularly surprised by this tip from me as I do tend to uh, go on about how inspiring people are in a uh, general sense. <laughs> but blogs, YouTube, Pinterest, podcasts, Instagram, there are all sorts of people out there doing all sorts of things and they're sharing it online it's for you to find, for you to look at, for you to enjoy. There are so many cool things out there, so many cool projects. Like there, I will never have the time to do all of the projects I have on my want to do someday projects list just because there's so much cool and fun stuff to do online. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with the like, 
specific thing you're looking at. Like if you're looking at painting, if you're looking at making a zine, you don't necessarily have to stick to inspiring zine makers. You could find inspiring crafters. You can find inspiring um, uh, speeches and stuff like that. Sorry, I had a, a little brain freeze, but I was trying to think of TED Talks because T-E-D Talks, and I'll have a link in the description, of course. TED Talks are so inspiring and there are talks on all sorts of things, all sorts of things. And it's just absolutely amazing and fascinating. And there was this one on how smart crows are and that sort of thing. And I don't do anything necessarily with crows. But just finding something that I find fascinating, it just gets me pumped up. It, it gets me going. It gets my energy high up. And I get ready and raring to go on what it, the other thing I was doing that's not related to crows. <laughs> now I really hope I can find that TED Talk and have the link in the description. But I can't remember the number of times that I've either gone to my favorite creators or found new people who have inspired me in so many different ways. Uh, C Lemon on YouTube pops into mind immediately as one of my favorite YouTubers because she does so many crafty things and there's all of her videos are like tutorials how to do the thing and she'll update tutorials if they're not clear and she'll update tutorials on you know this is how I'm doing things and all sorts of things. She paints and she makes notebooks and, and I learned how to Coptic stitch from her videos and that sort of thing. Um, I, I'm actually working on a, um, a zines video playlist on my YouTube channel just because I like seeing what people are saying and doing, saying about and doing with zines and that sort of thing. Like inspiration everywhere. And oh, Pinterest. Pinterest is Pinterest is Pinterest. <laughs> I think you may either love it or hate it, but if you want to quickly find like whole walls of inspiration posts and videos and stuff like that, like type in something there and just oof, go away, cause, go with it. Cause wow, like plug in those search terms and surf those hashtags and just inspiration everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> Tip number five for finding inspiration is move your body. <laughs> I imagine that a lot of you are like me in that you've heard this tip before and kind of pushed it aside like, oh, yep, yeah, that's that's something I should do, but never really got around to it. I, I personally put it in the, the do later box, which is the mental box where I keep all the things that I'm never really going to get around to. <laughs> <laughs> it took a stay in the hospital for me to realize just how much I wasn't moving. I wasn't getting out. I wasn't enjoying fresh air or trees or sunshine or that sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure. I heard this statistic a while ago, so I'm not sure if it's currently still the thing, but Australians for being in such a sunny country have such a hard time with vitamin D which is, you know, vitamin D, sunshine, that sort of thing. We're not getting out. We're not taking it all in. And I, I understand that. Like, like I said, I was there. I was, you know, comfortable and inside and temperature controlled and, <laughs> and everything like that. But when I stayed in the hospital, um, I got, I finally got to this point where I was, wandering more and stuff like that and when I did wander and I I was so ready to hug the first tree I saw and that wasn't even very like at the end of the day this is about like halfway through and I got outside and I saw trees and I'm telling you like this close to <laughs> hugging trees I was just so happy to be around trees to be in fresh air to sit on the grass to just feel the sun on my skin. It was absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Like I had a sneezing fit, like I get hay fever and allergies and stuff like that. So that's definitely, you know, part of the, <laughs> if you heard that, sorry, that's wanderer sneezing in the background. Anyway, so I have allergies and stuff like that. And I had a sneezing fit. I had a huge sneezing fit, but it didn't, 
I don't want to say it didn't matter, but basically it didn't stop me because I realized how grateful I was for the breeze and the sun warming my skin and everything like that. And I, and I realize, and I know, and I acknowledge that outside can be a very scary thing. Like I have been there, trust me. Uh, but it's not just, it's not just about getting outside. A large, I think a large part of it, at least for me personally, is definitely getting outside and, you know, feeling the sun and that sort of thing. But it's also about moving because when you're not moving, you start, you know, shallow breathing and shallow breathing can feed into a lot of, you know, negative things, you know, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera. But start moving this deep breaths, you know, shoulders back deep breath. That is moving. That's like, okay, that wasn't a great deep breath, but I wasn't (laughs) meaning to do breathing exercises, but breathe, dance, stretching. Stretching feels so good. I mean, not always if you're sore and stuff, like I've got, I've got bursitis in my shoulders. So yeah, stretching isn't always, but stretching and moving and using your body in whatever ways you are able to can be so good, is so good for your muscles, for you, your mindset. Like, get outside if you can, of course, and just take it in, disconnect a little bit from the technology and the temperature control, and I know how comfortable it is, believe me. It's so easy to get comfortable in whatever our current bubble is. Our current bubble may not be great, but it's our current bubble, and it's what we know, and Thus, even discomfort can be comfortable. But the thing about that is comfortable, comfort rarely feeds inspiration. And that's just the way it is. (laughs) Tip number six for finding inspiration is refilling the well. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, that's because this tip comes courtesy of the artist's way by Julia Cameron. I hope I'm pronouncing I mean, I'm, it's Cameron, but I hope I'm not somehow saying that wrong. But yes, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, Refilling the Well. The core concept of this, uh, or at least what I feel the core concept is of refilling the well, maybe not the core concept, but an important thing to take from this is that not creating is just as important as creating. Taking time away is just important as making time for. Now, I will explain myself if that's (laughs) in any way confusing. I think I've made it pretty clear at this point that I really love zines. I adore zines, like I literally pet zines. I was going to say not in a weird way, but I don't think there is a way for that not to be weird. (laughs) So I love zines, but even I need a break from reviewing and that sort of thing. That's, That's why I'm not doing this podcast weekly, because I don't want to burn out. Even fortnightly is pushing it a little bit. Now, please don't take that the wrong way. I'm not going to just please don't take that in a negative way. I'm just I'm trying to be honest and clear. You can have something that you absolutely adore doing, but, and I've learned this all too clearly recently, if you do that all day, every day, there is burnout. And even if you don't think they don't feel a a burnout sort of thing, it's not, not really healthy to just do it all day, every day, that sort of thing. I mean, obviously some of us would have things that they would love to be able to just stop the other things to be able to do it all day every day but what I'm trying to say is that everybody needs a break even from zines I will get ahead on zine reviews just so I have a couple of reviews in my pocket and that way I can take a week off because I need that and it's not necessarily that I feel this desperate need to have a break it's because I I don't fear, but I don't ever want to be burned out when it comes to zines. I don't want to ever feel burned out. And so I'm careful, at least 
in the realm of zine reviews to not push that too hard, to take breaks for other things that I like doing, other things that make me feel relaxed or inspired or that sort of thing. Like I, I, I like PC games, PC games, <laughs> I said that a little bit weird, didn't I? I like computer gaming. I like going for walks and playing with a dog and talking to Wanderer and, you know, occasionally going out for trying a new coffee or something like that. I like working on my novel. I like uh, watching silly shows. That sort of things that make me laugh. The, all of those are very important for me. That's It's important to take time <laughs> it sounds weird to say that it's important to take time away from the things you love, but it is important. I mean, it's important in relationships as well, to have distance as well as closeness. It's Your relationships with other people are similar to your relationships with, with your art. And refilling the well is about doing things and filling that well of inspiration Refilling the well comes down to taking the time, especially, especially if you've just done a big project, to do the things you enjoy. Fill that well up with fun, with play, with love, and you'll find it also fills with energy and inspiration for what it is you want to do when you get back to doing it. I do hope that made sense. I, I know it was a bit, a little bit rambly and a little bit, <laughs> once I, I have my talking points, but once I get uh, going on things, sometimes I go ways that I didn't expect. <laughs> so far, I have given you six things to do to help find inspiration. But for number seven, the very last tip, I have something to not do to help you feel inspired. <laughs> and that is tip number seven, don't compare. Comparison is the thief of joy. That is a quote from Theodore Roosevelt that I think of whenever I start looking at people's zines and thinking, oh, they're cooler than mine, they're so much more talented than me, or they're more successful than me, or they're skill more skilled than me that in whatever area that sort of thing the list goes on and on and on so while comparison is the thief of joy I also see it as the destroyer of inspiration it, I mean it's hard to feel inspired if you're knocking yourself down about something that you haven't even started making yet if you are wanting to draw something and you see someone who you feel is so skilled at drawing like yes there are people who can take comparison and use that as a motivator like I can do that I can get that skilled I can learn the skills I can uh, they they use comparison as some sort of uh, competitive motivation that sort of thing but in my own personal experience that kind of motivation fizzles out pretty quickly and it all too quickly comes to becomes not motivation but just yet another way to ne negative self-talk and even procrastinate really it is a method of procrastination just to sit and endlessly compare yourself and give yourself all the reasons to not do a thing you will always 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 have reasons to not do the thing like it's not just comparison the the tip is don't compare but you will always have a million reasons to not do the thing you need to desire you don't have to love, you don't always have to love, but the desire and the motivation needs to be there so you can take that list of reasons to not do the thing and put it aside. And comparison is just another one of those things, unless it's inspiring you, like look at things that inspire you, but when you start getting into, oh, I can't do that, when it starts becoming that negative thing, there is enough negativity in the world. There is enough of all of that, basically. There is enough. 
without inviting more in. So look, take in, be inspired, but the moment it starts turning negative, put it away, put it aside, because it is not helping you and you won't, <laughs> you won't do the thing, you won't learn the skills if you are too busy comparing yourself to someone else. So those are my seven tips for finding inspiration. I hope you find them useful. I hope you uh, <laughs> find them inspiring. <laughs> Is that, that not quite a pun, but kind of a pun? Because <laughs> Is there anything I miss? Is there anything that you do or watch or anything to find inspiration, to get inspiration, to feel inspired, that sort of thing? please let me know in the comments. If you're listening to the podcast, you can go out to the blog and leave a comment there or go onto YouTube and find the video and leave a comment there. Or if you're on YouTube, you know, comment section below, <laughs> that sort of thing. But yeah, let me know in the comments. I'm always looking for inspiration. If you know of zine videos, I can add to the zine playlist. That definitely be welcome. All sorts of things. Now we come to the Q&A section of the podcast where I answer one question each episode. Questions from you or frequently asked questions. Either one. And it hasn't quite been every episode so far, but uh, working on it and <laughs> getting back into the swing of things. This week's question is, are you up for trades? And the answer is yes, absolutely. I love trades. I love zine trades. I highly encourage people to do zine trades. I feel like it's a really important part of zine culture and it's something that I really, really don't want to see uh, go by the wayside even though postage costs are postage costs. I love trading for all sorts of things. I like um, perzines and self-help and health, especially women's health, reproductive health. I like educational. I like learning about things. I greatly, greatly appreciate anything like humorous, anything that makes me laugh, makes me smile. It's really, you know, a special, special little part of my heart <laughs> or anything that can make me smile. Um, so yes, I'm up for trades. Uh, if I'm not up for trades, the only time, the only thing that really stops me is overseas postage costs. They can be difficult, but again, it's not so much not being up for trades. It's more like a delayed trade sort of thing that I might need a while to save up for the cost. But yeah, definitely um, don't be shy. Get in contact. So yes, I'm up for trades. <laughs> If you have any questions about zines, zine reviewing, me, that sort of thing, feel free to send a question. I'm on Tumblr, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, that sort of thing. Those aren't listed in preference. I just always think of Tumblr because Tumblr is where you can ask anonymous questions. So yeah, I, I am around. I'm on various platforms. So if there's anything you'd like to know, just uh, let me know and I will put it in an episode. <laughs> Next up, we have Sharing is Caring, which is my little non-sponsored segment where I share something I love that is out happening in the zine-verse. And this week, it is my pleasure to let you know about its pronounced zine. <laughs> wow, th this is one of those things that I, I could swear that I must have already done this in Sharing is Caring. So if I have, like I checked over and I am nearly absolutely convinced that I haven't already done this but you know there's always a chance so sorry if this is a, re a repeat but it's my pleasure to talk about It's Pronounced Zine. It's Pronounced Zine is a podcast presented by Meltdown Comics in Los Angeles and is hosted by the amazing very skilled Dave Baker. It's been going since I believe uh, let's see, June 2016. Don't quote me on that because I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's when it started. And it has well over 30 episodes. I think they're coming up to 40, but again, don't quote me. I had to do a lot of research on my phone. <laughs> that sort of thing. Dave Baker is a very funny, energetic host who interviews all sorts of people involved in zines, comics, all that, all those scenes and stuff like that, up and down West Coast, that sort of thing, uh, of the States, obviously. Uh, 
there is a there is a strong leaning towards the comics side of things, but a not complaining, <laughs> and b there is still so much zine love, a lot of zine fest talk, that sort of thing. It's absolutely gorgeous. I love listening to it. I've been listening to it since, oh gosh, it's been a while. It's been very inspiring for me. It's yeah, it's great. Check it out. Have a listen. The interviews do tend to be on the longer side, but that is definitely a great way to uh, while away an afternoon or have something to listen to on a long walk or a long ride home or something like that. Anything like that. Definitely check it out. It's fun. Dave talks to a lot of interesting people and yeah, now I want all of the all of the things Dave makes and all of the things that all of the people Dave talks to you make. <laughs> I've met a lot of great people thanks to um listening to the podcast and then following their social media links as well. So that has been a very good experience, a great way to way to connect with people. So yeah, definitely check it out. It's pronounced zine. Links will be in the description. But yeah, you can look up It's Pronounced Zine. It's on iTunes and I think Blog Talk Radio and Meltdown Comics actually has a website which has posts for the interviews and all sorts of things. So I listen to it on Pocket Casts. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few different <laughs> things now, but yeah. Well, that is it for today, Zine friends. Thank you again so much for joining me, for listening. Like all, like, all the comments that have been coming in have been so fantastic and made me feel so good and inspired me to keep pushing forward and and it's it's not always easy, easy with the things that you love, but yeah. It helps to have such wonderful people and suggestions coming in. Like, I have such a long list of show suggestions, so we're definitely going to keep going for a while, that's for sure. Remember that everything I say is just my opinion. There are no gatekeepers in the Zineverse, nor should there be. Links to everything I talked about uh, today are in the description. They're always in the description. I do listen to the podcast through to try to make sure I catch every name, every link, that sort of thing. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. The music for this podcast, Spanish Summer by Audionautics, is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution License. This is the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Until next time, go make some zines. Mwah! I don't know what's put in this spa. I don't know what's put in this spa. <laughs> oh, she's back. <laughs> You're listening to The Zine Collector, Episode 8 Zines of Every Flavor Genres in the Zine World. Hello zine friends, welcome to the Zine Collector or welcome back. I'm your host Jamie Nix. Let's talk about zines. I have a bit of a long one for you today so I think I'll uh, just jump right into it. At least I think it's a long one obviously, I'm starting recording, but uh, going by the pile of zines I have on my desk currently, yeah, I think it's going to be a long one. <laughs> Speaking of today's episode, I'd like to start off with a little note, a shout out to Carrie Mercer, who is a fellow zine maker and also writes for Xerography Debt. I have to thank her today because she is the one who suggested the topic. So thank you, Carrie. It's always helpful to have, a, I have a whole big list of topics, but it's always good to know what people want to hear about, that want me to talk about if I have the knowledge to do so. I mean, there's always research, of course. <laughs> oh, goodness. Off to a roaring start as per usual. Let's see. I only had um, one little note here, feedback on last week's episode. Last week, I talked about seven tips for 
uh, getting slash finding inspiration. And one of the things I mentioned was stop comparing. Stop comparing your work, what you do to other people. And on Facebook, Zippity Zendra mentioned how hard it can be to get out of that comparison mindset. And I completely agree. I completely agree. I'm right there with you. Things are always easier said than done. Even with the other tips, like carrying a notebook with you everywhere, that involves a decision, that involves commitment. It all involves energy. And like I said, usually things are easier said than done. Comparison, I think, can be a really tricky one because we do it in a lot of different ways. And I think a lot of the time we don't even realize we're doing it. It's not just looking at each other and judging how we look and things like that. There are little things like that you might not think about in terms of like in school, you may have gone, oh, am I doing this right? And looked over to see what the other kids are doing, that sort of thing. And that's a form of comparison as well. So when you've grown up with this since childhood and that sort of thing, it can be such a tricky thing. So don't be hard on yourself if you catch yourself doing it. All of this comes down to awareness and practice. For me, it comes down to the language I use with myself. It's a difference between, I wonder if I can learn how to do that, or I wonder how they did that and investigating, and I will never be that good, or I'll never be able to do that, that sort of thing. There's inquisitive, there's using comparison to inspire and motivate you, and then there's the negative side using it to keep yourself down, using it to procrastinate. So be aware of, try to be aware of the way you talk to yourself. I find that a lot of the nicest people are um, very mean, <laughs> maybe that's strong, but very uh, negative, negative self-talk, that sort of thing. They're not negative people, but they don't, treat themselves nicely. They don't give themselves credit. They don't, those, those sorts of things. So before I get into an entire, entire episode on that topic, be nice to yourself. Okay. Be nice to yourself. <laughs> give yourself some slack and believe you me, if you're struggling with it, don't be hard on yourself because I am right there with you. Uh, at the anxiety clinic, uh, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, be kind to yourself or be patient with yourself, well, you know, I'd be doing pretty well at the moment. So yes, I'm right there with you. So now let's move on and find out what kind of zany things are happening around the world. Now, keep in mind, this is a short list. I've just, in, with no particular preference, picked and chosen a few things. So here we go. Happening over the next fortnight. On April 26th in Eugene, Oregon, we have the UO Zine Fest. In, on April 27th in, and I'm probably going to mispronounce this, Quito or Quito, Ecuador, we have Noche de Fanzines. On April 28th in Madison, Wisconsin, we have the Madison Print and Resist Zine Fest. Also on April 28th in Brussels, Belgium, we have the Oh goodness, I didn't think about this before I <laughs> chose it. The Plan Comet. It's a zine event <laughs> happening in Brussels on April 28th. Plan Comet. It's C-O-M-E-T-E. -E. There is an emphasis on the first E. So please forgive me. All of these are in the zine calendar. You can have a look yourself because, yeah, I didn't think that one through. Sorry about that. On April 28th as well, in Copenhagen, Denmark, we have the Small Press CPH. Also on April 28th, in Malaga, Spain, we have Taller Day Fanzines. On April 28th and 29th, in Budapest, Hungary, we have something I definitely can't pronounce whatsoever. It's a zine fest, Budapest, Hungary. On May 3rd, we have uh, Zine Baby, monthly zine making night happening in Katoomba, New South Wales in Australia. On May 5th, we have Chattanooga Zine Fest, Tennessee, in Chattanooga. <laughs> I'm just realizing um, I've copied it from the calendar and it says Chattanooga Zine Fest on May 5th in Chattanooga Zine Fest, Tennessee. Now, I do believe it's just Chattanooga, Tennessee. <laughs> 
<laughs> what a name though, right? Also on May 5th in Madrid, Spain, we have the Mini Peachy. Or I think it's going to be Mini Peachy. It's P-I-C-H-I. The Mini P-I-C-H-I Fest in Madrid, Spain on the 5th. On May 5th and 6th in Ghent, Belgium, we have the Zine Happening 4. And on May 6th in Manchester, UK, we have a Northwest Scene Fest. I like that. <laughs> I like the rhymey sort of stuff. The Northwest Scene Fest. <laughs> and there is a lot more when that where that came from. If you'd like a direct line to zine events around the world or to make sure that your zine event is listed, check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook. Links will be in the description. As I mentioned before, in the last episode, I talked about inspiration, finding it and, and encouraging it to be in your life. And I see this episode as an extension of that in, in certain ways. It's all fine and well to say that zines can be anything, they can be about anything, they can do anything, that sort of thing. But if you're like me and you like some solid ideas to work with, exploring zine genres can be great for inspiration as well as ideas for organization if you want to organize your zine collection, which is something that's on my to-do list, <laughs> that's for sure. So what is a genre? Basically, it's a classification or a grouping system. It's not anything special or particular. It's, um, you know, you could call them genres, you could call them categories, so on and so forth. But don't be confused between genre and format. Zines are your format. Literary, literary zines, poetry zines, that sort of thing. That is your genre. Those are your genres, amongst others, of course. <laughs> The first three groups I'd like to talk about as far as zines go wouldn't necessarily be a way you'd want to organize your zines. But I figured I wanted to start with them because I feel like as far as the, the zine making side of things, it's a, it's a great beginner place to start here to start figuring out what you want to do. I mean, you may already know what you want to do, but if you're starting from square one, this could be a good place for you on the maker side of things. And those three groups are one-person zines, split zines, and collab zines. Now, I may be covering old bases. I may be covering something you definitely well and truly are already familiar with. But again, with this podcast, I don't want to ever assume anyone's level of ability or knowledge when it comes to zines. So that's why I'm starting with what's a genre and uh, these sorts of basics. So... Starting off, we have your single author scene. This is obviously just one person, what you're going to do, what you write, you take care of a lot of the stuff. I mean, you might hire a, a cover author, <laughs> cover author, cover artist, that sort of thing, but the writing and the content inside is primarily you. The example I have here in front of me is Small Potatoes, a Perzine by Kira. They make a Persian series that I really love. And yeah, Kira handles everything from the cover art to everything that's inside. So yes, that's your single person zine. Next up, I'm going to go to the collab zine. Collab is short for collaboration. You have two or more people coming together and um, creating something usually under a theme. I have seen people make zines on all sorts of topics. Sometimes it's it's open theme, sometimes it's about a health condition, sometimes it's a certain kind of art or a certain kind of poetry or anything like that. It's it's really up to you, but the collab part is about more than one person. Now the example I have in front of me is Lost Projects issue 3 and the theme, if you hadn't guessed, of this zine is Lost Projects. Things that went unfinished or were lost to time or all kinds of things like that. It's an idea that I really really love and it's <laughs> what popped into mind when I thought of a collab zine. Now split zine, you might think of would have been the natural progression between single author and collab zine, but it's a little bit of a tricky one. Uh, split zines are usually between two people or two groups or that sort of thing. However, a split zine can be one author. Now the example I have here, and uh, forgive me for using my own zines as an example, but I have my dreams and nightmares zine. 
And the fun thing about split scenes is usually you hold it in your hands one way, and then if you just flip it forward, the back will be the right way up. As in, <laughs> probably not explaining this very well for the podcast, but in the first half, it'll be the text will be in one direction, and the second half, it'll be in another direction, effectively splitting the zine, but also, you know, keeping it together. So I wanted to make uh, a split scene because I felt the theme of dreams had the natural component of nightmares as well, the natural other side of the coin, hence the split. But yes, more traditionally split scenes are between two people, or more, or two groups, that sort of thing. So yes. <laughs> So now that we have the number of people involved out of the way as a way to get yourself started, do you want to work with somebody else or do you want to work by yourself for this scene, that sort of thing, we get into the actual genres of zines. Now I'm going to try to cover quite a few genres just to get your mind going and encourage you to look at genres and things like that for inspiration as well as finding things you love. However, this is definitely not going to be an all-encompassing sort of list. It definitely could be. I could go on for a long time, but I don't want this episode to be super, super long. So, <laughs> yes, this is this is a primer. It's a starter. It's, it's things like that. And when it comes to zine classification, it can be particularly difficult, but we'll get to that a little later, later on. <laughs> So in no particular order, let's start talking about zine genres. Now, with it being the year of the Perzine, I thought it only appropriate to start with Perzines. I think of Perzines in three ways. You have the variety slash scrapbook Perzine, which is like life stuff, but it can have art and, and other things as well. You have the diary zine, which is usually more somebody's written in their journal and basically photocopied it, like photocopied it right out, or just typed. It's more journal, it's more text, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Again, zines, a lot of wiggle room for this sort of thing. And the third is the more slice of life thing. It's usually very short, a page, two pages. It's, um, it's very, very much like the diary side of things. And it's usually for cheap or for free. The examples I have in front of me for the the example for variety slash scrapbook scene I have in front of me is the stay at home girlfriend number 22. Now this I think is a great example of a, of a variety per zine because it has pictures and it has a music playlist in the back. It has recipes and TV show reviews as well as actual, you know, per zine writing about things. And I just, I love the variety in it. I love what Miss Muffcake, um, that is who makes the stay-at-home girlfriend, um, what Miss Muffcake uh, decides to share and all that sorts of things. So this is, like I said, a great example of more firmly on the variety side of thing rather than like text only, that sort of thing. Now the example of a, a diary zine is not like strictly diary zine. But I think Doris, the, uh, the Persian series Doris, is a really good example of something that's a little bit more on the diary side of things. Just because there's a lot more text, there's a lot more, it's focusing on thoughts, there's not really any um, poetry, at least not in the, ep uh, in the episode. <laughs> in the issue I have, there's no poetry in here, it's mostly text, that sort of thing. There are, it's not like straight text. There are pictures, there are little comics and things like that. Anyone who has checked out the Doris series, and I highly recommend you do, um, would see that there's all kinds of little drawings and sketches and things which make it really lovely, but it's definitely, whereas the stay-at-home girlfriend is more firmly on the variety side of things, Doris is um, closer to the uh, diary side of things. So last up on the slice of life scenes, now that's my phrase for it is something, it's kind of a, a name that I've been trying to look for because I've been calling them the, the free zine and they're not always free and I shouldn't assume they're always free, that sort of thing. But the example I have in front of me right now is $50 minimum by Sober Bob. Now I'm not going to show insides, but I can show you that it's one A4 page that has been cut into two and then those two pieces are sliced together so you end up with, you know, 
a short but you know a good read that sort of thing and um yeah it's slice of life because it's primarily text um sober bob does occasionally add a picture or two but it's kind of more of the moment i mean you could call it an of the moment zine but again those aren't always that's not always the case so yes if you have a suggestion suggestion that's better than slice of life scene please please let me know because yeah i'm not really not 100 percent satisfied with calling it that either but yeah it's um it's very diary style but again it, it's it's thinner it's usually uh sent out on a mailing list that sort of thing and yeah think your holiday catch-up letter except it happens more often than once a year that sort of thing <laughs> So next up on the list of genres, we have the lit zine or literature zine. Now this covers your fiction, your nonfiction, your poetry, your personal essays, and things like that. What your lit zine or lit zines you're looking at contain is very much up to the person putting it together. Or I'm, I must admit, I have to back up a little bit there. That's kind of uh, implying that lit zines are always collaborative. They are definitely not. One of the examples I have in front of me right now is a poetry zine, single author, that I enjoyed very much. And if you know me, it's hard for me to... <laughs> It's a little bit hard for me to understand poetry a lot of the time, so having a poetry zine that I uh, enjoyed a lot was quite a lovely surprise. So I have Diary of a Lavender Plant by Ray White, single author, and yeah, it's just, uh, I won't get distracted looking through it, but that's the example of a poetry zine. It is a lit zine because it's poetry, that sort of thing. Like literature zine is the umbrella and poetry zines fall underneath that. Now, the reason that um, collaborative literature zines are on my mind is mostly because I have had quite a few people mention looking for literature zines to submit to, and I don't really, I have been at a little bit of a loss of where to send them, so if you have a literature zine and you are looking for submissions, please get in contact with me. I will be very happy to shout out your call for submissions or your open doors, that sort of thing. Because, yeah, a few people have approached me and, and I felt really bad because I'm not quite um, sure where to send them in, that, in regards to that. But another example I have of the collaborative uh, literature zine is something I reviewed recently and that's a literature zine called Submerging. Now, Submerging is made up of some photography as well, but primarily four essays about the fragility of the mind and the body which was very interesting. So yes, these are personal essays. Ray White zine was poetry. It's, you can really have any combination. Hand job zine, that series comes to mind. That's um, a lot of short pieces, but I, leave, but I believe they incorporate poetry as well. The next genre I'm going to talk about is fanzines. Now, some people would argue that zines started with the science fiction fanzines of the 19... 40s 20s 20s 40s something like that and yeah i'm i've outed myself as not being a zine historian uh, <laughs> anyway fanzines fanzines it's basically dedicated to what you love do you love a movie a tv show a game whatever you want you can make a fanzine about that one of the examples I thought I had in front of me that I don't, that I'm a little bit disappointed that I don't have in front of me was Laura Bibby's um, Strictly Ballroom uh, mini fanzine and it was absolutely gorgeous. There's such, it was full color, it was a lot of good energy and it's basically Laura talking about watching the movie, re-watching the movie, what she loved about it, that sort of thing. I do have another uh, fanzine in front of me by Holly Cassio, I believe, and, sorry, Holly Cassio and Selena, and they made My Mad Fat Zine, which is a fanzine for My Mad Fat Diary. Now, I have a list here, actually, of all the things, not all of the things, they have 
character introductions and analyzing the characters, the importance of the show's topics in media and in life in general. They even talk about the set and the 90s feel of the show and even propose like things that possibly happened to the characters after the show ended, which I really loved. I thought that was taking it to a, a next level. So if you want to have a look at a fanzine that really covers all the bases, my mad fat um, zine by Holly Cassio and Selena. Selena, oh goodness, I don't have a, a last name, but I will have links in the description. So yes, fanzines are your way of shouting to, <laughs> shouting to anyone who listens, who will listen about this TV show, this movie, this celebrity, etc. This thing that you love. I mean, one could argue that zines about zines are zines that are made for the love of zines. So if you had a zine about zines, it would be a fanzine zine zine. Sorry. <laughs> I got a little bit distracted there. Let's let's ignore that and move on. So yes, fanzines for the love of the thing you love. <laughs> Next up we have political zines, and political zines are a really big part of zine history. You can have zines about political parties, you can have zines that explore political philosophies, you can break down um, po politics geographically, you can have, you know, Australian politics or US politics or European politics, and, and apologies if you're insulted by, by being in Europe and me grouping you, that sort of thing, but yeah, um, obviously politics change from region to region, country to country, and you can break it down that way. And there are even zines that propose, apologies, I just hit my mic. See, I'm getting excited and I'm waving my hands around and that's what happens. <laughs> but yes, you can even have um, zines that are, that are out there proposing new political systems and new ways of doing things that way. I am a little bit sad that I can't find any of my specific political zines in my collections. So if you do have any political zines that you recommend, please put them in the comments. I'm interested to find more political zines and I'm sure that there are other people who are interested in finding political zines as well. For the next genre, I'm kind of grouping together three, zine, three types of zines that are definitely deserve each their own space, but they're all more on the visual side of things, which is why I'm, I'm sort of putting them together. And that they are photography zines, art zines, and comics. Now the examples I have in front of me are Photography Zine, Alone in a New City by Alicia Weber. Now Alicia does black and white photography, and I love black and white photography, but yeah, I mean these categories are fairly self-explanatory. With photography, you can have black and white or color. I feel like with these particularly more visual than text sort of thing, you get a little bit more emphasis on the kind of papers used, that sort of thing. That's not always the case, but I feel like papers and mediums can bring more to these more visually oriented zines. Now for an example of an art zine, I have Portraits Issue 1 by Chloe Henderson. Now this is text and art, but it's a very nice art zine. I do like looking, I mean people are so skilled. <laughs> but I will close that zine before I get distracted and start. <laughs> looking into it. And the example I have for a comic scene is Everything Dies number 7 by Box Brown. Now this is a comic with minimal writing in it and it looks at, um, Everything Dies looks at popular myths. Everything Dies 7 is about the flood myth. Really really love this scene. So yes, they are all fairly self-explanatory. Um, yeah, I don't um, have much to add on that category. Obviously, if you have any questions, go to the comments. <laughs> the next genre I'd like to talk about is another one of those ones that's kind of an umbrella that, that covers a lot of other things, and that's educational zines. Now with educational zines, you can have how-tos and DIYs and 101 and all of that sort of thing. It goes from your um, your recipes to your self-help, self-care, self-help, <laughs> health, all of those sorts of things. But it doesn't have to be 
all about body or anything like that. Like that, there's one a zine that I'm sad I didn't bring an example of, but it's called Let's Communicate, and it's a comic zine about how things interact in the universe down to the atomic level, and that might might sound boring. It shouldn't sound boring, but it might sound boring, but it was a really, really cool zine that really got me thinking, and I really love it. So yes, educational zines. The very first zine I ever bought, and so I wanted to grab this one as an example of a recipe book, is the Nutella cookbook. <laughs> this glorious zine actually helped me develop my peanut butter and Nutella bickies, my peanutellas. But yeah, so you have cookbooks, uh, recipe zines as part of your educational, under the educational um, umbrella. I recently received a zine from Shelly Saylor, I believe, called like 10 Weeds You Can Eat. That Again, that's an educational one. And on the health side of things, I wanted to have the example, or talk about the example of Joining the Dots, another zine by Holly Cassio. Now this was a zine I was so happy to find because I was struggling to find any zines about polycystic ovarian syndrome, something that affects me personally. So yeah, um, I guess Joining the Dots was um, on the physical side of things and Hello My Name Is by um, Miss Muffcake is a, a zine about living with mental illness and both Joining the Dots and Hello My Name Is were impactful on me personally in my life which is why I'm taking the opportunity to shout them out now but that's you always have to double check things when you are taking health advice and things like that now that's not to take away at all whatsoever from any educational zines you always need to check up it's just like anything else however these zines can be really helpful they can help people share their stories they can help people compare especially in a system where there are so many ways that um, medical systems where people aren't listened to so us helping teach each other we always have to be careful with the information, but we teaching each other can be amazing and powerful and important. Of course, there is always the tongue and cheek approach to the educational zine. For example, how to talk to your cat about abstinence. <laughs> oh, I really like this scene. I really like that. Um, yes, so it's not all serious. It's not all, I mean, you know, you should definitely take your cat's abstinence seriously. <laughs> okay, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> the next genre I want to talk about is the music zine. Now, music is also, like politics, um, music is also a big part of zine culture, and I don't talk about it nearly enough, and I don't review music zines nearly enough, but music zines are tied to the punk culture and punk is tied to zine culture and that's that's a whole episode in and of itself so needless to say music zines are a very big part of zine culture and the example I have in front of me right now is the screever now music zines usually cover um, your local music scene bands, musicians, more stuff like that, things like that, excuse me, I'm getting a bit tongue-tied. The Screever is definitely one of my favorites because it has, it has reviews and interviews and articles. It's, it's about music, but it also touches on zine stuff because zine, again, is tied in with punk culture and punk music. And in the back, there are some puzzle pages and I like puzzles, <laughs> especially Sudoku. <laughs> So yeah, The Screever, it's a great example of a music scene, and it's also a great example of showing that you don't necessarily have to stick to one genre within a zine. You have the flexibility. Don't get, don't feel, try not to feel intimidated by this list. This is not a list of rules. These are just ideas for you. The next genre I'd like to talk about is another one of those big umbrellas in which, under which there are a lot of subcategories. Now the umbrella is sex and sexuality zines. 
And like I said, this covers a lot of th a lot of scenes. You have your uh, sex fiction and your erotica writing, your erotic comics, that sort of thing. And you also have nonfiction about sex. Um, none, nothing springs to mind just yet, but if you have any of those zines, I'm definitely interested in checking them out. You have your health scenes, you know, you have queer health, trans health, non-binary health, that, and, and things about that. Um, to perhaps oversimplify it, but to simplify it, you have zines that are about being queer, trans, non-binary, but also zines that might not, might be about something else completely, but they are by and or for um, supporting queer, trans, and non-binary zine makers or art makers, that sort of thing. You also have uh, the health side of things as well. So this this one, this big umbrella is a bit big and a bit complicated and sort of things, but I did have a zine as an, I do have a zine as an example that I wanted to mention within this, and that is NB Life, designed and edited by uh, Ray White, but it is a collab zine. Yeah, they, it is um, stories, poetry, and art by non-binary people. Now this um, encompasses both sides of the <laughs> the possibly oversimplified ways I talked about it in that this is a zine with stories, poetry, and art by non-binary people about being non-binary. I think it's an excellent example of that. I really enjoy looking at it and I hope there is an NB Life 2 and 3 and that sort of thing because definitely sign me up for more copies. And last on my list of zine genres today is the zine about zines. The zine zine, <laughs> probably more accurately known as the meta zine. Now this category encompasses zines about how to make zines, about layout, zines about the history of zines, zines for the love of zines, and review zines as well. Now as you're probably expecting, the example I have for a review zine is Xerography Debt, which I've talked about at length, I think at length at this point. It is the review zine with per zine tendencies. And oh gosh, I have, this is issue four, th issue 39. I think they're up to like 44 now, but yes, anyway. I've made no secret that Xerography Debt has inspired my zine about zines, Paper Currency, which also has columns and zine reviews and a few other things like that. And another example I have, which I think is a great example of a zine about zines, is Davida Gypsy Briar's Metazine. This is a zine that I <laughs> discussed with Davida so I could get extra copies because I love giving this zine to other people to learn about zines, that sort of thing. And Davida covers like history of zines and how to make zines and why to make a zine and layout and binding, all of that in this one zine, meta zine. <laughs> so yes, I know at this point a lot of you are thinking, okay, a zine about zines, well then you have to mention Stolen Sharpie Revolution, don't you? Yes and no. Yes, I love Stolen Sharpie Revolution. It's an amazing, fabulous, fabulous um, resource. However, Alex Reck herself calls it a book, which is why I'm not placing a big emphasis on it as part of the zine genre. It is a book about zines and it is excellent and I highly recommend it. But yes, do remember that it is, as described by Alex herself, a book. <laughs> so there we have it. Plenty of zine flavors to get your mind going, but definitely not a full list. I've included some links in the description to places like zinelibraries.info for more comprehensive lists. You can look at them for inspiration or organizing your own zine collection, so on and so forth. I did suspect that this uh, episode was going to be very long, so apologies if, I f if it felt like I, I rushed through it all. I did want to cover a lot of things, but also I didn't want this episode to be very, very, very long and going by the time <laughs> 
that I already have that it's definitely going to be amongst my longer ones. So yes, I only, I definitely only really covered the basics here, but that's just it. They are basics. Zines are what you want them to be. You can combine these genres as desired. It Zines are amazing and wonderful and flexible in that way. You could have you could have anything. You could have the OCD guide to traveling in Japan on a budget. So what's that? That's a per zine, that's a travel zine, that's a mental health zine, all that sort of stuff. You could have the Anarchist Guide to Queer Healthcare, a comic. <laughs> so yeah, wouldn't that be brilliant, by the way? So yeah, you can you can mix, you can match, you combine. It's about you and what you want to do with your zine. Remember, these are only ideas. Did I miss anything? Did I miss your favorite genre? What zine in your collection combines the most, the widest variety of genres? Do you have a zine that just seems to have everything in it? Please let me know about it in the comments. I really like variety in zines. I, I, I love zines. I love zines that are about the thing they're about, and I love zines that are just all sorts of things. <laughs> yes, let me know in the comments. I'd love to check out zines with lots of wide variety. Now we come to the Q&A segment, where I answer one question from you each episode. This week's question was a bit of a tricky one, but it has come up quite a bit lately, so I figure it's about time that I answer it. And that is, how did you come to end up in Australia? And you'll have to forgive me, I'm going to try to put this in the simplest terms as possible, just to, I think you'll understand. Basically, I grew up in a dysfunctional situation that turned into a abus an abusive situation. And toward the end of it, the abusive side of it became very dangerous and very threatening to me. And the, the simple answer is, how did I end up, end up in Australia? I ran. I ran away. Wanderer literally saved my life in that when I ran, he made it possible that I could run all the way to Australia and finally have a true sense of safety and distance that I, I needed. Did I do it the right way? No, but um, it's hard to know what the right way is in those situations and I have no regrets. And now here I am doing a podcast and Australia has to keep me because I'm a citizen. <laughs> So yes, uh, there are obviously a lot more details where that comes from, but the simple answer is I ran away all the way to Australia <laughs> and here I am. So I apologize if that doesn't fully answer your question, but that's all I'm really comfortable with mentioning right now. I'll write a memoir someday, I promise. <laughs> if you have any questions about zines, zine reviewing, me, so on and so forth. You can definitely leave questions in the various comment sections. You can contact me on social media, all of that sort of thing. Anything you'd like to know, tweet at me, send me a message. <laughs> I am around. <laughs> now it's time for something a little bit more positive. <laughs> Yay! It is time for Sharing is Caring, my non-sponsored segment for zine spaces, places, and other things and people and all sorts that I am loving around the zineverse this fortnight. And it is my pleasure to introduce you this episode, Natalie Michelle Watson. Ta-da! <laughs> I really, really need some sound effects or something like that. Sober Bob mentioned Natalie on episode 5, but I've only recently had the pleasure of checking out Natalie's work and Natalie's YouTube channel. Now it's Natalie's YouTube Natalie's YouTube channel, excuse me, that really gave me the idea of um, featuring her on this segment of the Zine Collector because Natalie's 
channel introduction video, you go to, you look up Natalie, you go to her page on YouTube and the channel introduction video is the, the main one you see right in front of you. I laughed out loud. <laughs> oh my goodness. It is one of the funniest, warmest, just all around goofiest, great channel introduction videos I have ever seen. Natalie is funny and her videos are, are so colorful and it's just a great time. I I haven't watched all of her videos, but you can be guaranteed that I'm certainly going to. It has been so much fun and Natalie definitely doesn't take herself too seriously, which is always welcome. There are There is always room in the world for more people who are willing to have fun, goof around, share their sense of humor, that sort of thing. So definitely check out Natalie Michelle Watson. I'm being very careful because I've actually had to do a few takes because I keep screwing that up for some reason. Oh goodness. Check her out on Instagram, check her out on YouTube, and I will have links to both and more in the description. Well, that's it for today, zine friends. I have a feeling this is going to be a bit of a long episode, so I hope that you found it informational. I, found, I hope you found it enjoyable and all of that good stuff. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember that everything I say is just my opinion. There are no gatekeepers in the, the zine verse, nor should there be. Stumbling over my own word that I'm trying to make a thing. That's me. That's Nyx for you. <laughs> goodness. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for joining me. It's, um, these, these shows do take a little bit of energy out of me, but they've, they've been so fun and they've, conversations have been starting and it's been so, so brilliant in that way. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> Links to everything I've talked about today are in the description. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review scenes every Thursday and Friday. The music for this podcast, Spanish. See, I'm doing well. This is what I get for when I'm talking nonstop for over an hour. <laughs> the music for this podcast, Spanish Summer by Audionautics, is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution license. This is the Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nixon. Until next time, go make some zines. <laughs>
bear with and let's hope that uh, I last the show. <laughs> I do have water here though, so crossing fingers, knocking on wood, all of that good stuff. So let's start off with some notes and announcements because I actually have a couple for you this uh, this episode. I keep wanting to say this week, whenever I have, hesitate when I say this hesitation episode, it's because I want to say this week. Whereas I, I don't think I could keep up with a weekly show, <laughs> to say the least. But yes, now you know if there's ever a hesitation, it's because my instinct is to say week. But yes, fortnightly, fortnightly episodes. Anyway, <laughs> enough prattling on. First announcement for this episode is that the Zine Collector is now on iTunes. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> I can only apologize for it taking so long. I know someone requested it, oh gosh, quite a while back. And yeah, I'm sorry it took me so long to get there. I was trying to figure out a way to do it without actually signing up for iTunes. But yeah, that's just not the way it works. So I did it and here we are. And yeah, I'm actually, I'm very happy. Like, I'm not happy that I had to sign up for iTunes. Nothing against... Apple users or anything like that. It just, it wasn't, it's not a program I use. So to need to, anyway, I'll stop prattling on about that. But I'm very happy that it's done. I, I feel like now I've got uh, the podcast on quite a few apps. It's um, obviously through the Pippa website on, on online for tablets and stuff like that if you wanted to listen there. It's on Spotify and now with it being on iTunes I feel like it's um, as, as easy, probably as easy as it's going to get for anyone to listen to the show should, should they so choose to do. So, oh gosh. <laughs> oh, I feel like it's Monday all over again. <laughs> Uh, fun times, fun times. Um, yeah, I'm a bit scatterbrained today. It's, I think it's just one of those weeks. The weather has turned yet again. Australia seemed to be really confused about whether it wanted to be autumn or winter yet. Or summer. You know, there were definitely some tastes of summer, so. <laughs> but yeah, I think, uh, um, Mama Nature has made the decision to go full late autumn slash winter finally and so yeah I think that brings a bit of a brain fog for whatever reason to my mind. <laughs> I do have a couple of notes for you this episode and the first is a bit on the admin side of things but please check your email spam folders. I have been for reasons I have no idea. I no idea why, but I have been having a heck of a time with sending people emails and my emails going into spam folders. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure if I did something or didn't do something or what's going on. But yeah, a lot of my emails are, go are being missed, are going into spam folders. And this, yes, this is a please check your spam folders for my sake, but it's also for the sake of other people because um, I actually... Uh, got in touch with someone about my email possibly going into their spam folder and they checked and it was there and everything but because of that they checked with a friend of theirs who suddenly stopped communicating and it turned out that their last email went into the other person's spam folder and that's just what happened so yes as much as spam folders are often filled with you have one you know five million whatever the currency is for whatever country, uh, good things do get caught in spam folders. So please check your spam folders. To be honest, I will probably change my main email just for the sake of this whole situation not being a pain. But yes, check your spam folders anyway, because you never know. On another note, I wanted to say and related, but it's not really related. On another note, I am looking for calls for submissions. On seagreenzines.com, on, on Saturdays and Sundays, I post calls for submissions. I'll, I'll also do um, new project announcements, some um, GoFundMe announcements, uh, 
crowd fun- various crowdfunding, all that sort of thing. Like I'll announce that stuff too, but mainly I do calls for submissions. Uh, if you're looking for writing, for poetry, for, you know, that sort of thing. If you go to cgreenzines.com and look under the category of calls for submissions, you will get a plethora of examples to look at for various calls for submissions. But yes, if you would like another space for your call for submission for your project. It doesn't have to be anything specific. It can be, like I said, whether you're looking for poetry, whether you're looking for art or comics or writing or anything really, as long as it's zine related. <laughs> you know, it is seagreenzines.com. Uh, as always, links in the description. But yes, if you are looking for another place to get more eyes on your call for submissions, get in touch. Um, you can email me at cgreenzines at gmail.com. And that is the new one, not the troublesome one. <laughs> That's not my main one, but it is a backup one. So yes, I will have uh, that in the description as well if you want more eyes on your project. So yes, that is it for notes and announcements. Let's move on to zine events. What is happening around the world in zine events this coming fortnight? Oh gosh, golly gee. And do you know what I've done? Do you know what I've done? It's Monday, isn't it? The world has told me it's Tuesday and I think that it's Monday. See, what I usually do, I have my uh, a card here with zine events and I go to the zine world calendar and I print off or I grab whatever's happening in the next fortnight. I shrink it down so they're just enough to fit on one page and I stick it on my zine events card for the show and that way I can just read it off easy peasy, right? So what I've done is instead of May, I've gone for March. So all of the things I have listed here are <laughs> in March and thus have already happened. Oh gosh. Now what I could do is I could stop everything and I could go, oh, that's me taking the page off. I could go and I could print off a new sheet, so on, so forth, etc. But what I will do is say that there are plenty of zine events happening all around the world this fortnight, other fortnights in the future, and that sort of thing. So if you would like a direct line, if you would like to check out the calendar, if you would like to make sure that your zine event is listed in the calendar, check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook. They are the people, the person, sorry, who runs the world zine event calendar. It's a great resource. I highly recommend checking it out. So yes, at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook, they will lead you to the Google spreadsheet, which is serves as the zine world calendar. And I am so sorry about that. I don't know where my head was. <laughs> I really, um, yeah, I'm kind of a bit gobsmacked at myself at the moment. <laughs> but yes, I really would prefer just to keep moving on. So yes, I apologize for not reading out specific uh, events this fortnight, but uh, what can you do? <laughs> Goodness. Moving along. In the last episode, I talked about zine genres, and really it was just the tip of the iceberg kind of list to get your mind going for ideas and so on and so forth. In this episode, I'm going to chat about something that has been on my mind a bit since, really since before I started the podcast, and that topic is pen names. Nom de plume. Nom de plume. <laughs> Excuse me. When I started thinking about chatting about pen names, I thought of it more as a an advice for beginners sort of topic, but really it's not. While it marks the beginning or can mark the beginning of a project or a zine series or whatever else, you can take a pen name at any point. It doesn't matter your level of experience. You don't have to do it at the beginning. It's never too late as such to take on a pen name. I mean, depending on the situation, but I won't get into specific hypotheticals. <laughs> it's 
So yes, you it's not necessarily a beginner thing, but it's definitely helpful if you um, consider it at the beginning of things. So, but the question is, should you? You don't have to have a pen name, but should you? I ran one of my superficial, super, super scientific uh, Instagram polls asking people if they use a pen name. 63% of people said yes. And to be honest, I actually found that surprising because I thought it would be more people used a pen name. But, you know, that doesn't say <laughs> anything about anything specifically. It was just... Um, I was interested in the results. When it comes to pen names, my bias is firmly on the side of using a pen name. I mean, I'm not sure if you know this, but Jamie Nix isn't actually my legal name. Not for want of dreaming, that's for sure. <laughs> but you never know. Um, I want to be clear that while my bias is, I think, you know, what's using a pen name is a good idea. I'm not saying you need to have one. I, It's just my opinion. This is absolutely just my opinion. A pen name might not be for you. I will try to be balanced, but I wanted to make it clear from the out the, from the start that yes, my, I, my leaning is toward having a pen name and for more reasons than I have one myself. <laughs> so, De plume or nom de plume? That is the question. <laughs> okay. I'll just uh, duck the virtual tomatoes over here. But yeah, lame joke I couldn't resist. Uh, is it even a joke? Did people get it? Because nom de plume is pen. Yeah, I should probably edit this out, shouldn't I? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well done, Nix. <laughs> So basically what I'm going to run through is um, reasons to have a pen name, reasons a pen name might not be a great idea, and if you do choose to have a pen name, a little bit of advice from yours truly. The first and probably simplest reason to have a pen name is to avoid confusion. Maybe you have a common name or surname or both. I mean, no insult intended to the James Smiths out there, but according to Ancestry.com, there are over 38,000 of you. So yeah, maybe you don't want your name to be in amongst 38,000. You want to stand out in some way. Along the same lines, maybe you share a name with someone, maybe someone famous or notorious, or you don't want to have to deal with that kind of name sharing. It, there, there are the positives and the negatives, you know, maybe it might be funny if you had the same name as a celebrity and you could get, get a bump off that, but maybe you also have the same name as uh, like uh, a notorious criminal or something like that. There, there are plenty of names where, <laughs> excuse me, there are plenty of times where sharing the same name as somebody well known might not be something you care to do. On the other side of the coin, you might have a, a complicated name. It doesn't have to be necessarily like a really complicated in and of itself, but you could have a really long name that you'd prefer to shorten, or maybe it's hard to pronounce, or maybe you just, I mean, maybe you want something that's just shorter, easier to spell, easier to say, that sort of thing. Just rolls off the tongue, sticks in the mind a little bit more than um, what your legal name is. Again, this is a choice. If you are proud of your name, if you love your name, then stick with it. You know, it's all a matter of opinion. It's all a matter of voice. Just because you have a long or a complex name doesn't mean you have to change it just to make it easier for other people. If you love your name, you love your name. But those may be reasons that you would like a pen name. For a lot of people and I don't want to say most because I'm not sure, but in the with the people I know, most of them are using pen names as a matter of privacy and separation. A pen name can be really good for keeping one step between you and other people. They may be toxic people from your past or past abusers or, or things like that, but it also keeps you one step between 
negative things people may say about you currently. Negative reviews, things like that. Like, negative reviews hurt still hurt, but there, there's a layer of cotton. There's a layer of, a, a small layer of emotional protection if people are saying the negative reviews about the pen name and not about you personally. And it doesn't always work that way. You know, like I said, negative reviews hurt, but yeah, it's it, that one degree, that one step away can be helpful in that area. A pen name can also be helpful when it comes to keeping your art self separate from your career self. There are jobs that do background checks. There are jobs where producing certain art, certain material, certain things um, would be a no-go. Like, I remember, I think it's pronounced Zine, one of the earliest podcasts, um, Dave Baker was talking to, I believe, Lady Beaver, and she talked about when she was a teacher and how being a teacher and having that connected to the Lady Beaver persona could have been a very bad thing to happen. So yes, you may want to keep your art self and your career self separate for reasons along those lines. And also, having a pen name keeps your personal self a step away from your out there self. It's a it's a little bit of a complex one, this, and it could be a whole episode for itself, really. But, and it could be the introvert me speaking. That's entirely, like, I am definitely an introvert. But I feel like a pen name can help you be able to step away from the world, in a way. I am Jamie Nix. But if I start feeling overwhelmed, if I run out of spoons, if something happens offline that needs my full attention, then I can turn off the computer, I can turn off the phone, and I can just be Jamie for a while. I can, I can step back away from the world and just be Jamie. I've realized that that might not make complete sense to everyone. What I'm trying to say is that I am Jamie Nix. This is not a persona. I'm very much me. I'm I mean, you can only know by my voice and the video, if you're watching the video, I'm not putting on anything, but having Nyx out there and having some of Jamie not out there, it just allows that protective, a little bit of protection, and it might just be protection that's only in my mind, but at the same time, I do feel like I have somewhere to retreat. I have a home, I have a little safe space to go to that's, that is away from the online, the out there, so on and so forth. And I do realize that by putting yourself out there, you're putting yourself out there. It's, um, <laughs> at the risk of people who hate, hate the saying, it is what it is. But I feel that being able to step back whenever, if ever needed, is a good thing. Even if they're things you love, even things that you happily do every day, ha be, just having that ability to step back from it is a good thing, in my opinion. <laughs> I did say that I would try to be balanced, despite my bias, with pen names, so let's have a chat about why pen names aren't so great. The first thing about pen names to note is that they won't protect you legally. I can't just make up a name and then go off on whoever I want in whatever way I want. If people want to sue you, if people want to collect taxes, or yes, some people try to use pen names to avoid paying taxes, um, people will find the person behind the pen name, especially in this day and age when there are digital trails and stuff like that everywhere. A pen name is not any sort of legal protection. You can't even sign a contract. You can sign a contract with your pen name, but you can't wiggle out of the contract just because your pen name isn't your legal name. But again, I'm not a lawyer, so obviously do your own research, but um, I am sure that a pen name cannot legally protect you. I'll have some further reading in the description. 
Also in the description, I will have a link to episode four of the podcast where I talk a little bit more about the, the legal side of writing. That aside, I think the big reason for not using a pen name comes down to two words, really. Time and effort. If you're starting a pen name, then you're starting with a blank slate. And having a blank slate can be really exciting in a lot of different ways, but it can also be a, a lot of work depending on what you want to accomplish. It really comes down to what you want to do and how far you want to go with your pen name, but things to consider are like setting up new accounts. You will, under your pen name, have, like, you could have in another Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, etc., etc. <laughs> Those are the ones I mainly use. So yes, <laughs> but there are new accounts to set up. Um, there are possible things like domain names uh, to consider. You might want to trademark and or have your name be a business name, so on and so forth. There's a lot of those things to consider. And there's also cultivating followers, cultivating readership or building readership, that sort of thing. They're, they're all considerations because they all take time, they all take effort, and they all take work. And so as alluring as a blank slate can be, yes, you have that consider to consider. And the thing is that the, the time and the effort side becomes even greater if you're doubling up by having personal accounts and pen name accounts. That means, you know, twice the Facebook, twice the Twitter, so on and so forth. Plenty of people do it. Like I know quite a few people who do it and I'm even considering uh, expanding <laughs> Jamie Nick's accounts just to be able to connect with people more. But yeah, my hesitation with that is the, the time involved. You know, time is a precious commodity and we need to, I think we need to consider that anyway. <laughs> I'm certainly thinking about time all the time and how I don't ever feel like I have enough of it. <laughs> so yes, blank slates are lovely but require the work. So that's definitely something to think about if you are wanting a pen name. <laughs> so how was that? Was that about, you know, clear as mud? <laughs> as much as I can give you my opinion and share poll results and do research, I can't tell you whether or not to use a pen name. I do feel like a lot of people out there will already be leading one way or another, will already have a feeling that they want or just don't want a pen name, but I did want to bring up both sides of the, of consideration. I think I've said consideration enough in this podcast to uh, make it a drinking game, but, <laughs> or a, or a eating chocolates game or something like that. <laughs> But yes, so it's obviously it's all up to you. I think it's a good idea, but that's just my way of thinking. Maybe you have an awesome name. Maybe you there's maybe you want to bring more to your family name or things like that. You know, there's there plenty of reasons to not use a pen name, but many of us do and like it and everything. So if you do choose to go with a pen name. I do have a couple pieces of advice for you. The first being sit with it for a while. If you want a pen name, sit with it for a while. Try it on, that sort of thing. You don't, don't grab the first idea and completely run with it. it the, your first idea might be the pen name you choose ultimately, but don't grab and run. <laughs> Say it out loud, write it practice your new signature, that sort of thing. Have other people say it to you as well, like call you by your pen name, if that's something you choose to share with um, people in your life. But have people use it because it's entirely possible if you're going to, say, art shows or zine fest or something like that, that people might call you by your pen name. And it needs to be something that, A, people are comfortable saying, but also something that you're used to 
and I apologize if you can hear that. I'm not sure what's going on. There's still construction and things like that happening next door. So again, I apologize if you're picking up on any noise. So yes, if you want a pen name, sit with it for a while. There's no big rush. I have gone into naming things too quickly and pretty much every time I've regretted it. And the thing is that yes, it might be that you end up switching to another name later, but switching names too often can look a bit dodgy. People wondering what you're hiding, that sort of thing. Um, so take your time to find something that will stick with you and go the distance with you and something that you, that you really enjoy. Um, I actually started out with just Nyx rather than Jamie Nix and, you know, for various purposes, mail and things like that, um, it ended up that uh, I added my legal first name just to make it easier to have a first and a second name. My preference is Nix, but yeah. So if you are considering a pen name, maybe consider a first and last name. <laughs> for the second main piece of advice I have if you choose to go with a pen name is research. Research, 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 and research. <laughs> Pick, find a name, and don't get too attached at the get-go because you then you start Googling. I was looking for a pen name years back for, uh, for something, and, oh gosh, I've had so many projects, and I like pen names and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't have many pen names but I like them anyway. So I was looking for a pen name for a project and um, I found a name that I decided on a name that I really liked and I can't even remember the name now, of course, but I really liked it. And then I Googled it and the first thing that came up was um, the website of this absolutely gorgeous adult entertainment star. Now, I'm not going to get into that subject. I have no problem with that, but for the project, I didn't want to have to compete for views and things like that with an adult entertainment star. So I decided not to go with that name <laughs> as much as I liked it. So yes, start playing with names and start Googling them. Now the other considerations for research uh, again come down to what you are looking to accomplish. If you're looking for a name just to make a zines with, then Obviously, you might not be worried about whether the domain name is available, but if you want to set up something online or even in um, offline life, you might want the domain name. You want to, you might want to take the name and register it as a business name. It could be like, I could have jamienix.com, but I might want Jamie Nix Designs as a business name or something like that if I could design anything. <laughs> and it is actually possible to trademark a name as well. So that might be a consideration. But that all starts with research. It all starts with looking and there are business name registries and trademark registries and that sort of thing. You can have a look, you can see what's what, what's registered, registered where, what's trademarked where, so on and so forth. Now, I think this might feel a little overwhelming if you're just getting started. You don't have to decide whether you want a business name now. It's just the research phase. It's just finding out if the name that you've chosen has already been well and truly claimed by someone else. And that might not end up mattering to you. You might decide, well, no, I want the name anyway. And that's your choice. But don't go into it without the knowledge. Go into things knowing that, oh, this place, um, this name that I want is trademarked in Denmark, but I am in Canada, so it's fine. I don't mind that sort of thing. So yes, go in, make decisions, having the knowledge, don't make decisions quick too quickly and don't make decisions without knowing as much as you can. <laughs> and with that, I will stop giving you advice on, <laughs> on pen names, should you so choose one. Those are my thoughts and feelings on the matter. Do you have a pen name? Are you thinking about getting one? Do you 
think they are a waste of time? Do you use your name loud and proud? Have you used your name or pen name and had to switch? Let me know your stories. Let me know what you're thinking in the comments. I would love to know pen name stories. That was actually, it's just occurring to me right now that um, pen name stories was an idea for a zine I had back then. So yes, let me know your pen name stories. Let me know what you're thinking along those lines. Now we come to the Q&A segment where I answer one question from you each episode. And this week's question is a really good one that I probably should have addressed earlier, really. And that is, what do you do with, with uh, zines after you review them? Most zines that I review go into my collection. I, as I have said entirely too many times, I love zines, and so yes, I, I keep most of them. However, sometimes there are zines that aren't quite for me, or sometimes there will be a zine, and even if I love it, if I know a friend of mine would love it more, appreciate it more, that sort of thing, I will send the zine to a friend. But most of the time, I will donate them. Um, it's been suggested to me in the past that maybe I could like sell like a lucky dip bag or something like that, but I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if I feel comfortable with that idea. So yes, I do have a small, small pile of zines that I have been collecting for a while because again, most zines I review go into my forever collection. And all of those zines will go to the Copy and Destroy Zine Library, which is part of the Copy and Destroy Collective in Brisbane, here in Australia. And they are an amazing group, and I am very happy to support them. And I will have links in the description if you want to donate some of your zines yourself to a very good space. If you have any questions about zines, zine reviewing me, so on and so forth, you can always message me on various platforms I am around, and yeah, happy to answer questions. And now we come to the sharing is caring segment, which is my little non-sponsored spot for zine spaces, places, and other things that I am loving in the zineverse this fortnight. This episode, I am very happy to tell you about Five O'Clock Zine Reviews. At Five O'Clock Zine is an Instagram account run by Craig Anthony Atkinson in Japan. Every day, or at least nearly every day, but I think it's every day so far, he posts a zine review in one minute or less. Zine reviews on video, yes please. Zine reviews on Instagram, yes please. <laughs> I love it so much. It's quick, it's simple, it's easy, and I th think that Craig actually might be talking about, uh, or thinking about doing two parts reviews where one video is for the intro and one is for the review, because <laughs> one minute isn't a very long time. But even so, with, um, just, I love the idea of it. I love I love video reviews. It's something I've been asked about, but I haven't quite got around to. And I love that Craig is really taking the initiative and trying something new and trying the format. It's it's quick, it's simple. You can get in some zine reviews before work or on the way to work or things like that. I just, I really love the format. I love the, the way he does things. And a zine star in Japan, is that cool or what? Yeah. <laughs> I think so anyway. I do have a little bit of a thing for Japan, so yes. Anyway, check out at 5 o'clock zine on Instagram. Links will be in the description. So yes, that is it for today, zine friends. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for uh, <laughs> dealing with the various things. If you're watching on video, you can see that my um, pop filter has been slowly creeping toward me repeatedly over the course of the episode, but I will adjust that for next time, and I'm very happy that I made it all the way to the end of the podcast without my voice going too weird. But yes, if I sound a little bit different, you know, go back to the beginning where I explained it. <laughs> 
So yes, thank you for joining me. Uh, links to everything I've talked about are in the description. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. Remember that everything I talk about is just my opinion. There are no gatekeepers in the zine verse, nor should there be. Definitely not. And if I ever come across as a gatekeeper, I apologize in advance because that's not at all what I want to be doing here on the podcast. The music for this podcast, Spanish Summer by Audionautics, is licensed under a Creative Commons Attributions license. This is Zine Collector. I am your host, Jamie Nix, and until next time, go make some zines. Mwah! And have a wonderful week! <laughs>
<laughs> oh goodness uh yeah but thank you thank you everyone who's just everyone's been really amazingly supportive and helpful and wanting to help and it's actually been like i felt bad that i haven't um done more on certain things i don't want to get into specifics because it really doesn't matter in the end but basically my limitations because of anxiety and stuff like that have, um are only current limitations you know i'm still working on things but uh yeah i there are there are many wonderful things to come without a doubt especially as i'm working on anxiety issues and and it's all possible because people are wanting to get involved and and just be a part of this which is amazing to think about as i'm sitting here talking to my camera alone in my room <laughs> in this room so yes thank you so much thank you whether you're uh, listening to it whether you're watching it whether you're playing the youtube video but not watching it and only listening <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have hit milestones on all counts. Uh, I recent, just recently reached uh, 50 subscribers on YouTube, which is amazing. I think I've officially begun to move out of the um, uh, friends, <laughs> friends only, <laughs> only my friends watch my uh, YouTube channel thing. <laughs> Oh goodness, rambly rambly, this is probably going to be the longest introduction. <laughs> but yes, um, podcasting and everything is a lot of work and that sort of thing can take something you find joyful and make it a little less joyful for you. And while it hasn't always been the easiest road, it has been a for the most part very smooth one and that's due in large part just for you know thanks to people being so uh, just supportive <laughs> and amazing and wonderful and giving me feedback and asking me questions to put in the question section and yeah just in general people are amazing and even people some people said they've gone back to listen again and that's amazing to me too <laughs> You listen to me once, but you want to listen to me twice. Whoa. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yes. So that episode 10, here we are. That's my big notes and announcements section. I do have a little bit of a an announcement. Might be a, a big bit of an announcement, depending on how you... <laughs> but I'll save it for the end anyway, just to be mysterious and very possibly annoying. <laughs> depending on how you view that so yes thank you for joining me for episode 10 whether you've been here for episode 1 through 9 or you're joining me for the first time welcome and I really hope you enjoy this episode I I hope it is as special as I think it is <laughs> but before we get into things let's check out some zine events happening around the world Let's see, on May 23rd in Northampton, Massachusetts, we have the Forbes Library Zine Club in, oh, uh, sorry, on May 25th through the 27th in Bremen, Germany, we have the Bremer Zine Festival. On May 25th through 27th in Riga, Latvia, we have the Riga Zine Fest. On May 26th in Olomouc, Olomouc in Czech Republic, O-L-O-M-O-U-C, Olomouc, Czech Republic, we have the DIY Zine Fest. I had a friend in high school who always wanted to go to the Czech Republic. Oh, I hope she gets to. Anyway, on May 26th in Kent, Connecticut, we have the Litchfield County Zine Fest, which I believe is Connecticut's first Zine Fest. I'm not 100% sure on that, but have a wonderful time. Um manager coordinator olivia and friends <laughs> yeah i know the person who has organized the litchfield county zine fest unless i have it completely wrong in which case i'm terribly embarrassed <laughs> on may 27th in warsaw poland we have zine fest number five on may 27th in monterey mexico we have fanzine con 
On May 27th in Los Angeles, California, we have the LA Zine Fest. Yeah. <laughs> On May 27th as well in Sydney, Australia, we have Other Worlds Zine Fair. Oh, wish I could be there. <laughs> On June 1st and 2nd in Scranton, Pennsylvania, we have the Scranton Zine Fest. On June 7th in Katoomba, New South Wales, we have Zine Baby Monthly Zine Making Night. On June 12th in St. Malo, France, we have Daedalus Fanzine. On June 16th in Davis, California, we have Zine Lab. On June 17th in London, UK, we have... <laughs> Where else is London going to be? <laughs> Sorry. On June 17th in London, we have Bermond Zines 3. On June 17th in Durham, North Carolina, I believe, uh, we have the Durham Zine Fest. On June 24th in Denver, Colorado, we have the Denver Zine Fest. On June 24th in Pittsburgh, we have the Feminist Zine Fest. On June 30th in Asheville, North Carolina, we have the Asheville Zine Fest. And on June 30th to July 1st, we have Zinfony Number no. 10 in Takasaki, Japan. Ooh, I wish I could visit all of those. I mean, imagine that. Could you, I mean, it'd be quite the schedule. So you couldn't visit all of them. I mean, hard to be in the Czech Republic and then in Connecticut on the same day. But... I can dream. I can write fantasy novels. Why not? <laughs> there are a lot more events where that came from. If you would like a direct line on zine events happening around the world, check out at fanzines on Twitter and Facebook. Links, as always, are in the description. <laughs> I think I need to slow down a bit, maybe. I'm not sure. I'm just really excited. Oh, anyway. <laughs> In the last episode, we had a chat about pen names. You know, do you want to use a pen name? I made it clear that I think it's good to use a pen name, but we got into why pen names aren't always so great. And if you do choose to use a pen name, some tips from yours truly. In this episode, because it's episode 10, and as you may have guessed by the title, I wanted to do something a little bit different, a little bit special. I wanted to celebrate in a way that I knew how that was still possible considering I had the idea very last minute. <laughs> For this entire podcast series, you've been listening to me talk about zines, why I love zines, why zines are awesome, why I think they're important, so on and so forth. And one of the most important facets of zines for me is the people who make them and the connections that I have made through zines, thanks to the zines. The, this, this, even the small passing one message and we never talk to each other again kind of connections and then the long lasting, amazing friendships I've developed thanks to zines. <laughs> looking at <laughs> I was gonna name one person then I'm like that person too that person too. <laughs> so yes connections made thanks to zines are very very precious to me and it's it's with that in mind that I I've invited some zine makers from around the world to join me in a matter of speaking <laughs> and in their own words tell you why zines are important. It's not just about my voice or my opinion or anything like that because zines, as much as there, is, there are differences of opinion, there are politics and everything's in, in zines, we're still zine makers. There's still a we, us in, in zine making. So yes, <laughs> without further ado, without prattling on too much, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome these fellow zine makers to the Zine Collector podcast to talk briefly about zines. Hi, my name is Ken Borsett and I produce a quarterly zine on paper called The Ken Chronicles. Uh, you can Google that and find out more about it if you'd like online. 
Uh, I've been reading zines for at least uh, 30 years and producing my own uh, in one form or another for at least 25 years. Um, the thing I like most about zines is that it allows everyone to express their individuality. So uh, there are zines on every different subject imaginable, uh, but each one is unique. So even if you found two zines on the same subject, they're going to be different. Uh, I also enjoy trading zines with other people and finding out what other people are doing. So uh, if you're interested, there's lots of places to uh, find out about zines and uh, maybe you'll get the urge to create your own one day. All right, take care. Hi, I'm Lada Buell. I'm a 17 year old artist and zine maker from Western Australia. And I've been making zines for just over a year now. I started in April last year and since then I've probably made about just over 20 <laughs> zines. I'm not too sure though, I haven't counted in quite a while. Last time I counted it was 18 and I think I've made about three or four since then. Um, the majority of my zines are mini zines and they're a mixture of art, collages, poetry and personal stuff. Um, my Blue Thought series is a good example of this. Um, the series is an amalgamation of all of the previously mentioned zine genres. There are only three in the series so far, but I would love to make many, many more, and if you'd like a copy, message me on Instagram. <laughs> um, zines mean quite a lot to me, actually. I've always wanted to write a book or publish my art one way or another, and zines gave me that opportunity in a non-expensive and creative DIY way, which is my thing. <laughs> it's my favourite thing. Um, and it doesn't require a publisher either, which is the best. Um, the possibilities of zines are endless as well, so that kind of led me to experiment with my creations and try new things. I personally use zines as an outlet to kind of vent in a creative and healthy way. I was initially terrified to put my, um, my raw emotions and raw creations into the world, but I soon realised after kind of reading other people's perzines and seeing other people do it without fear kind of helped me come to terms with myself and helped me give like a give myself a push to kind of do it and just get it over and done with and see what people think of it and surprisingly people actually enjoy reading what I have to say so it's pretty cool um I think that's about it for me uh, I want to say thank you to Nix for commissioning me to do the front cover of the second issue of Paper Currency. Can't wait to see what it comes out like on the final copies. Um, yeah, that's about it. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. Uh, hi, uh, I've been asked to introduce myself and talk a little bit about my zine um, and what zines mean to me. So, I'm firstly, I'm Craig Atkinson. Uh, I'm originally from Melbourne around Melbourne in Australia. Um, I currently live in Tokyo, Japan with my family. Uh, this is my little office space or little studio room that I create my little zine. Uh, I currently work on a zine called Coffee and People. I'm up to issue number five. This morning I was working on it, trying to get, get it right. It's a story based zine, it's a per zine. It's <clears throat> stories from when I was young. Um, and told as truthfully as I can remember. Um, and that's, that's I guess that's what my zine is about. It's not really about coffee, it's not really about people, but it's about... But that is... That is what I like in life. Coffee and people. So maybe that's why I chose the title. Anyway, um, so what do zines mean to me? Uh, zines... Zines give me a chance to express uh, things I want to express, tell stories that I want to tell. Um, you know, I think also, you know, I do a little bit of writing for other things, um, and often I have to write about things I don't really care about, whereas a zine gives me a chance to write about whatever I want. Often, you know, when I start a story, it usually changes topics and people and everything to its finished product. So it starts with something in a totally different place. So um, that's what I like about, you know, the zine. Also, the zine is, I guess, <clears throat> it gives me a chance to think about, like, it expands my creativity. So it makes me think about the cover, 
the back cover, what paper I'm going to use, how I'm going to do it, what style, size. My latest one was a lino print. The first couple I did were uh, just photos that, I, that I'd taken. So there's many different aspects of creativity that go into a zine and that's something that I really enjoy, I'm really enjoying doing. Um, and also I like to see, <clears throat> so like my zine is my interpretation of a zine. So I like to see what other people or other, inter other people's interpretations of zines are. And so I do a lot of zine swaps as many as I can um, to, to see that, you know, to see what they think a zine should be like. You know, I, I this is what I think. Oh, not, it's not, you know, the be all and end all, but this is what I like to see in a zine. And I have some favorite zinesters that I like to read uh, that are very similar to my style and then some that are not. And and that's why, that's what makes zines so special. Uh, you know, you can just do whatever you want and then people can, people can have a look and people, you know, will dig it, people don't dig it. Uh, and it doesn't really matter. You know, it doesn't matter if people like it or not. It just, it's, it's, a, you know, zines are very personal. Whether they're not per zines or not, they're, they're very personal. And, and that's what's cool about zines. So, I hope you'll make them one too. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hey, my name is Chris Kenzel. I am the author of What Even, which is a mini zine that is just starting. Um, do web comics and other mini zines as I find funny things to write about. I like doing zine fests and um, trading and making zines collaboratively. Uh, I really find that zines are an awesome way of getting your voice out there. You could be somebody who has been a writer or artist for a very long time that just has something little to say, or you can be somebody who's just getting their voice, finding something they want to say, and being able to put it into a gra graphic format. Um, it's a great way to do mini comics if you have an idea. It's a good way to flesh things out. It's a stupendous idea for people who just want to get something out there but don't want to commit to writing a full comic or a full book. So you can do poetry, pictures, um, graphics. So you can take a picture of your cat and put on a head of a dinosaur, photocopy that, and make a zine of your cat taking over Tokyo. I mean, it, it's the sky's the limit. I found that collecting zines, um, going to places like SPX and different comic uh, conventions, I've been able to collect nice amount of zines. Everything from one that's called uh, something about Kyle McLaughlin, which is just pictures and little words about Kyle McLaughlin, which I found was hilarious. Some mini comics, some um, ones about uh, different scientific principles. Um, I enjoy teaching zines with my friend Stephen Kissel. Uh, we teach children, um, adults, teenagers, anybody about the joys of zines and how you can make them. We have found that sharing this principle on how zines are for everybody and correcting people when they say zines, which is very common, uh, we've been able to get teachers making sure that their students are a little more um, involved in the education process because they can make a zine about exactly what they learned. That's a great way of getting the word across. So say the whole classroom has something to do about the periodic table of elements. Well, each of the kids can take an element and they can write, a, they can write, author, whatever, a small eight panel, one page zine. Everybody can get copies and then they can all spend as a time as a class and cut them up and share them with each other. So everybody gets a zine, they can put together the whole periodic tale of elements. It's a great way for that. Education purposes. It's great just for silly little comics. I mean, I have one zine that's just called I Fruitcake, and I made four of them. And it's just little jokes about fruitcakes. It was funny. One of them is about fruitcakes around the world. One of them is fruitcakes in the horror setting. It was silly, but I have enjoyed making a small zine about it. Um, so that's pretty much why I find zines 
as interesting and probably one of the most entertaining forms of uh, comics for me is because they're small. I can keep a few in my purse, so if I'm, you know, on a trip or something, I can flip through them. I can make them easily because, you know, you can take paper with you on a trip and fold that up and just easily copy when you get home. So it's a great thing. Well, thank you. Bye-bye. What up, everybody? My name is Rich, also known as Federal Publication. I make comic book zines that are either political, comedic, personal, or a mixture of the three. And I think zines are important. I think they're fucking dope because they're a way for marginalized people and marginalized ideas to basically voice their reality, voice their ideas, their opinions, and, and also for marginalized people to create characters that empower them. And as mainstream media becomes more and more centralized and the big blockbuster uh, culture that we're building nowadays continues to build just archetype characters and stereotypes, it's very important for us to break that up. And I feel that the zine culture is definitely one of the ways, one of the means that we're doing that. Okay, this is the fifth time <clears throat> I'm trying to record this. My name is Josh Metzger. I make zines, and uh, I think they're awesome because uh, I've been doing it since I was 21 years old, um, considerably older than that now. Um, it's been about, about 25 years. So uh, I did my first one when I was uh, in college, and it was called Noise, Noise, Noise after the Damned song. And uh, it was me and some, some good friends of mine uh, got together and uh, wrote about local music in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, for a while there, we were the only people writing about it. Um, and you know, sometimes we even scooped the uh, weekly newspaper, which made me feel pretty good. Um, I've been doing one called 24 Hours since 2001. And uh, last year, we kind of took a, took a little sideways jaunt, and uh, we're doing poetry chapbooks only now. Um, we had the blog and the zine and whatnot uh, for a long, long time. But then, um, yeah, I've been writing poetry myself, and I thought it would be a good way to take the uh, magazine. Um, they're, they're particularly special to me because it's, it's so immediate. Um, and, you know, unlike the internet, it's very personal. You can see people's handwriting. Um, you can really get a feel for what they're like as a person. Um, if you want to see some of my stuff, you can go to my website, joshmetzger.com, J-O-S-H-M-E-D-S-K-E-R.com. And Miss Epic, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And there we have it. Eee! <laughs> Zane Love from around the world. I'm so excited. It's amazing. It was, oh, goodness. Thank you so much for everyone who joined in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was so last minute. It was an effort to to make things and get files sent to me and everything like that. So thank you all so much for participating. Everyone who's listening and watching, I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I really want this to be a regular Thing, a community show where we can all participate, join in, and discuss things. And I figured why zines are important, why we love zines would be a great place to start, and episode 10 would be a great place to start as well. So thank you all so much. I appreciate the effort from all of those who joined in. And yeah, listeners and watchers, I hope you enjoyed. Um, yeah, there are video, for those listening, there are video components for some of the people who joined in. So if you want to see some of the faces behind the voices, be sure to hop onto YouTube and have a look at the video. Oh, wow. I really hope you liked it. <laughs> I, I have had a blast just listening to people voice in their own words what they love about scenes. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> this next segment, the next segment in the show usually is where I answer a question from you. But this episode, I figured I want to keep the ball rolling, so to say. And so I have a question for you. Why do you love zines? Why do you make them? Why do you want to make them? Why? 
why do you want to be involved with zines? What makes them special? Do you have any special zine stories? Do you have any zine crush stories or I met this person through zines or anything like that? I would love to hear all of your zine stories. Leave them in the various comments sections. There's YouTube, there's the blog, and yeah, share the zine love. Share your stories. Um, leave links that sort of thing so we all, can all start connecting a bit more and that sort of thing yeah so <laughs> that that's the question uh, section and along the same notes uh, usually after the question it's sharing is caring and but for this episode um, obviously a lot of people joined in well <laughs> a lot of people to me <laughs> Obviously, people joined in, so I highly encourage you to check out the links in the descriptions. You can go to seagreenzines.com if you want it, an easier to see list than might be provided on your podcast app or things like that. Definitely check out the links, say hello, um, maybe say you found them through the podcast if you want to. <laughs> I feel a little bit weird saying that, but uh, Wanderer has encouraged me to be a little bit more um you know like and subscribe <laughs> sort of yes so yeah let them know that you found them through the podcast and yeah connect say hello and you know maybe even trade some zines have some fun make some friends <laughs> all of that good wonderful stuff <laughs> So now we've come to the end of the show and now it's time for that little announcement I was saving for last. And that is the Zine Collector podcast will be taking a small break. Just a small one so I can catch up with myself basically. <laughs> there are so many shows that I want to plan and research. There are things I want to make. There are, zine, there are so many zines I want to make. I have this list I've got this stack of notebooks and various materials for zines I want to make on my desk. And yeah, uh, while I've been doing this just fine, I've been doing the podcast just fine, I've been falling behind in other things, which is fine, you know, no stress, no big deal. But yeah, I'd like to take a break and get my life a little bit more organized, prepare for some things that are coming up and basically I want to get to the point where this past week with my computer spitting the dummy in multiple ways I don't want to let things like that throw me as much as they did I want to be organized in ways that I can land on my feet when those sorts of things happen though you know knock on wood that they don't happen very often if at all <laughs> I don't want to be thrown so far, of course, when these things happen. So Happy Mail Monday videos are still going to happen. Reviews on Thursdays and Fridays are still going to happen. Blog posts are still going to happen. It's basically this, the, the video podcast, all that stuff. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of planning to plan out. Um, takes a lot of planning to plan. <laughs> Goodness. In the end, it's not a, a big deal. There's nothing, nothing major or anything. I, I just need to um, take a little break to organize my head a little bit and figure out, um, excuse me, where I'm going, what I'm doing, that sort of thing. You know, yeah, it's just, it's not Tuesday unless I'm feeling a little bit existential. <laughs> oh, ignore me. Anyway, so yes, we're taking a little break, but believe me, I will be back before you know it because da -da -da -da, July is International Zine Month and there is going to be plenty going on in July. So definitely I will be back before then to get ready and rocking for that. So yes, <laughs> don't know if I needed to wait until the end to say that, but it just felt appropriate. So please forgive if that was a little annoying to you for whatever reason. <laughs> Links to everything I've talked about are in the descriptions, various description sections, etc. Be sure to stop by seagreenzines.com where I review zines every Thursday and Friday. Still working on maybe getting more done a week, but uh, you know. 
I mean, how things are going. Remember that everything I say is just my opinion. There are no gatekeepers in the Zineverse, nor should there be. The music for this podcast, Spanish Summer by Audionautics, is licensed under a Creative Commons Attributions license. This is Zine Collector. I'm your host, Jamie Nix. I hope you enjoyed this episode because I did so much. I want to do more like it in the future. So if you want to participate, be sure to follow me or subscribe and stuff like that. I'll be sure to announce it well and truly ahead of time next time so more people can participate. Yeah, so I'm your host, Jamie Nix. Until next time, go make some zines, have some fun, and have a wonderful, wonderful day. Mwah. <laughs> I feel like I should do something special. Ten episodes is a big deal. It is a big deal, isn't it? Like, it feels like a big deal. Maybe I should get a donut. Like, stick a candle in it? Light the candle or something? You no? Know? Ideas? I hope you like donuts. I like donuts. Not jam donuts, though. Eh. I mean, more power to you, but jam and donuts. No, no thank you. <laughs>